Cinderella Governess. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Book one of the Duke's Daughters series. Enjoy. Chapter one. It was not quite noon on a Tuesday, and the staff of Stanley Hall had been in a frenzy since before dawn. On any given day there was plenty of work to be done, but this day in particular required special preparation. The lady of the house, the Countess of Canwick, and her daughter Arabella were returning from London, where the seventeen-year-old had made her social debut. Na Lydia took a deep breath as she caught sight of her reflection in her bedroom window. Her brown hair was swept back into a modest bun. She had rather enjoyed the absence of her stepmother and stepsister and the small freedoms their absence had afforded her. Things most girls her age took for granted, such as wearing their hair in elegant curls, for those were luxuries not afforded to Lydia Stanley. Her round grey eyes were lined with thick lashes that were a bit darker than her hair. Her lips were small but full in a delicate heart shape that she imagined she must have gotten from her mother. It was hard to say for sure, as it had been such a long time since she had even seen a painting of her mother. She hurried out into the corridor toward the other side of the manor, where her half-brother's room was located. He was a bright boy for the age of seven, a fact of which Lydia was exceedingly proud, since she was his acting governess. He also shared their father's brown hair and contemplative grey eyes, which might have contributed to the Countess's general distaste for their presence. Make no mistake, the Countess of Canwick made a respectable effort to dote on Walter. He was, after all, her anchor to her late husband's estate. Walter was born seven months after the Earl passed away, and Lydia felt instantly bound to him as her only living blood relative. After he no longer needed a wet nurse, the Countess made Lydia responsible for the majority of his care. Walter, she called out to him as she reached his doorway. Are you almost ready? The boy was grumbling as he struggled with his cravat, tugging frustratedly at the crooked knot. This was something the two of them had been working on together for a while, but he hadn't quite gotten the hang of it yet. Use the mirror, Walter. Lydia calmly pulled the knot apart and led him over to stand in front of the large hanging mirror positioned over his dresser. Remember the trick I showed you? She stood behind him, bent down to his level, and held up the tie for him to grasp. Stretch your cloth in front of you with one end in each hand to find the midpoint, she reminded him. What do you do next? His brow furrowed as he pinched the middle of the length of cloth. I wrap it around. Show me. He did as she said. What comes next? She pretended to try and remember. I make an X and then three pleats. That's right, she smiled. Let's see then. He concentrated on his reflection. Then I loop around and pull. By the time Walter was born, Lydia had already been moved from her original room and relocated to the opposite side of the manor where the servants' quarters were located. Her stepmother made it clear early on that if she wanted to receive the inheritance her father had set aside for her, she would be expected to earn her keep until her twenty-first birthday, at which point it would be released to her. Lydia watched intently as Walter's fingers looped the tie around and cautiously pulled the knot tight, executing it perfectly. Her heart grew warm, watching his face light up as he realised his small victory. I did it. His eyes grew wide with delight. I told you that you could, she pinched his cheek softly. A perfect triangular knot, all by yourself. How come I can only do it while you're watching? Walter tilted his head, his eyebrows drawn together in an all too familiar questioning expression. Because to do anything, you must first believe you can do it, she stood up straight. On days when you don't believe in yourself enough, I will be here to believe in you until you do. He rushed forward and threw his arms around her waist, and she embraced him for a moment before patting his back and returning his focus to the task at hand. Get your hair combed, she urged. The boy obeyed, hurrying over to his dresser to grab his comb, which he dipped into the wash water he had used for his face. Lydia had no room in her heart for resentment toward Walter. 
On the contrary, when he no longer needed a nurse, she was happy that her stepmother made her his governess. Nothing pleased her more than playing a vital role in his upbringing. She saw so much of her father in him, not only on the surface but also in his kind nature and mild temperament. In a way, being close to Walter made her feel like her father wasn't altogether gone from this world. Once his hair was combed, they walked together toward the main staircase that led down to the foyer, where all the servants were bustling around, making second and third rounds to ensure everything was polished and perfect. Can you recite your French lesson for me? She raised an eyebrow as they made their way down the stairs. Bonjour, he began. And if it is evening... Bonsoir, madame, he responded with a wide smile. He went on to recite several phrases that may be used in polite conversation. Lydia clapped excitedly. What about Latin? Walter's face grew serious as he began dramatically reciting a biblical passage he had been memorising. You are such a good boy, and I am very proud of you. As they reached the bottom of the staircase, Lydia knelt down to look him in the eye. You don't need to be nervous. You've studied hard, and you know your lessons well. I know, he said, holding his head a little higher. The entry hall floor was tiled with black and white marble that matched the marble pillars surrounding the greeting room. The main entryway facing the grand staircase they had just descended had a massive vaulted ceiling where once hung a brilliant crystal chandelier. Stanley Hall boasted two beautiful stories of elegant architecture, complete with ornate crown moulding. The Countess's expensive taste in fashion had a draining effect on the estate, and the crystal chandelier was eventually sold. After all, she couldn't allow herself or her daughter to be seen in public wearing the same gown twice. The housekeeper, Tabitha Marsh, scurried past carrying a vase filled with large cabbage roses. The bundle of flowers made her seem smaller than she was as she peeked out from behind the red bouquet, her eyes wide and alert. Pardon me, Miss Lydia. The carriage has been spotted. Placing her hands on Walter's shoulders, Lydia looked him over once more for good measure. Noting that his face and hands were clean, his shirt was tucked in and his hair was combed, she nodded, satisfied that her stepmother had nothing specific to criticise. The two of them hurried out to the square, where everyone was lining up to receive the ladies of the house. Lydia sighed deeply. It's been so peaceful and quiet with the two of them in London. She felt a whisper of guilt pass through her at the thought of just how much she had savoured her stepmother's absence. It was the first time since she could remember that she and Walter had been able to exist without constant rebuke and customary scorn from the Countess. Stanley Hall was a beautiful manor, even in its current state, and Lydia had a deep love for her childhood home. Most of the time, the halls and corridors reminded her of a happier time when her father was alive, a time when she felt worthy and loved, before she had to learn the harsh realities of the world. The manor stood majestically on a hill amidst green moors that stretched out in every direction. The house itself was surrounded by a border of ancient towering elm trees that adorned the entire perimeter. After a few minutes of waiting, the dark carriage became visible as it approached, its lantern still burning from having begun its journey in the early hours of the morning or late hours of the previous night. The horses whinnied as they brought the carriage around the circular drive, where they stopped at the centre, in front of the square. The elderly coachman stepped down, his body stiff from age and spending so many hours seated. Straightening his hunched posture, he opened the carriage door and held out his hand to graciously assist his passengers. First the Countess of Canwick, Margaret Stanley, and then Miss Arabella emerged from the darkness. No one in the square dared to speak before the Countess, who glided over to where her son stood waiting. My beautiful darling boy, the Countess squeezed his face, bending down to kiss his cheek. Oh, how I've missed you. Walter looked around at the staff as his mother made a show of embracing him. He knew his mother cared far more for Arabella than she would ever care for him. He found her occasional displays of affection unsettling, but endured them with as much grace as he could. 
Lydia occupied her mind with thoughts of when Walter would come of age and finally realise he was the one that held any real power in the house, being his father's only male heir. She smiled at the thought, wondering what Margaret would do when that fateful day finally arrives. Arabella was easy for the Countess to control through fear. Walter was different. Lydia knew it was in his nature to question things and doubted very much that he would stand for her manipulative tactics when he had a choice in the matter. For the time being, he stoically tolerated her insincere excitement. But Lydia knew it was only a matter of time before he grew into an intelligent and decisive man. Have you practised your French and Latin? The Countess stood upright and squinted quizzically. Walter responded first in French and then recited his Latin lesson. What about your arithmetic? Without any hesitation whatsoever, he recited his multiplication tables until his mother held up her hand, signalling for him to stop. That's very good, darling. The Countess of Canwick's smile vanished, and her face relaxed to its natural scowling state as she greeted her stepdaughter. Lydia, she said flatly. Walter's mother, Margaret Stanley, was a thin woman with sharp, severe features. She wasn't ugly by any means. She could even seem beautiful when she was pleasant. Although Lydia rarely got to see that side of her stepmother, she and Arabella both had beautiful blonde hair and emerald green eyes. Although Arabella seemed oblivious most of the time, Margaret's gaze was cold and calculating. She had a gift for making a person feel inferior with a single glance. Lady Canwick, Lydia dipped into a slight curtsy, bowing her head. Margaret hardly acknowledged her before continuing on toward the house. How was London? Lydia followed a few steps behind Arabella, who was close in tow with her mother. We caught wind of some exciting news. Arabella looked back at Lydia with a bright smile. Arthur Gibbs, the Viscount of Ranton, has recently bought Cold Creek Manor. That house has been up for sale for ages, Lydia commented. I know, she wrinkled her nose. We met Lord Ranton in London, and he promised he was going to bring friends with him when he comes to oversee the renovations on the house. Just think of all the eligible bachelors to be met at his social functions. That is exciting news, Lydia smiled politely. You would adore Arthur. He's quite witty and entertaining, to say the least. Arabella turned and took Lydia by the hands. Please, Margaret scoffed. Lydia wouldn't be able to keep up in conversations with people of social standing. She would likely have no idea what anyone is talking about. At any rate, Lord Ranton's thriving social life will serve to find a match of a more appropriate station. I thought the Gibbs family was fairly well regarded. Lydia regretted offering her opinion the moment it escaped her lips. Yet, yeah, not that anyone asked for your thoughts on the matter, but Lord Ranton is only a viscount. I am the Countess of Canwick, and Arabella is my daughter. She has the opportunity to marry someone of equal or higher standing and certainly isn't concerned with the Gibbs family. She made a sour face and waved her hand as she made her way to her room. Arabella pressed her lips together. Her eyes glazed over in a sheep-like contentedness as she drifted toward her own room. As soon as their doors closed behind them, Lydia and Walter made their way back down to the bottom of the stairs, where they looked at each other. She gave an impish smile, which he returned. What should we do now? She folded her arms. Can we go visit Roderick? His brow furrowed. Roderick was Walter's pony, whom he regarded as his best friend, that is, besides Lydia. He was a strong, even-tempered creature who was every bit as fond of Walter. Of course, Lydia put her hand on the boy's head. No more lessons today? I think you've been quizzed quite thoroughly, don't you? Yes. He let out a relieved sigh, and the two of them headed out toward the stables, with Lydia feeling her heart heavying by the minute, as it always did when the Countess was home. But her life was what it was, and nothing seemed liable to change any time soon. Chapter Two As soon as I saw it, I knew... Arthur's eyes were alight with excitement. 
I have never been one to believe in destiny, but it was as if the walls themselves were calling out to me. In my mind's eye, I could see my children playing in those rooms. Walking in through the front door, it didn't feel like I was in a stranger's house. It felt like coming home. You don't have to sell it to me, Arthur. Henry Radcliffe, the Marquis of Whitecroft, son and heir to the Duke of Yeaton, smiled as he looked out the window. I am already quite looking forward to seeing your new project. It was an impossibly unique opportunity. A townhouse less than half that season in London would have cost twice as much. I'm telling you, it's positively massive and the grounds are filled with potential. Arthur Gibbs gestured wildly as he described his new home. The garden has been completely neglected, and there are, of course, the renovations I was telling you about earlier. I'm a bit nervous about that, if I'm completely honest. I don't know much about architecture. Arthur was tall and lean with vibrant red hair, a fair complexion, and lively blue eyes that always seemed to be on the lookout for a possible spontaneous adventure. The two of them had been friends since their early boyhood and there was never a secret between them. Although over the last few years the two had spent less time together since Arthur was mainly concerned with parties and courting, and Henry had always been the more studious of the two. Don't worry, I think you'll rather enjoy overseeing the renovations. Henry looked at his old friend from the opposite carriage seat. In fact, I think the chance to put your creativity to work on a house where you will plant roots of your own will only give you a stronger sense of pride. Something like that gives you a chance to make an imprint on the house that future generations of your family will have a unique appreciation for. What a lovely thought, Arthur looked out the window. I don't deny a level of excitement at the thought of raising a family in a home I had a hand in designing. Although honestly, even when walking through the house in broad daylight, I couldn't help but feel that the previous occupants had left an imprint, as you say, of their own. You don't mean... Henry's blue eyes shot a sceptical look at his friend. Yes, Henry. Arthur leaned forward. It looks like every haunted estate we used to tell stories about as children. Henry resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Arthur. Wouldn't that be fantastic? A wide smile spread across Arthur's face, revealing the dimple on his right cheek. I rather hope it is haunted. Wouldn't that be an interesting adventure? Arthur Gibbs and the haunting of Cold Creek Manor does sound appealing. It would be, but I'd prefer it started after my visit is over. Henry had just celebrated his 27th birthday a few days prior. Of course, he jumped at the chance to leave London for a holiday in Canwick with his good friend Arthur. It would be a welcome reprieve from the endless pestering from his father. His father, Amos Radcliffe, the Duke of Yatton, was a good, honest man, but a stern fellow with a strong sense of tradition. Most of the Radcliffe men were married with several children by the age of 25. He felt that Henry was somehow falling short of the expectations set by society for noblemen of his age and character. Lord Yatton was also troubled by the fact that his advancing years may not afford him time with his grandchildren. Henry's childhood seemed to come and go rather quickly, and he felt he never got the chance to enjoy it. As a father, he spent a great deal of energy and expense, ensuring he grew up with a proper education and impeccable manners. He also wanted to make sure Henry knew how to handle the family's finances and ensure the continued wealth of their family line. He had never been extremely fond of Arthur Gibbs, who, while engaging and charismatic, was a bit unrefined for someone of noble birth. However, they did agree on one thing. Courting was a luxury set aside for the young, and Henry was quickly advancing beyond that. Arthur was still going on about their upcoming adventures. Canwick is like a proverbial gold mine for men of our stature. The previous generation of the region has been blessed with a great many daughters, but not nearly as many sons. I've been told there is a surplus of beautiful young women and a tragic lack of bachelors to attend them. Ah, Henry narrowed his eyes. Now I see the true reason you chose to come here. Oh, come now, Henry, Arthur leaned back. 
Surely you must enjoy the company of beautiful girls. I know I'm certainly looking forward to sitting back and letting them gather around to woo me for a change. It will be a pleasant contrast to London's social scene. Please, Arthur, it's not as if you lack attention from women in London. They've simply become used to your theatrical manner of conversation. Whether or not they are beautiful and whether or not they are pleasant company are completely separate matters altogether, my friend. You seem like you would be perfectly content to marry any girl who possesses a lovely face. I don't deny that. And you don't see the folly of marrying a girl solely based on her appearance? Not at all. I can just imagine you choosing a wife from a painting without having met her at all. Arthur crossed his arms. And what, pray tell, is wrong with that? I can think of little that would make me happier than to have a dainty wife with whom I am awe-stricken at the sight of every day for the rest of my life. You should be careful, my friend, Henry shook his head. I would hate to see you unhappily married. After all, like you said, marriage is for the rest of your life. So? Just how long do you suspect those dainty features to retain their charms? Time will not respect the soft flesh of youth. Rather, it ravages us all, some more quickly than others. Why do you have to point out something like that? Something like ageing cannot be controlled or changed. At least if I have a pretty wife, I can enjoy looking at her while we are young. And what if she has a horrid disposition? Henry tilted his head. Imagine someone who disagrees with everything you say. What if she grows irritated at the very sight of you every time you enter the room? You'll have to live with that regardless of how agreeable her face might be. I feel like you are referring to your own parents. Doesn't your mother get an exasperated look on her face when someone asks your father a question? Arthur raised an eyebrow. It's as if she had already decided that what he had to say was unworthy of attention before the words even passed through his lips. A man of noble birth should never speak ill of his parents. However, yes, their personalities do clash horribly. They had a very short courtship, I'm told and my mother often cautions me on marrying too hastily. While your father, on the other hand, pushes you to settle down as quickly as possible. I suppose growing up and seeing firsthand how miserable two people can make one another could make one hesitate to consider such a commitment. Henry's mother was a strong-willed woman. While intelligent and warm, she was a force to be reckoned with. Lady Marion Yaton was not the type of woman to keep silent if she believed an injustice was being spoken in her presence. Her husband, who had always believed women to be soft and somewhat inferior creatures, was often put in his place by his wife, who refused to let such things be said in front of her son. His father often told Henry of how Marion's fiery red hair had grabbed his attention when she was introduced at a ball in her hometown of Tallard. He was entranced by her beauty and after one dance with her, he entered into negotiations with her father, who arranged the marriage. While the fiery colour of her hair might have faded over time, the fire in her personality only intensified. Her version of their meeting, as told to Henry, was far less romantic, and she made no secret of the fact that she was opposed to marrying at seventeen. However, it was an impressionable age, and she did as her parents told her, because that is what good children are supposed to do. She always urged Henry to think for himself, and he felt empowered by her support. Regardless of the fact that his father was the one with authority over his future and finances. The best thing he felt he learned from his mother was a respect for women as individuals. This was not something that was spoken about at length in public, as it was not a popular opinion. But he was grateful for the perspective she had afforded him nonetheless. Miserable is a strong word but I do want something different for myself. So, you do plan on marrying then? Of course. Soon? Arthur, I'm in no hurry. Henry looked out the window at the blue sky. I'm quite content to wait for the right woman. How will you know her when you meet her? I'll know. Henry raised an eyebrow. I imagine it will be much like the first moment you saw Cold Creek Manor. What was it you said? The walls called out to you and it felt as if it was destiny. Describe her to me then, so that if I see her first I can introduce you. 
How would I describe someone I've never met? How will you find her if you don't even know what you're looking for? Very well, Henry shifted his weight. She's kind and gentle. She's fond of children and animals and they are fond of her. She isn't prone to dramatic outbursts and doesn't need to be the constant center of attention. Her face, Arthur gazed dreamily into his mind's eye, is that of a rat terrier. Laugh all you want, Henry chuckled, but I find that people grow either more or less attractive as you get to know them. What will you do if she never shows up? Arthur grinned. Won't your father be upset that you're not fulfilling your duty to produce an heir? I will handle that problem once it arises. Arthur laughed and shook his head. I suppose you'll just let your father choose a wife for you. Certainly not, Henry's brow furrowed. I would never trust my father to make a decision like that for me. The carriage finally stopped, and Arthur practically leaped out to look up at his manor. He held the door open for his friend, who followed close behind. The two men looked up at the majestic structure, taking a moment to let it all soak in before looking at one another and smiling impishly. Oh yes, Arthur, Henry conceded. I would be shocked if there isn't at least one ghost wandering around in there. They laughed and hurried up the stairs and into the foyer. Oak leaves were still scattered on the marble floor, and there was a strange chill hanging in the air. Duncan, you need to get the fires going. If this is to be a home, it has to feel like one. Arthur rubbed his hands together. Already on it, my lord. Matthew should be coming in with firewood any minute. Duncan, Arthur's valet, took his hat and nodded. Good man. Arthur and Henry continued into the drawing room. All the furniture is being imported from France. It's going to be a tasteful blue. Hopefully your future wife likes blue. Henry blew a puff of dust off the mantle over the fireplace. If she doesn't, then I'll sell it and give her whatever she wants. As long as she's pretty. She will, without question, be the most stunning creature in Canwick. Arthur flashed a confident smile as he turned back toward the doorway leading to the foyer. Henry shook his head and they returned to the entryway. Two grand staircases curved around both walls, meeting the second floor at opposite ends of the room. Arthur and Henry explored every corner of the house, while Duncan followed along, writing notes of everything Arthur said needed done in each room. The bedrooms on the west side of the manor are all in perfect condition. The kitchen and dining room will need renovating as well as the servants' quarters. I have to talk to the builders who will be arriving shortly. Perhaps you'd like to assist. Actually, I was thinking I'd like to go out for a ride. Henry looked out the window at the acres of green grass stretching out toward the west. It's been ages since I went for a ride in the country, and after being cooped up in the carriage, I think a little outdoor excursion would be divine. He left allowing the countryside's fresh air to clear his head. Of its own volition, though, his mind kept returning to the conversation he had with Arthur. Henry was determined that he should wait until the right woman came along, and if she never did, so be it. He could live his life as a bachelor if it meant avoiding the arguments and anger. It was a better option, and perhaps it was the only option life would present him with. Chapter 3 Walter was contentedly brushing Roderick, with the stable hand standing by to watch over him. Joseph, do you suppose you could watch over him for a while if I went out for a quick ride? Of course, Miss Lydia. Joseph nodded as he dumped a bucket of water into the trough. I'll be coming back and forth between here and the well, but he's a good lad. I know he won't be any trouble. Walter, you'll be good and listen to Joseph, won't you? Yes, ma'am. Walter looked back over his shoulder. She saddled up Lady and set off on her ride, imagining, as she often did, that she was riding towards some unknown destination, never to return to Stanley Hall. <coughs> she would go somewhere far beyond the reach of the Countess and never look back. She told herself that one day it wouldn't be a fantasy. One day she would turn twenty-one, and her stepmother would give her the money that her father had set aside for her. Perhaps she would use it to buy a modest little cottage somewhere in the country. She would have a few chickens and perhaps a milking cow. It may not sound like much for someone born into nobility, 
but it was the most she could hope for. After all the years of abuse, it was a wonder she was able to muster up the dream of a better future at all. The sunshine melted over her skin, and Lydia drank in the sweet perfume of the afternoon air. Lady trotted over the moor and seemed to be enjoying the warmth of the day just as much as she was. Lady was a healthy chestnut brown with a long, flowing black mane. She was ageing gracefully, as far as horses were concerned. She was always loved and well cared for, which must have contributed to her longevity. Lydia gave thanks often that Lady was the one thing Margaret hadn't taken from her after her father died. During her darkest times, especially the days following her father's death, Lydia found that the only reprieve from the pain of his loss was found in her time spent caring for her horse. Lady would never judge her or tell anyone her secrets. She was someone Lydia knew would love her unconditionally, regardless of whether she was happy or sad. Even on days when she suffered the indignity of being screamed at in front of the house staff after being accused by the Countess of lying or her disrespectful tone, Lady was there for her. Lydia was convinced that animals were far more intelligent than they were given credit for. They can sense what you're feeling even if you don't show any emotion at all. Love was a precious commodity after losing her father. She was no longer allowed to socialise with anyone except the servants at Stanley Hall. There was a relatively high rate of turnover at the manor since the Countess frequently accused members of her staff of stealing and would garnish their pay for anything that went missing. The only one who stayed on was Tabitha Marsh, the housekeeper. She was a short woman with a round face and a motherly disposition. She was hired when Lydia was small and was always regarded by Lydia as family. Tabitha often told Lydia that the only reason she stayed on and put up with the Countess was to make sure nothing worse could befall her. Over the years, the Countess had tried hard to train the girl not to stand up for herself, so the old housekeeper felt it only right to stay behind and try and counter whatever damage she was able. Tabitha made sure Lydia knew that what was happening to her was wrong, and society would most likely be on her side if she decided to rise up and make her situation known. But she couldn't defy Margaret and risk never seeing Walter again. It was a fear greater than losing her inheritance. Both scenarios were threatened on a regular basis any time the Countess sensed a hint of rebellion in the air. Arabella didn't have a mean bone in her body, but she, like everyone else, lived in fear of her mother. Even though she was the only person her mother treated with an ounce of genuine affection, she was made to believe that she was only valuable if she could marry someone wealthy with a good title. Arabella turned a blind eye to her mother's treatment of the staff and Lydia. Having grown up accustomed to the mind games and general cruelty, she simply accepted the reality of the situation and didn't question it. Lydia had been so excited to find that her father was marrying someone with a daughter who was only two years younger than herself. The thought of having a sister filled her with joy, and upon meeting her, she adored her immediately. Even after everything, she had no room in her heart for malice when it came to Arabella. None of what the Countess had done was her fault, and Lydia knew no one could do anything to make things any better for her. But it couldn't be denied by anyone that Arabella was tightly in the grasp of her mother and always had been. Lydia remembered a time when she used to have friends, other young ladies of the ton. They used to come over and picnic out in the fields, running and playing chase. But Margaret stopped her from seeing them years ago. The time for tea and cakes with friends was a thing of the past, and the Countess never failed to remind her that with her father gone, she was nothing special. Lydia secretly used to hope to see her friends when out riding. However, she never once ran into anyone. Sometimes she would think about them and wonder where they were and what they were like now that they were grown. Lydia knew it was likely they were all married by now. Perhaps they were raising children of their own and enjoying Sunday picnics with the other families of the town. Did they think of her? Did anyone wonder what had happened to her after her father died? Lydia silently crossed herself. It was not anyone's responsibility to look out for her. She tried her best to grow beyond any capacity for bitterness toward the world. 
trusting that all things happened when and as they were meant to. Surely her experience being forced to live under the Countess's authority had taught her something, long-suffering perhaps. She had found a calmness, an inner strength that made her sure she could survive anything. She could be treated cruelly and remain kind to those around her. Most of all, she had patience. Patience that gave her a threshold for emotional pain. One that most people her age would never have to experience. A bird in the underbrush panicked at the sound of ladies' hooves approaching. As it flapped violently to escape its hiding place, Lady reared up, startled by the sudden commotion, and sent Lydia crashing toward the ground. Trying to land on her feet was a mistake, one which she realised the moment her ankle twisted and intense pain shot up her right leg. Though the grass had somewhat cushioned her fall, the moist earth beneath allowed her feet to sink into the mud. The bottom of her simple grey dress and her hands were quickly getting dirty as she tried desperately to balance on her good leg. Thankfully, Lady didn't abandon her entirely. As soon as she realised she'd lost her rider, she circled back around the clearing, but still refused to go near the underbrush where the bird had flown from. Oh, good grief, you silly thing! <laughs> Lydia tried to take a step forward, but immediately knelt down. Realising the injury to her ankle wasn't going to allow her to chase her horse around the clearing. <laughs> oh, come on, sweet girl. Lydia clicked her tongue and reached out, but Lady seemed committed to keeping her distance from the bushes. The sound of another rider coming through the trees made Lydia hold her breath. No, her blood ran cold. Being seen like this, on the ground, in the mud with her hair a mess, felt like a fate worse than death. What if they recognise me? A black horse with a shining coat emerged from the tree line, carrying a smartly dressed man with dark wavy hair. Lydia limped to her feet, folding her hands and lowering her gaze. Just when she thought things couldn't get worse, now she was here unchaperoned with a stranger. She winced in pain and lost her balance, falling back to the ground as gracefully as she could. You're hurt, the man's voice was deep and gentle. He dismounted his horse, and as he came nearer, Lydia could see his face more clearly. A chiselled jaw framed his full lips and strong chin. His eyes were blue but seemed dark and mysterious, almost analytical in their movement. I'm all right, my lord. Lydia smiled. My horse has never been the skittish type. A little bird flew out and she lost her composure. Everyone is entitled to a bad day, I suppose. I suppose so. He walked toward Lydia, whose eyes were wide with worry as she gestured to her horse. Could you please? Lydia implored. Of course, he nodded before turning his attention to Lady. Cautiously, he walked toward her with his hand outstretched in a gesture of trust. Easy girl. He softly rubbed her forehead and took the reins that were now dangling. Lydia watched every movement of his hands. His touch looked gentle, and Lady seemed less nervous, closing the space between them willingly. With Lady's reins in hand, the mysterious stranger then returned to Lydia, who was still sitting down. Are you all right? I think I'll be all right. I just need a moment to get my balance, I think. Here. He reached his hand out, and she accepted it, getting to her feet and trying to hop toward her horse, causing herself to nearly fall again. The shoes I wore are not suitable for this terrain, she laughed nervously. He said nothing but simply smiled. Taking her hand and helping her back into her saddle, he begged pardon. Forgive me. Thank you, sir, she said, smoothing out her dress. I should be able to make it home now. It would be no trouble to see you safely to your door, he replied. You're very kind, but that won't be necessary, she assured him. It wouldn't be honourable to let you ride off alone in your current state. I should not have been out alone in the first place, she sat tall and confident, twisted ankle aside. I certainly shouldn't be escorted home by a gentleman unchaperoned. I understand your concern, but I can't help but worry that you'll be thrown again. I could not bear to hear later that you were found with further injury. Lady is usually very well behaved. As you mentioned before, 
he reached up and stroked Lady's neck. But as you said, everyone is entitled to have a bad day once in a while. She rarely throws me, I assure you. <laughs> I insist, he smiled, and she felt her defences lower. Very well, she relented against her better judgement. Thank you. I'm merely doing what any decent person would do in the same situation. I am Lord Henry Radcliffe, Marquis of Whitecroft. He bowed. She hesitated before responding. If she were to introduce herself as Lydia Stanley, the Countess would find some way to make her life miserable for the foreseeable future. Miss Marsh? Miss Lydia Marsh? Surely Tabitha wouldn't mind her borrowing her last name under the circumstances. Lord Whitecroft flashed a smile that made her heart flutter as he led Lady Forward to take the reins of his own horse in his other hand, leading them out of the clearing. Where is your home, Miss Marsh? Stanley Hall, where all the elms are gathered on the hill just past the moor. She pointed in the direction of her family home. He led on, and she thought about how different things would be if her father had still been alive. She would have been a distinguished lady, and this would have been the perfect beginning of a beautiful love story. But she wasn't a lady. Not anymore. Do you ride often? Every day, if I can help it, she smiled. I've had lady since I was a child, and I think this was only the fourth time she's thrown me. You sound like a true horsewoman, he said over his shoulder. She blushed. That's the highest praise I've received in a long time. Well deserved, I'm sure. I don't know how well deserved it could have been. If you hadn't come along, who knows how long I would have been out there trying to get her to come to me. Nonsense, I'm sure you would have rescued yourself in no time at all. I highly doubt that, although it's kind of you to say so. She watched her father's house slowly come into view, remembering how her heart used to overflow with joy at the sight of it. Now she always dreaded going home, unsure of what torments her stepmother had in store for her. Do you have any other interest besides riding? Lord Whitecroft asked. I enjoy reading if I have time. She couldn't help but enjoy the sound of his voice. She had never had a gentleman of status engage her in conversation. That's wonderful. What are your favourites? I have a small collection of French poetry, as well as a shelf devoted to the classics, but I confess I do have a secret love of modern mystery. Have you read the works of Angus Whitfield? he asked. Lydia's eyes widened at the mention of the name of one of her favourite mystery authors, but she remained calm and poised. I have, she swallowed. I rather enjoyed the short stories he published about the mysteries of Italy. Ah, yes, Henry agreed. Those were some of his earliest works. I've been looking for a copy to add to my collection. I think I enjoyed the curious case of Wilhelm Green the most. That one was quite suspenseful. Lydia felt silly in thinking to herself how hard it was for her to sleep after reading that book. As they approached the house, she could see Helena, who was Arabella's lady's maid. She was unhurriedly bringing in a basket of carrots from the garden when she looked up and saw them. Looking panicked, she ran inside, most likely to inform the Countess that a man was escorting Lydia home. The time for pleasant, relaxed conversation was over, and there was no telling how this transgression would be received. Chapter 4 When he first saw her, Miss Marsh reminded him of a little grey bird that had hurt itself flying into the window of his London townhouse. He remembered the bird being a bit dazed as it fluttered weakly in his hands. As he picked it up, inspecting its legs and wings for any breaks, he could feel it breathing, fearful of his touch. Once it realised he meant no harm, the bird relaxed and simply looked up at him until it was able to reorient itself before flying away. Her hair that had been pinned up in a loose bun was now falling in wavy strands around her face. The afternoon sun caused her fair skin and grey eyes to shine like stars, and every time she spoke, he could hear the smile in her voice. It was hard not to keep turning around to look at her. Every time he glanced back, he thought of how much she looked like a painting. 
Henry was making a conscious effort not to ask Miss Marsh a hundred questions. Propriety dictated that he kept his comments confined to the weather, but he couldn't help but inquire about her interests and hobbies. So often, conversation was wasted on filling what would otherwise be an awkward silence. But he longed to hear her speak about her life, her thoughts, her likes and dislikes. So overwhelming was his curiosity about this stunning creature whom he had discovered that he felt he could have continued talking with her for hours if circumstances allowed. But that was not the case. Surely his father would be thrilled to hear that he had become interested in calling on a young lady. He might have some negative comments about the nature of their meeting, but those concerns would likely be laid to rest once he met her and saw the dignity with which she carried herself. True, she had been out for a ride in the countryside all on her own. She was obviously aware of societal expectations about such things, but she also seemed to possess an underlying defiance that he found refreshing. This was a quality he believed his mother would appreciate and enjoy at length, should they get an opportunity to chat. He tried not to think about his conversation with Arthur. Concepts like destiny and love at first sight were childish notions certainly not forces that an educated gentleman of his character believed in or wanted at work in his life. And yet he was completely captivated by her. He struggled to keep his eyes forward as he led the horses, speaking to her over his shoulder about books and riding. The small talk was only scratching the surface of the things he wanted to know about her. In less civilised times, deeper, more meaningful questions could be asked. But here and now, he was confined to keeping the conversation superficial. He wished the distance to her home was greater. If that were the case, it would have given him more time with her. However, he knew the longer they were alone together, the greater the doubt that would be cast on her character. He had no desire to damage her reputation, in spite of his selfish desire to extend their conversation. Her injury was obviously causing her significant pain, as was evident by her inability to stand even as she insisted on being left on her own. The fact that she shared two of his greatest passions for reading and horseback riding only added to her subtle allure. She was wearing a simple grey dress, which was lucky, considering she had fallen into the mud. His insistence on helping certainly seemed at least mildly vexing to her. However, she was gracious, remaining calm and poised throughout the entire ordeal which Henry found surprising. He had always tried to maintain that no two women were alike. But in his experience thus far, the women he had encountered in London seemed rather fragile and were prone to getting emotional quickly when trouble did arise. It was as if they wanted to be viewed as fragile, delicate things. This did give some credence to his father's view of women. Generally, they were happy to accept the help of anyone willing to offer assistance with any issue at hand. Henry, being his mother's son, obviously wanted to believe women were more capable than people were led to believe, but he had often found himself disappointed. As Stanley Hall came into view, he asserted to himself that this would be the perfect time to introduce himself to Miss Marsh's family, affording himself the opportunity to call on her again. A servant girl out front spotted them and scurried inside, presumably to inform the lady and lord of the house that Miss Marsh had been delivered safe and sound. They had most likely expected her back much earlier and were probably worried sick. Soon a fair-skinned woman with greying blonde hair appeared in the doorway. Her dark, opulent gown flowed back as she swept into the square to meet him. A beautiful girl dressed just as elegantly in bright pink followed behind her mother. The younger girl had golden ringlet curls that bounced as she glanced around. A small, dark-haired boy dressed in a fine suit rushed up, and the older woman caught him by the collar of his shirt, pulling him back. His eyes were wide with worry, but he wrinkled his nose, looking up at his mother in an irritated fashion. Oh, good heavens, what happened? <laughs> the lady of the house looked at Miss Marsh and the mud around the bottom of her dress. This woman was attractive for her age, and obviously put a great deal of time and effort into her appearance. Her face reddened ever so slightly, and her eyebrows drew together. Pursing her lips, she took a deep breath, as if attempting to calm herself. Forgive me, Henry bowed. I am Lord Henry Radcliffe, Marquess of Whitecroft. 
I was out for a ride when I found Miss Marsh, who had been thrown from her horse. She objected, but I had to insist on making sure she got home safely. The woman's expression softened, and she put on a superficial smile, glancing at Miss Marsh and then at her own daughter. After meeting the lady of the house, her stubbornness made more sense. Even though Henry was second-guessing his choice to bring Miss Marsh home, he maintained a confident outer appearance. He could only hope that his explanation would prevent the woman from scolding her daughter too severely. Since Miss Marsh had seemed fairly anxious about how his company would be perceived, it would be a shame for her to be punished when he was the one that had insisted. Oh my, Miss Marsh! The lady of the house looked at the girl who now seemed stiff and nervous atop her horse's saddle. Blinking as if hoping to conjure a tear to her eye, the woman continued. Thank goodness you're all right. Little Walter would have been devastated if anything happened to his governess. We all would have. Governess, Henry thought. Her manners and the way she spoke certainly seemed to be more of what would be expected from a daughter of the house. I am the Countess of Canwick, and this is my daughter Arabella. She reached her hand out, and Henry took it, bowing shallowly before taking Arabella's hand and doing the same. Are you visiting family here in Canwick? A friend, actually, Henry smiled. The Viscount of Ranton, do you know of him? There were few in high society who didn't know of Arthur. If they hadn't met him personally, they should at least know him by reputation. Arthur was one of those people about whom everyone had a strong opinion. There were some that found him unrefined. Ever since he was a boy, he'd had a hard time sitting still, as if he had more energy than could be contained in his body. Henry found it a compliment to his introverted nature. Arthur most definitely contributed to improving Henry's ability to engage people in conversation. While his mother was quite fond of Arthur, his father had always found him annoying. We met Lord Ranton in London, Arabella said, trying to suppress her excitement. Has he moved into his manor yet? He is overseeing the renovations as we speak. He's very excited to make Cold Creek Manor and Canwick his home. Oh, won't that be lovely? The Countess shot a pointed look at her daughter, and Henry couldn't help but sense that hers and her daughter's opinions of Arthur seemed to differ. Lord Ranton is a lovely gentleman. We can't wait to attend the ball he's planning once he gets settled in. He seems like he would be such a fine host. Indeed he is. Henry folded his hands behind his back and pressed his lips together. Throwing social functions is one of his greatest passions, and it shows... He spares no expense to make every event more memorable than the last. This was something that was quite true of Arthur. What his excessive energy caused him to lack in social grace was made up for by his hospitality. When he organised a social event, he made sure to invite only the most distinguished youths of his generation and made sure they all had a wonderful time. We are so indebted to you for rescuing our governess. You and Lord Ranton simply must come and have dinner with us. It would be wonderful to catch up. It was just a stroke of luck that we were having Arabella debut when we did. We had considered doing it last year, but it was right that we waited until she turned 17. The extra year really gave her a chance to put the proper polish on. We are so proud of her accomplishments. Arabella blushed and smiled sweetly. Oh, Lord. Henry thought back to his conversation with Arthur. This girl was very pretty, but her vacant expression was concerning. I am going to have to make sure that Arthur is on his guard around these two. He is looking for a pretty wife, and the Countess is no doubt the type to be looking for a son-in-law with a pretty inheritance in his future. Poor Arthur won't stand a chance against a pair of big blue eyes like hers. I'm sure Arthur and I would be honoured. Henry circled around to help Miss Marsh down from her horse. A short, stalky woman rushed up to put her arm around the girl and helped her off to the door. The little boy, who oddly bore a greater resemblance to his governess than the countess and her daughter, wriggled away from his mother and came close to hug his governess. I'm all right, Walter, she whispered. Be good now and go stand next to your mother. The boy frowned but obeyed. It was a pleasure meeting you, Miss Marsh. When Henry spoke, the woman helping Miss Marsh turned around with a bewildered look on her face. The pleasure was mine. I thank you for your assistance, Lord Radcliffe. 
Miss Marsh seemed to rush through her statement. Henry assumed she must have been in a hurry to get the weight off her ankle. The Countess kept glancing toward Miss Marsh as if anxious for her to go into the house. Can we expect you and Arthur this coming Friday around four o'clock or so? That sounds most agreeable, Henry said as he mounted his horse. I look forward to it. Something was odd about this family, but Henry reserved judgment. Surely he couldn't judge the Countess after only just meeting her. He had been warned by his mother not to make up his mind about a person after a single encounter. However, his father had always told him to follow his instincts, and he couldn't help but sense that something was amiss. On his ride back to Cold Creek Manor, he was elated. Governess or not, he had met the most interesting girl he had ever encountered. It would be best not to mention his interest in her to Arthur or anyone. It was a single meeting, and Henry was determined to keep his wits about him. The last thing he needed was for word to get back to his father that he was calling on a governess. Chapter 5 Lydia examined the progress of the swelling. It had been two days since her accident, and she had certainly improved, but she was still rather perturbed by the condition of her ankle. Wrapping it tightly in a cloth to prevent it from moving with too much agility, Lydia put her foot to the floor and stood. It held easily enough, and she was confident to move forward. Lydia had not left her room unless she had to. Instead, she chose to lie in bed and read with her foot held in place by two boards and wrapped tightly. But now she had finished her reading materials and was desperate to get something new. She made her way to the library and searched through a few volumes before hobbling back out into the hallway. Lydia had planned to return to her room, but she didn't want to put the pressure on her foot by climbing the stairs again and decided to sit in the parlour. It was her favourite of the parlours because her stepmother rarely used it. Being one of the smaller rooms in the estate, it was far less grand than Lady Canwick would care for. So, it was often the one which Lydia would retreat to, to give herself a break from all of the chaos that might occur in the house. It was the one place where she still felt as though she might have a bit of ownership and control over her life. Only about twenty minutes of peace and quiet were afforded to her before Arabella came bursting into the room. Her expression was dire and she appeared as though she might faint with horror. Good heavens, what has gotten into you? Lydia asked with a gentle laugh. My hair. Oh, Lydia, it looks dreadful. Can you fix it for me? Please. I hate it ever so much. Only you can do it the right way. Chelsea only makes a mess of it, she lamented. Lydia felt sorry for Arabella's maid, but also could not deny the truth of it. She was not skilled in hair. Lydia sighed. Certainly come sit, she instructed. Arabella moved a chair in front of Lydia and sat, handing over the hairbrush as she did so. Tell me, what is all of this about? I have scarcely seen you in a state like this, unless there was a definite reason to try and impress someone, Lydia noted. Well, I suppose that I am, Arabella giggled. Lydia grinned to herself wondering what sort of mischief Lady Canwick had gotten Arabella into now. Who was she planning to set her daughter up with? Who was she planning to make a match of? Do tell, Lydia prodded. Well, this evening, Lord Ranton and Lord Whitecroft are coming to dinner, Arabella announced with the same girlish laugh. Lydia's smile fell, and she very nearly forgot herself as she pulled too tightly on Arabella's hair. Ouch! What was that for? Arabella demanded. Oh, sorry, Lydia apologised, realising that her nerves had truly gotten the better of her. Knowing that Lord Whitecroft, the man she had been introduced to, and Lord Henry Radcliffe, was coming to dinner, was quite a shock. She wished she had known sooner. She wished for a lot of things. Would it be possible to cross his path again, seemingly by accident? After the estate had come into view, Lydia knew she had frozen a bit and failed to maintain a productive conversation with the man. And then, once they had gone inside, she had only remained for a short time before going off and taking care of her ankle without the concern of others. But he had been a very kind man. And he had asked her a lot of questions about herself, 
which made Lydia even more curious about him in return. What sort of man was he? Did he have the same arrogant aspirations for life that so many nobles had? Or was he always the sort of gentleman who would stop and help a young woman thrown from her horse with an injured ankle? She would likely never know. Certainly Lady Canwick would never approve of the two of them getting anywhere near one another. What do you think of Lord Whitecroft? Arabella asked as if reading her thoughts. Lord Whitecroft, Lydia echoed elusively. Yes, Mamma thinks he would make an excellent match, she answered in her sweet, naive way. Lydia felt a coldness creep into her heart, but she winced and pushed it away, focusing rather on the pins she was placing in Arabella's blonde curls. A small part of her wished she could disappear into them and hide forever. Is that so? she asked. Lydia steadied her breathing, not allowing her emotions to get the best of her, even though she found it enormously difficult. She could not allow her resentment towards Lady Canwick to get in the way of her friendship with Arabella, even if said friendship was tentative at best. Oh yes, Lord Whitecroft is very handsome, and he has quite a lot of money and a big house in Ableshire, Arabella said. It is a part of his inheritance, something that he will get when his father passes on. Lydia steadied herself again. She didn't need Arabella explaining the meaning of inheritance. Just because her own had been taken from her didn't mean she was unaware of the concept. He never mentioned it, Lydia replied, as Lord Whitecroft had never said anything to her about his estate. Not only that, but she wanted to slip in the statement as a reminder to Arabella that she had met him first and had spent some time alone with him. To be sure, it had only been a brief period, but it didn't change the fact that they had walked together and spoken about a few things. Lydia was suddenly jealous of that time and wanted to hold it close. But she also had little desire to be competitive with her stepsister. It wasn't in her nature, and she was disappointed in herself for feeling this petty jealousy just now. So, Lydia put in extra effort to make sure Arabella's hair was flawless, just to prove she was not petty enough to get in the way of another woman's happiness. Well, he wouldn't mention it, would he? The two of you only walked to the estate. It is not as though you had been brazen enough to ask him whether or not he owned a house, Arabella laughed. Lydia stayed quiet, allowing Arabella to do the talking as she was better at it anyway. Although, I must confess that he is not so dashing as his friend Lord Ranton. Is that terrible of me? Oh, but it is true. He is nice enough and all, but Lord Ranton is really very handsome. Arabella continued, oblivious to the pain she was causing Lydia through all of this talk. I do not have the honour of claiming Lord Ranton as an acquaintance, Lydia reminded her. As such, I cannot comment on the two. I have no knowledge of who is more attractive. Oh, very well. But what do you think of Lord Whitecroft? Arabella began to urge again, wanting an answer that Lydia had no desire to give, not honestly. She sighed again, trying to hold her patience. It is hard to get a full measure of someone in one meeting, and we had only that one. But I suppose there is something quite dashing about being rescued by a man on a horse, Lydia confessed. Arabella nodded. Oh, certainly, it must have been quite heroic of him, and I cannot blame you for finding that attractive. I certainly would have, in fact... I wish I had seen it just so I might know my own feelings further. Lydia didn't want Arabella to know her own feelings further in regard to Lord Whitecroft. It was nonsense to think like that. After all, why should she care if he found Arabella amusing and fell in love with her? There was nothing about him that Lydia might ever stake her claim on. And Arabella was far more intrigued by Lord Ranton anyway. Would Lady Canwick refuse her daughter the one nobleman her daughter cared for, all just to match her with another nobleman? Whatever the thought, Lydia didn't care to linger on it. She added the final pin to Arabella's hair and examined the whole of it, judging whether or not she was happy with her work. There, she said. How do you like it? Arabella grasped the small mirror she had brought down with her and looked throughout as much of her hair as she was able to angle to see. Lydia waited for the approval or dismissal, but
but saw in the reflection a smile upon Arabella's sweet face. Thank you, Lydia. It is perfect. Far better than anything Chelsea might have come up with, she said, adding the slight at the end once more. I am glad you are happy with it. And I hope you enjoy the dinner, Lydia said, trying very hard to mean it. I shall tell you all about it, Arabella giggled, oblivious once more. Perfect, Lydia said with a false smile to mask the pain she felt. She didn't want to hear any of it. She had no decia to learn of the outcome of a dinner in which the kindest, the only, man she had met of Lart was potentially going to woo or be wooed by her stepsister. But as Arabella daintily departed the parlour, Lydia understood once more to where she was resigned. This estate was going to be her prison for the foreseeable future. She was not a young lady of society, she was a governess. Lydia saw that Arabella had left the mirror behind. She picked it up in her hand and gave herself a look over. She saw her grey eyes, large like Arabella's, but almond-shaped instead of attractively big and round like her stepsister's. She saw the wisps of brown hair at the edges of her heart-shaped face and the dimples she shared with her father and Walter. Now, were those features ever going to be enough to find a man who might appreciate her? Would she even want a man who sought her for her beauty rather than her true self? She was not Arabella. Lydia had never been one to settle for whatever was most convenient. There had been a time in which she and Arabella were equals. Being only a couple of years older than her stepsister, Lydia had been excited to have a sister who was so close in age. But that had all been prior to the death of her father. That had been a time before Lady Canwick had taken over the house and claimed it as her own. Before she had used Walter as an excuse to declare ownership over the estate and everything and everyone in it, it had been quite a long time ago. When Lydia and Arabella had first met, all was well between them, genuinely, not as it was now. Before they were dear friends, excited to be living together, after all, Lydia knew that Arabella was not so bad. She had been a wonderful young woman and had seemed oblivious to the changes that had been occurring under the thumb of her mother. There was a bit of a willful ignorance in her. Arabella was rather liable to persuasion, particularly that of her mother, a woman who was able to persuade anyone of anything, it seemed. Well, nearly anyone. Yes, it was Margaret Stanley who posed the real danger. She was a woman who fought to get everything she wished for and was not willing to accept an outcome in which she received anything less. Lydia had seen it from the start after her father passed. First, it was small things, like changing decorations and scolding the maids when they had done nothing wrong. But then it had grown into more drastic changes, such as even removing some of the staff. Slowly but surely, Lady Canwick had moved Lydia into lower roles within the house while elevating her own daughter and ensuring that no one was able to comment on it. Lydia had been living with that for a few years now. She was amazed at how cleverly Lady Canwick managed to do it. With each and every day that passed, she stripped Lydia of some dignity or other. First, she insisted she be the one comforted, not allowing the staff to mourn with Lydia. All their attention was to be on Lady Canwick, and she wailed until they would come to her. Many of them, particularly Tabitha Marsh, would make efforts with Lydia. But the new woman of the house would resist it. She would call for them, demand they bring her tea and rub her feet. She claimed she could not bear to see Lydia because she resembled her father too much and that it brought about such pain and sadness in her. Then Lydia was forbidden to go out because she had to remain in mourning. Lady Canwick insisted Lydia's mourning was the sort that required solitude, although she herself hosted guests from amongst society frequently. And little by little, day by day, things continued to change. By the time Walter was in need of better attention and education, Lady Canwick had asked Lydia to show him how to read, since she enjoyed it so much. But that quickly became more, and soon Lydia was nothing but a governess to her younger brother. No. Arabella was not the danger. She was a simpleton, but sweet. And Lydia wondered if she would ever recognise her mother for who she was. Chapter 6 
Yes, indeed. You look like quite the gentleman. Now, are you listening to me? Henry asked, frustrated that his concerns were going unheard. Snack Arthur had been far more concerned with his appearance than he was about anything Henry had to say. I heard you, Lord Ranton grumbled. You needn't say it like that, I'm quite serious, Henry said. Yes, and that is the problem. You're always far too serious. You cannot tell me to ignore the woman that I find entirely enchanting, he complained. On the contrary, it is my very duty to ensure you are not swayed by her charms so easily, Henry rebutted as they departed from Cold Creek and made their way to the coach. Arthur laughed with enthusiasm, shaking his head at the nature of Henry's concern. What Henry had meant to be a sincere warning, his friend turned into banter, gleefully mocking him the whole journey to Stanley Hall. Arthur simply could not be convinced that there was more to a woman than her beauty, and Henry was beginning to realise he didn't even want to consider it. Lady Arabella is a delightful young woman, and I aim to be delighted this evening. Now can we please leave it at that? Lord Ranton asked with a finality in his voice. Henry remained quiet, but it was within moments that they reached Stanley Hall and climbed out of the coach in order to greet their hostesses. The moment they were indoors, Henry once again noticed the beauty of the home. And yet, as the housekeeper greeted them, and Lady Canwick and Lady Arabella came out to meet them, he felt as though something was missing. Miss Marsh was not present. That left him with a sense of loss, almost, and Henry could not quite understand why. He wondered why it was that in just that brief period of having met her, he was so intrigued by her. Now, dinner is prepared, would you gentlemen like to follow me? Lady Canwick offered with a charming smile. She led them towards the dining room, and Henry politely followed behind Arthur. The niceties continued to be exchanged as the four of them walked together, and he wondered if he would have much of an opportunity at all to interact with them. Or even if he wanted to. Still, he figured, Lady Arabella was probably a nice young woman. Henry realised he might be treating her with far too much suspicion simply because he was concerned about his friend. But no matter the bad taste her mother left, he was determined that he would make an effort to observe the young woman's character. I do hope you gentlemen are fond of birds. We have an elaborate assortment of dishes, and each one is more exotic than the last, Lady Canwick announced with pride as all took their seats. If it is anything like the Merryweather dinner, then I think I shall faint with delight, Lord Ranton chuckled. Oh, goodness gracious, what a bourgeois indulgence that was. Lady Canwick laughed in reply. Henry was entirely unsure of what they were speaking, but assumed it was something to do with one of the dinners that had taken place during the season. Everyone was always trying to outdo the others, and at times it became utterly ridiculous. It appeared that even Lady Canwick could not deny that. Have you ever seen such a display? Arabella joined in, appearing in an attempt to appease her mother and Arthur. But then her eyes found Henry, and she composed herself. Oh dear, I am afraid you must feel terribly left out as you did not attend that evening. Forgive us for seeming like such fools on the matter, but it was utterly comedic. The Merryweather household tries very hard to show their wealth, and it was a garish display in the end, she explained. Ah, Henry replied, unable to bolster his enthusiasm. Taking an appropriate amount of his wine, Henry waited until the others returned to engage in their conversation again before he took another drink. He was not a lout by any means, but he was quite certain he would not make it through the evening without a decent bit of alcohol to improve his mood and loosen him up. It was hardly a first choice, but it appeared to be the only one he had left to himself. And can you even imagine how the Cunningham Ball ended? I never anticipated a fight to break out among such nobility, Lady Canwick continued, enjoying the gossip. It appeared to Henry that she had attended every possible event for no other reason than to be able to gossip about the goings-on and all of the chaos that had ensued. You may be surprised to know, my lady, that Lord Whitfield and the Baron Fiennes have been feuding for an age. The rumours say that Lord Whitfield was in love with a young woman, but the Baron had already proposed marriage to her, Lord Ranton began. 
enjoying that he could hold the attention of the ladies. But clearly her parents saw the advantageous match of an earl over a baron, so they bid her to call off the engagement to the baron. She refused initially. I have heard it said that she cared for neither man but had a particular disliking for the earl. So when she refused, her parents did it for her, he continued. Oh dear, what happened then? Lady Arabella asked, her eyes wide with intrigue. Would you believe it that the young woman disgraced herself and her family by running off with some fish merchant? He concluded. The two women gasped in horror, and Henry had to bite his tongue not to start laughing. The warmth of the wine had begun its work, and he knew he ought to take a break from drinking more until he was in a state that could handle the Borodom without causing him to be foolish. Yes, so the two gentlemen, both of whom loved her very much, have hated one another ever since, Lord Ranton told them. I suppose that all makes sense now. And they both loved her. How terribly romantic, Lady Arabella commented. Her mother cleared her throat in discomfort, embarrassed that her daughter should speak of romance when it was fortune that mattered. Henry still had his wits about him enough to observe this exchange. I am not sure how much romance was involved, Lord Ranton laughed. Whatever do you mean? Lady Arabella asked. She was a beautiful young woman. Is that not enough for a man? He asked, showing once more what he believed to be. Henry looked at his friend, and then at the young woman who appeared to be perplexed. Really? she asked. Lady Canwick laughed in embarrassment once more. Of course, my dear. Don't worry, gentlemen. She's a lovely girl and she knows better. She's only trying to amuse you both, the woman said through gritted teeth. Henry saw that Lady Arabella had her eyes trained on him, almost as if begging him to speak up for her. But he was bored, feeling rather sleepy from the food and wine. Besides, Arthur had made it clear that no one cared about his thoughts on this matter anyway. If beauty was all that mattered to men, then Henry was wrong. He wasn't like the others. And he had to believe he was not the only man in the world who didn't see things through such a shallow lens. Things grew quiet at the table and Henry realised he had an ideal opportunity to slip away for a moment. There was one thing in his mind which he desired. Although it might seem strange to the others at the table, he knew his mind would not be at ease until he had done it. My lady, how is the young woman doing? The governess of your son? The one which I had returned to you, he said, feeling the need to specify in case Lady Canwick did not know the staff of her house very well. Her mouth dropped open as if to speak, but nothing came out. She spluttered, trying to answer, but it was evident that Lady Canwick had no idea how Miss Marsh really was. Lady Arabella promptly stepped in, a look of relief on her face that she had something useful to share with him. She is very well. I left her in the sitting room, just one floor up from here. I think it has been difficult for her to use the stairs a great deal, but she has much improved, Lady Arabella told him. It was a relief to Henry to hear this, and to know she was doing all right. He wished he'd been able to see her before they had started this dinner, and before he'd had anything to drink. But he could still go to her, so long as it was deemed appropriate by Lady Canwick. Surely they would not be alone, so there would be no concern in that regard either. Henry wondered if it was right to risk asking for a private audience, or if it was going to be a hassle and suspicious to the others. In the end, he knew it was best to be brave. After all, was it not simply normal that he should be concerned for the young woman who had been injured and whom he had discovered? Forgive me if this is an improper request, Lady Canwick, but I should very much like to go and speak with her. I am simply interested in the progress of her injury and ensuring that she has recovered well, he said with as much propriety as he could muster. For a moment, Lady Canwick's jaw went slack, but she promptly recovered herself. That would be just fine, she smiled in a rather false way. Nevertheless, Henry was relieved that she had approved, and he decided he would go forward with his plan to visit Miss Marsh and check on her. Tabitha, the Countess called. The housekeeper entered the dining room and curtsied before her mistress. Yes, Lady Canwick, 
she said with a politeness that overshadowed a bitter resentment. Lord Whitecroft would like an audience with Lydia, she said with false cheer. I have approved and should like you to take him to her. The housekeeper looked at him with the same protective suspicion she had shown him the first day in which they had met. But Henry could handle that just fine. He didn't mind her suspicion and deemed it likely to be justified. It was unusual for a nobleman to be so curious about a governess, and he didn't wish to give anyone the wrong impression about his motives. Certainly, Lady Canwick, she replied. Henry followed her and was relieved that the others remained in place, no one bothering to join him. It was clear that Arthur was far too intrigued by Lady Arabella to leave. The Countess simply didn't care about Miss Marsh, and Lady Arabella was devoted to doing whatever it was that her mother desired of her, so there was little chance of seeing her show an interest in the well-being of the governess. Henry smoothed his shirt as they made for the floor upstairs, suddenly finding himself caring very much about his appearance. He very nearly laughed at himself for this, as he had been so determined that appearance counted for very little in the long run. But for some reason that he could not quite place, he wanted Miss Marsh to see him looking his very best. She is just in the parlour. I shall remain with you both, the housekeeper told him. Certainly. And I thank you for being willing to take this time out of your own duties. But I have been concerned for Miss Marsh ever since she had her injury, he said. The housekeeper darted an alarmed look his way, but then turned to face in front again and flattened her expression. Henry wasn't sure what he had said to cause her that level of confusion. Adam. She knocked on the door of one of the rooms on the next floor and announced that the Marquis of Whitecroft had come to see Miss Marsh. When he entered the room, Miss Marsh had a book in her hands, clearly having been sitting there reading. She was dressed simply in a soft grey dress and it only caused her natural beauty to stand out even further. The brown hair of her head hung loosely about her shoulders, not done up in any particular fashion. Oh, hello. Forgive me, for I was not expecting anyone. I fear I'm not presentable, she said in a startled, anxious way. It is my fault. I am sorry for having disrupted you. I hope you can forgive this intrusion, Henry said. For a moment he could not tear his eyes from her, and he wondered if he really was that shallow man he had so often criticised. But the expression on her face told him everything. There was more to Miss Marsh than met the eye. Chapter 7 The tenderness of Lord Whitecroft's expression was something Lydia had not been prepared for. He looked upon her with such kindness, as if he truly saw her aside from Walter and Tabitha, and a few of the other maids who had little time for her regardless, no one looked at her that way. No one paid much attention to Lydia at all. After a moment he broke the gaze and remembered himself, putting on a polite smile and appearing as though he'd never had another thought on the matter. And why should he? Lydia knew she was only the governess in his eyes, in most eyes. Nevertheless, it was a shock that he had come to her. Lydia could scarcely believe the Marquis would bother to check on her or ask to see her. And the fact that her stepmother had allowed it was an even greater surprise. After all, Lydia was not typically afforded much in terms of company. <laughs> but something about the Marquess had moved the Countess to allow for it. And that was enough of a shock to Lydia to cause her delay in responding to the Marquess' very thoughtful apology for startling her. Oh, it is quite all right. Please think nothing of it she replied. And how are you doing? Are you feeling all right after your injury? Have you recovered? He asked, genuinely appearing to care for her well-being with his insistent questions. Lydia nodded. Yes, thank you. I am feeling quite well. I shall be back to my usual duties within a few days, I'm sure. A smile of relief passed over his face, allowing Lydia to realise that he had quite a lovely mouth. And thank you again, for rescuing me the other day, I mean. I appreciate all of your assistance and how kindly you looked after me, she said, knowing he had done a great deal for her in getting her home. Truly, it was my pleasure. I am glad to have gotten you back safely, he replied. Lydia could not ignore the nerves she was feeling. Although she refused to allow it to overwhelm her, 
she knew there was a part of her that was reasonable for feeling that way. After all, she was unused to the individual attention of a man of his station. Having Tabitha stand in the corner of the room, looking through a book herself so as not to increase the discomfort, was helpful. It meant that she at least didn't have to worry about her stepmother thinking further bad things about her when she had done nothing wrong. May I ask where you are from? the Marquis asked suddenly. Lydia glanced at Tabitha for only the briefest second, not wanting to reveal her lie, but knowing she couldn't tell him the truth just yet. I was born and raised locally, she answered safely. She could hardly explain that they were in her father's house and that she had spent her entire life in this house. Would he understand it? Would he grasp why she had to be so vague if he knew the truth? And your family? Do they still live locally? he inquired next. My mother died when I was very young, she answered. Her orphan status would help him understand her reluctance to speak about it. My father passed away about two and a half years after, Lydia added. He looked at her with sadness and compassion, and for a moment Lydia disliked the pity. I do have a half-brother, however, and he is doing very well, she added quickly. Desperate to change the subject rather than reveal anything further about herself, Lydia brought up a new topic. And how are you enjoying your evening? I trust the ladies of the house have managed to entertain you? she asked with a boost of friendly eagerness. Oh, certainly. It has been fine. I am enjoying the country a great deal, to be sure. The air is lovely out here, he replied. And how long do you plan to be in the country? Lydia asked, glad to be the one asking questions now. For a few weeks more, at least. I do not know how long I can justify remaining, but it is good to be here while I can, the Marquis replied. That sounds lovely she said politely. Indeed, he added, trailing off. The two clearly did not know what else ought to be said, but the silence between them spoke volumes. Their eyes connected briefly, and then the Marquis spoke. I ought to return to the dinner party. I shouldn't like to be rude as I am a guest, he said. Certainly, Lydia replied, you should be getting back now. The Marquis bowed and gave her a final smile before he and Tabitha departed from the room, leaving Lydia on her own once more. She sat on the sofa and closed her eyes for a moment, breathing and trying to slow her pounding heart. But it was then that she realised she was not merely overcome by nerves. No, it was more than that. She was upset, truly genuinely frustrated by the whole situation. In another life, if things had gone differently and her father had still been around, Lydia would have been courted by men like the Marquis. This whole affair would likely have begun an official courtship between the two of them. It was the normal thing to happen when there was something that had brought them together like this, and when a man of his station met a woman of hers. Oh, how Lydia wished for that to be true. Her wishing was foolish. It was too late. There was nothing to bring it to fruition but that didn't change how deeply she longed for it. Her father had remarried within such a brief time from when her mother passed away, and she had brought Arabella from her own first marriage with her to a part of the family. And then came Walter shortly after. Lydia's little brother was the male heir. He would receive the title, the house, and the vast majority of the fortune after their father's death. He only had to wait until he was a bit older to accept it. And in that time, Margaret Stanley would rule over them all, ensuring she had control over all of it. She would be the one with all the authority as Walter was still so young. She had taken every advantage of it. She allowed Lydia to stay on in her own home. Through power and manipulation, she made it appear as though she were doing Lydia a favour, as if she was so kind and generous to give her this opportunity but there were rules in place that her stepmother did not allow for others to know, such as the fact that Lydia was made to earn her keep. She had to prove herself and be worth Lady Canwick's energy in order to remain in the home. And how, when she turned 21 years of age, she would finally receive her inheritance and be free of the rules of her stepmother. But that was still two years away, and Lydia didn't know how much longer she could bear this. 
With her inheritance, she would only have the finances. She would never have the title or status that her stepmother essentially stripped of her by demanding she remained hidden in the shadows. She would never have the clout in society to be seen or noticed. She would never have the opportunity to be courted by men of any influence. Even the man who had just stood before her and spoken so gently towards her with such kindness and humility. No, she would have none of that. Maybe she could have a nice home in the countryside. Lydia often dreamt of that. She would stay indoors during the cold months with a fire in the hearth and a cup of tea in her hands to keep her warm. If she was fortunate enough to be able to pay Tabitha to come and stay with her, she would do it. Maybe not even as a maid. Maybe they could simply enjoy the mother and daughter relationship they had managed to build over the years. And she could have chickens. It would be ideal to have hens to provide eggs every morning, and now and then they would raise a rooster or two that they could eat on special occasions. They wouldn't need anything fancy. But the best part would be that Walter would eventually be old enough to visit on his own accord. He could come spend time with them, and they would maintain their closeness. He would not allow his mother to pollute him against her. Everything would be perfect. She needed only to make it through the next two years, and if she could manage that, nothing could stop her. Chapter 8 Henry raised an exasperated eyebrow at the piece of paper in his hand. This letter was the last thing he wanted, or needed. It was hardly the stuff of motivation to receive from his father. And yet it was exactly the sort of letter he knew he ought to have anticipated by now. He had been fortunate not to have to deal with it sooner. The drawing room at Cold Creek held to its name. A shiver went down Henry's spine, and sensing it more than actually seeing it, Arthur put the poker in the fireplace to stoke it. We simply cannot condone this bachelorhood any longer and insist that you pursue marriage with urgency. It is your duty. Your mother wonders if she shall ever have the fortune of a young woman in the home or even the blessing of grandchildren. I, on the other hand, simply fear that my legacy shall be cut short as a result of your insolence on this matter. Perhaps it was not the cold of the room after all. Perhaps it was the contents of the letter that had caused him to shiver with displeasure he had to marry. Everyone was always telling him he had to marry and to do it quickly, that his life would not be important or have any sort of meaning until he was wed. But that hardly seemed true. Henry knew he had value in and of himself without the need to be married off just for the sake of the comfort of others. No, no matter what they said or how much they pestered him on this issue, he would only wed when he met the right woman. A face flashed before his eyes, but he blinked it away in a mix of disappointment and frustration. He would have to find a woman he liked, but who was also deemed suitable by society and his family if he was going to entertain any thoughts at all of marriage. Are you cold? Lord Ranton asked, looking up from his papers and eyeing Henry with irritation. Why? Henry asked. That is the third time in just a few moments that I have seen you shiver. I can't help but wonder if something is deeply the matter with you, or if the fire just isn't reaching you with its warmth, Lord Ranton complained. Oh, forgive me. I hadn't really noticed I was doing it repeatedly, Henry said. Then whatever is in the letter must truly be distracting you. I assume it is from your father, he asked. Yes, of course it is, Henry replied. And what is it all about? he continued. Henry sighed. Just the usual. You know what my father typically writes to me about. What most fathers write about to their bachelor sons, in whom they are deeply disappointed for not being more proactive about their legacy, he stated dryly, rolling his eyes and pursing his lips at the thought. Certainly. Marry and marry well. I have told you that you had best get on with it. Lord Ranton laughed. Precisely. That is what he has written. And yes, indeed, you have already gotten on my case about it before he could have, Henry replied. Make me a grandchild, Lord Ranton asked in a dramatic, grandmotherly tone. More or less, Henry acknowledged. The difference between himself and his friend was that Lord Ranton wanted these things as well. He loved the idea of having an heir to take on his legacy. And more than that, he loved the idea of a young woman who would be devoted to him. I While Henry had no real problem with either of these things, 
he couldn't pretend as though it was the most important thing in his life. Perhaps if his parents had been better suited, he might have seen the benefit of it all. But as it was, he knew he could not marry unless he found a true partner, rather than a societal match that would leave him entirely miserable. It just made no sense to jump willingly into misery when he knew there were better options out there. Henry had known couples who seemed happy. Certainly those who were happier than his own parents. But they were few and far in between. And he had never seen them close up, truly loving one another. Merely that they worked well together. If he was going to find a wife, she also needed to be a friend. Someone he could bond with and laugh with. A woman who entertained him as he would entertain her in return. People had often accused Henry of being dour. He knew he was not, and that it was a poor perception. He loved to laugh, and he loved to enjoy life. But it was hardly the side of him that was often visible because he was so frequently under the scrutiny of others. You know, Arabella is quite lovely, Lord Ranton said, as if it were a sudden thought. Henry suspected he had been mulling it over for quite some time, and that it was anything but sudden. Lovely, yes, Henry replied. Even he could not deny that she was beautiful. Additionally, she seemed genuinely sweet, although there was not much to see of her when she was so overshadowed by that mother of hers. Just lovely, Lord Ranton prodded. Henry was unsure exactly what his friend was trying to get at. Was he asking on his own behalf? He had already appeared to be interested in pursuing the young woman. But his questions and desire to know Henry's opinion made him wonder if Arthur thought that the two of them might even be a match. And that was something Henry had not been prepared to consider. She seems bright, Henry said with a smile. But a bit young, Arthur. He hoped his words were delicate enough, but Arthur's face contorted briefly, showing he had hoped for a more positive statement. Henry felt a little bit guilty, but it was a truth he couldn't deny, and he didn't want to pretend anything different than he felt. Arthur needed to know his true thoughts. If you weren't so opposed to her, we'd already be engaged, Lord Ranton said. This was indeed a surprise to Henry. He had imagined a lot of thoughts running through his friend's mind, but the idea that he was ready to propose to her now was not something he had expected. While it was a relief that Arthur had only wanted his opinion for his own sake, it was still a bit more forward as a thought than he had been thinking. Henry wondered how Arthur's mother would feel about it all. Surely Lady Arabella would happily accept, her mother would accept it greedily. There was no doubt about either of those two and how they would feel about Arabella being the wife of a man like Lord Ranton. He was so well connected in society and extremely wealthy, so it would be ideal for them. But to think that his friend was ready to jump into the marriage after knowing Lady Arabella for such a short time was still a risk. He had only seen her now and then during the London season and then had this one brief dinner. Was he really ready to throw himself into a marriage with her? and to be bound this way to her mother? However, Henry gave himself pause to consider it from Arthur's perspective. Lady Arabella was just what he had been seeking. She was beautiful, and that was really all he cared about. In addition to her beauty, Henry had acknowledged that she seemed sweet and bright, so those were also positive things. And if that was enough for his friend, he ought not to stand in their way. No, he had warned Arthur, and done what he thought best in that regard. If Arthur was going to disregard the warning, if he really wanted to marry the young woman, it was time for Henry to support him. You're that willing to be married, then? You wholeheartedly believe Lady Arabella is the woman to whom you would like to be married? The woman with whom you wish to spend your entire future? he asked. To put it simply, yes, Henry. I wish to marry Lady Arabella. I wish to be married, and I see her as the ideal young woman for the job. She is precisely the sort of young woman I might have wanted, Lord Ranton replied. Then do it, Arthur. Propose marriage and become engaged to her. I shall congratulate you heartily. You have my vow, Henry said. Glad he could be supportive of Arthur, 
even if it was somewhat out of his comfort to promote this particular marriage. Arthur looked at him as if suddenly unsure. He was evidently in conflict with himself, and Henry wondered why, but he had his suspicions. But do you think that I ought to wait? he asked. I mean, should I wait before I propose to her? Wait to proceed? Henry was entirely relieved by this question, but didn't want it to show on his face. To know that Arthur was at least considering this, it was a fortune indeed. After all, how was Henry meant to tell him to slow down when he had already been accused of not being supportive enough? But Arthur had recognised it himself. He was going to try and go about things the right way. A little, wait just a little while. This way you can get to know her better. You can see if there is anything to object to. It is better that you don't go barrelling headfirst into marriage, Henry suggested. You're too wise, Lord Ranton said, laughing to himself. I bow down to your superior judgment, my friend. With that, Arthur stood from his chair and bowed before Henry, causing them both to chuckle at the foolishness of it. This was the sort of humour that Henry hoped he might find in a mate some day. Little moments of no particular depth, just small things to laugh about together. Yes, you should bow, otherwise you might have married every pretty agreeable young lady in England by now, Henry said, not entirely without truth. Too true. Now, if only you would find a woman for yourself, Lord Ranton said in reply, picking up his papers and sitting back down. Henry said nothing back but allowed his friend to get back into his reading and being distracted. There was no further conversation Henry cared to have on the matter, and he didn't particularly want to be badgered by his friend when he had just had that lengthy letter from his father. He knew everyone wanted him to be married. He felt like it was coming at him from every side, and it was as if he had no identity at all outside of everyone telling him to get on with it and marry. Lord Ranton! called the butler, knocking on the door of the parlour. Yes? he asked. The men would like to speak with you regarding the renovations. Some issue or other in the red room, I believe, the man said. Arthur sighed and stood, leaving the parlour to deal with the issues of his new house. Henry imagined what it would be like if he had already taken ownership of the estate in his inheritance. It did not need half as much work as this one, but he still cared very little for the thought of having to deal with all of these details. And then the decorating, which he was hardly equipped for. Those were the things wives were meant to take care of. The actual appearance of the estate was up to the woman of the house to ensure that all was well and beautiful. Henry cared little for homemaking and sometimes wondered if there was something wrong with him in that. And yet when he did try to picture himself and his future at the estate, he had a clear enough image in mind. At first he tried not to picture the woman surrounded by two or three children choosing drapes for the windows. But she came into focus despite himself, and Henry knew from the start exactly who she was. Miss Marsh, Miss Lydia Marsh. With her exquisite complexion and her long and beautiful hair that looked stunning when it hung about her shoulders. And those grey eyes of hers that appeared both large and wise. Yes. She was the face that was before him when he tried to ignore it. Hers was the image of the loving wife he had been trying to fight against with all of his strength. Alas, he had told Arthur not to rush into a marriage, but here was a young woman he didn't even know, and he was picturing her as his future bride. Henry chuckled to himself for his foolishness. Why was he allowing himself to think that far about her? Why was he actually enabling his own thoughts to picture her in that capacity? He barely knew her. He knew she was an excellent rider, despite the fact that she had been thrown from her mare. He knew she was a governess, unfit for marrying a man of his title. He knew she was an orphan, thereby giving her even less status in society. And he knew she was under the thumb of Lady Canwick, whom he truly detested. So whatever his reasons were for picturing her, Henry was determined to end them. He was determined to think of something else and forget that he had ever even met the young woman. His father would never approve of them as a match, no matter how desperate he was for Henry to be married. His mother would be shocked and horrified by the scandal of her son being married to a governess. 
Yet despite all of these thoughts and the acknowledgement of these facts, it was still her face that appeared before him, as if in a dream. It was still Miss Marsh that he wanted to get to know better. It was still Miss Marsh who had been the only bearable thing about that dreadful dinner the night before. If Arthur was going to pursue a courtship with Lady Arabella, it meant Henry might be seeing more of Miss Marsh. And if that were the case, he would have to decide how to protect himself against the feelings for her that were budding up inside of him. Yes, he realised it was true. He was intrigued by her enough that he would actually have to put some sort of conscious strategy in place to prevent himself from gravitating towards her and allowing himself to feel anything for her. Perhaps that was the thing that frightened him the most, not just the feelings that were stirring, but how badly he wanted to allow them to continue. How much he would have liked for her to be the one he considered for his future. Chapter 9 In the parlour, Lydia turned another page from her book. The whole family was in there, and she tried to keep quiet and not speak too much with Walter. A book was the best distraction if she had to be with the others. Walter was completing some of the exercises she had given him from his lessons, answering questions as best he could. He had been doing well with them so far, and she was proud. But it was almost too quiet in the room for a few moments, and Lydia saw that Walter was growing agitated. I don't feel well, he said to her suddenly, his face contorted with some appearance of unpleasantness. What is it? Lydia asked. I'm... I'm not sure. I'm very tired, and my whole body aches badly, he said. Lydia looked him over. It was clear he was not faking anything. There was something wrong, and whatever it was, it had come on fairly suddenly. Aside from being a bit sluggish throughout the day, Walter had been fine thus far. Do you need to go to bed? Perhaps a bit of rest will do you good. It might be just what you need, Lydia suggested. Walter shook his head. It's not that, he said. Lydia studied him, trying to discern what it was. He did look pale. There was evidently something not right. You know, we ought to find him a male tutor, the Countess remarked, ignoring the issue of Walter's health entirely. Lydia looked up at her, confused by the sudden change of subject, and even the thought itself. He has no real men to look up to. No gentleman at all in his life. It might be a good idea. Otherwise we might have Lord Lockwood coming to check on us, she continued. No. Lydia didn't like that thought at all, but knew she couldn't reasonably say anything in regard to the matter. Her opinion didn't make a bit of difference, and she could not show how she felt about Lord Lockwood without appearing disrespectful. Lord Lockwood was Lady Canwick's uncle, and of all the people in the world, he was the one and only person Lydia had seen the Countess fear. He was the only man who had ever given her any cause for concern. His constant threats to come and check on them had grown tiresome, and for Lady Canwick it was evident that he believed her to be incapable of handling her own affairs. We can't have him come. You know what he might do. He might make us all go away with him. We would have to stay with him in the north where it is always drafty and horrible the Countess complained. Lydia considered how nice it would be for Lady Canwick to have to go up there without the rest of them. If Arabella wanted to go and be with her mother, she could. But of course she would be welcome to stay in the estate with Lydia and Walter and Tabitha and the other wonderful staff members. But to be rid of the Countess might not be so bad after all. Lydia realised she had a grin on her face at the thought, and she looked up, noting that she was being stared at by the Countess who had seen it. It was only another reason that her stepmother should hate her, of course. No. I like being taught by Lydia. I don't need anyone else to tutor me, Walter complained. Lady Canwick's eyes narrowed. She did not appreciate being spoken back to. Since she had very little care and regard for her son beyond the inheritance he ensured for her, she had no desire to listen to him ask for the daughter of her late husband, for whom she cared very little. I also have the groom, John. He is a role model for me. He is helping me with my riding skills, Walter added. Lady Canwick's disapproval only increased, but she turned to Arabella instead. 
Lydia couldn't help but wonder what Lady Canwick would do with her once Walter was with a tutor or at a school. What would her purpose for Lydia be then? Would she grow even crueler? Would she allow any sort of relationship to remain between brother and sister? Lydia had taken care of Walter for most of his life. By the time he was old enough that he no longer needed a nurse, she had been his primary caregiver. She had always been a greater part of his life than Lady Canwick had been. It seemed cruel to separate the two of them, but that was just the sort of thing she might do, and for whatever reason she wanted. Lydia wondered if she would do it even for the mere fact of being able to assert her power. Would Lady Canwick decide to separate them just to punish Lydia for existing and still being in the home? Would she do all of this just to create trouble for the sister and brother? But the conversation had been dropped as suddenly as it had begun. Lady Canwick and Arabella were discussing the gentleman who had come for dinner the night before. Although Lydia had been completely thrown by the discussion of her brother, she couldn't deny that she was curious about the topic and wanted to know what their thoughts were regarding Lord Whitecroft. I am rather fond of Lord Ranton's manners. He is a rather lively fellow, don't you think? Arabella asked. Yes, to be sure. He has an excellent demeanour. Not only that, but he lives so near to us here. If the two of you were to marry, you would be extremely close, and we would not be parted, Lady Canwick noted. I think it should be rather convenient, don't you? she added, prodding her daughter into the thought of their nearness. Yes, I hadn't thought about that. But you are right, mother, Arabella said. Then again, there is the matter of his friend. To be sure, he is quieter and rather less engaging, but I think he might make for an excellent match as well, Lady Canwick thought aloud. Lydia listened intently, wondering about this thought. Would she really have to watch as Arabella matched with Lord Whitecroft? Would she have to sit by and accept her stepsister marrying the man who had continuously been on her mind for days? I suppose. But he has not quite the same spirit as Lord Ranton, Arabella said. No, he does not. But there are other things to consider. Equally important matters, Lady Canwick suggested. Such as? Arabella asked, intrigued and wanting to hear them. Well, Lord Ranton is the son of an earl. That is all fine and well, but as you know, Lord Whitecroft is the son of a duke. If I was able to marry above my own station, surely you ought to be able to marry equally or better to your own, she said. Lydia felt her stomach lurch. Was this what he came down to? Would she not only have to watch this match be made, but watch Lord Whitecroft diminish to nothing but a title? Was he going to be used like that? and there was nothing she could do to change it. Do you remember the estate we toured while we were in London? Lady Canwick asked. Her face took on a rather mischievous expression, as if consorting with a friend for a great plot that was afoot. Which one? Arabella inquired. Lydia had heard her speak of a number of places they had gone in order to indulge in the wealth of society. Why, the very best one, Longmire Hall. Do you remember it? She continued her grin only growing further, taunting her daughter. Arabella's gaze took on a dreamy appearance. Of course I remember Longmire Hall. It was exquisite, she replied. Why do you mention it? I have learned that the owner, the man who shall inherit that very estate, is none other than the Marquess Lord Whitecroft. Can you imagine it, being the mistress of Longmire Hall? Lady Canwick asked. Arabella gasped, and a smile settled on her face at the thought. Lydia imagined it must have been a very impressive home for her stepsister to be so astounded by it that she would set aside all thoughts of one man and replace them with another. A title and a home. That was all he meant to them. It was a dreadful thought. Oh, mother, I am so glad you have told me this. Of course, you're right. He is the better match of the two. I hadn't known this before, Arabella said with confidence. But then, something in her face faltered, and she continued as if trying to convince herself of something every bit as much as she wished to go against her own words. I should like very much to be courted by Lord Whitecroft. How foolish of me not to have seen it earlier, 
Arabella conceded. Despite the fact that her tone had shifted, Lydia seemed to be the only one who noticed that Arabella was not so excited as she pretended to be. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was as though the decision had been made. Lydia thought she had never felt such disappointment in her stepsister. It was clear that the ways of her mother had affected her, and she was growing further and further away from the integrity she might have once had. Lord Whitecroft would never know the difference. He would engage in a courtship with her, believing she loved him and truly wanted to be with him. He would find himself in a dreadful marriage made under the pretense of affection. And all they wanted was his status in society. But Lydia kept her focus on the book in front of her. As she did, pretending not to notice the conversation, another thought crept into her mind, one far more realistic. Lord Whitecroft would not be so easily swayed by Arabella. Although Arabella was beautiful and sometimes charming, she did not seem to be the sort that Lord Whitecroft would show an interest in. And although Lydia knew him very little and didn't want to be petty or jealous, her spirit told her that he simply wasn't the type of man to seek beauty only. Lord Whitecroft had appeared to enjoy conversation, to note the skills and various aspects of who a person was. That was simply not in the nature of Arabella. She was gleeful to be noticed for her looks and to be entertained by others without having to make much effort on her own behalf. Lord Ranton, on the other hand, would be an easy choice. He was evidently smitten with her already and it was clear he would be thrilled by the match. Their personalities were far more suited to one another and they had the same carefree attitude. They had similar tastes in the ways of society and in the expectations that were placed on individuals. Yes, they were clearly the better match. Lydia only hoped Arabella and Lady Canwick would see that before it was too late, and before Lydia lost all hope for Lord Whitecroft to avoid this. But, Mother, Arabella began hesitantly, you did make an excellent point about Lord Ranton living so close, and an earl is still a very noble position, so... I'm not sure we ought to just let go of that option entirely. Lady Canwick pursed her lips and allowed her disappointment to linger on Arabella. Lydia watched the emotions flicker across Arabella's face. In one instant she was going to concede to whatever her mother instructed, but in the next it was evident she wanted to fight for her opportunity to be with Lord Ranton. Lydia wondered why Lady Canwick would not be appeased by Lord Ranton when he was a decent enough man with a high social status and who knew all the people there were to know around them. He ought to have been more than enough to make her happy, and yet she seemingly decided he was not as good as his friend. But you know best, and if you believe Lord Whitecroft is the better option, I suppose I shall listen to your wisdom, she concluded. Lydia could see she was right. Arabella knew she was better suited to Arthur Gibbs, Earl of Ranton, than the Earl of Whitecroft. But she was evidently frightened of disappointing her mother, and that was enough to lead her to give up all hope of the man she wanted to be with. Her mother was powerful enough to make all of her decisions. Lydia, what do you think? Arabella asked, startling Lydia from her attempts to appear dispassionate on the subject. But now all eyes in the room were on her, and she knew it was not a safe question to answer. Lydia's grey eyes darted between mother and daughter, curious if she could possibly make the right decision in this. And if she would be able to keep her own feelings out of it, who would she really choose for Arabella? Was it possible that if she had not found herself thinking about Lord Whitecroft, she might support the notion of him and Arabella courting? Was it possibly her own jealousies that were preventing her from thinking that way? Or was she being realistic, and acknowledging the sad truth that Arabella and Lord Ranton were both cut from the same limp cloth, that she and Lord Whitecroft were made of a stronger material than the others. I believe my opinion is of little consequence, she replied, knowing it was the best she could do. Smart girl, Lady Canwick muttered, appeased and looking away. But who else am I to ask? Lord Whitecroft has been rather attentive to her since the injury. Surely she must have some opinion of his nature. If anyone in this room is to tell me anything, it would have to be her, Arabella whined. 
Lydia was embarrassed that it had been acknowledged aloud. She thought her stepmother would be displeased by the idea of Lord Whitecroft's attention, and this was confirmed when the sour expression normally present grew into a darker appearance. Evidently, Lady Canwick was not happy at all. Lydia knew Arabella appreciated and respected her opinions. She had, when allowed, been like a true older sister to Arabella, and it had given her joy to do so. He is very kind, a perfect gentleman, Lydia said. Arabella nodded, trying to convince herself that he was the better choice. And Lydia wondered what she could do now to one day be happy on her own. To ten. Knowing they were nearly at the estate of the Earl and Countess of Lambton, Henry felt no real anxiety. It was far unlike the way he found himself feeling the vast majority of the time when making his way to the estate of a wealthy family. Outside the window, the autumn breeze caused the trees to dance. Cold wind crept in early here in the north, where the Scottish winds blew down in England. They truly have no daughters at all who are eligible for marriage, Henry asked, his voice light. None at all, Arthur replied with disappointment. A grin crossed Henry's face. There would be no pressure, nothing to make him feel as though this were all a set-up. He could enjoy the company of other nobility and not worry in the slightest that someone was going to hand over their daughter to him. It was a delight. Tell me about them. I know very little about the family. What sort are they? Henry asked. Quite an influential couple. Wealthy, of course but they have not been in London circles so much as most for quite some time. Particularly since their last daughter was married off, Arthur replied. But they invited me in order to get to know their neighbours better, thinking it the polite thing to do, I assume. It is good to know those who live nearby, I suppose, he added. When I told them I had a guest, they said you were welcome. They avoid society? Henry said in a question, thinking most wealthy and influential nobility did just the opposite. Lord and Lady Lambton are older and have already proven themselves. There is no reason that they should have to be seen or heard. Honestly, I envy them a little. I think if we could all be left to our own devices, we might better have time for company with those we truly want to be around, Arthur laughed. But you adore being surrounded by society particularly the women, Henry scoffed. He could not believe he was hearing these things from Arthur, who thrived off of society. Arthur adored being surrounded by the beautiful young women and the people who might be able to bring him further influence. He was not as obsessed as some, but it didn't mean he was content to wait around for others to make a name for themselves while he sat idly by, missing his chance to be noted as a great man. He understood that society required a balance of delicacy and boldness. And if I could choose my own will, I would only be surrounded by the women. If we could avoid the full show, we could choose the final act at any given point. That would be a far luckier opportunity, if you ask me, Arthur specified with a sly grin. You're a lech, Henry laughed. Perhaps, but it appears we are nearly there, so you had best not allow them to hear that. No elderly nobleman or noblewoman wants to be caught with a lech in their home, Arthur teased back. The two men climbed out of the coach once it had stopped, and they were greeted by Lord and Lady Lambton as well as their staff. Henry felt a blush on his cheeks that he was being given a ceremonious welcome by people he had never met before. He hadn't always been shy, but there were still days he was uncomfortable with the show. It is lovely to meet the Marquis of Whitecroft. Our dear Lord Ranton has told us much about you. It would seem you are a rather close friend. A shame that we have not met before now, Lady Lambton greeted. Henry was taken aback by her sweetness. Although she was far younger than his grandmother had been before he lost her, there was something in Lady Lambton's face and voice that brought her to memory. Perhaps it was the gentleness and delicate manner. It is my pleasure to be acquainted with the two of you. Lord Ranton has said much about your esteem in society, and it is my delight to have this opportunity, he replied in kind. Being welcomed into the estate, Henry found himself fawning over the luxuries and beauties of the home, as was expected. 
It was not that the property lacked anything to impress. It was just that he had grown bored of always having to point it out. In every wealthy estate, there was an exquisitely carved chest of drawers from some wood belonging to a far corner of the earth. And yet, in every wealthy estate, he was expected to point it out. Rosewood. From Asia, if you can believe it, Lord Lambton told him, a sparkle of pride in his eye as he shared the source of the piece. My goodness, how magnificent, Henry replied, feigning sincerity. He hoped that once they got the niceties out of the way, they would all be able to simply sit, drink tea and get to know one another. He had always preferred genuine relationships to societal expectations. Unfortunately, he understood that society demanded something very different from him, and his preferences were largely ignored. Shall we enjoy a cup of tea? Lady Lambton asked her guests, leading the men into the parlour. Certainly, thank you, Lady Lambton, Arthur replied. Henry followed, and they walked into the room before being seated, waiting as the housekeeper silently made her way from cup to cup, filling each one and adding sugar as needed. The custom was predictable and comforting. Still, he saw the slight disappointment in Arthur's eyes that it was only tea and not brandy. But this was a tea where they had been welcomed by both Lord and Lady. It was not strictly a time for the men, and therefore nothing so indulgent was to be expected. Have you been enjoying your times in the area? Lord Lambton asked. Certainly. This is quite a lovely region. A magnificent place to take in the air, Arthur professed. Excellent game to be hunted. Oh, are you a hunting man? I should love to know what sort of sport is around, Lord Lambton replied. I am rather fond of the wild turkeys, Arthur answered. The tenderest meat you can imagine. Henry nodded along, only replying as needed until he grew more comfortable speaking his opinions. Indeed, it is always phenomenal to see England for who she is outside of the fog of London. And I hear you have a stunning new home, Lord Ranton, Lady Lambton replied. Not half so stunning as your own, he flattered. And you, Lord Whitecroft, I hear you stand to claim a pride estate of the country, Lord Lambton noted. Henry was caught off guard that they knew this, but he imagined Arthur must have told them about the home. It was rather well known, and he couldn't deny it was a step above others. Nevertheless, Henry frequently found himself embarrassed by the fact that it was so outstanding. Well, I am a fortunate man. My mother and father have done very well, and it humbles me to reap the benefits, he said with grace. Spoken like a true gentleman, Lady Lambton noted, seemingly impressed by him. That's the sort of place that needs a good woman, Lord Lambton added, raising his cup for the housekeeper to refill. Oh, certainly. But surely you must already have your eye on someone, Lady Lambton added. Henry smiled politely and shook his head. I'm afraid I have not yet found the right lady for my household. But I am certain the day shall come eventually, he said. Have you met all of the young women in the area? There are quite a number of eligible debutantes. I feel quite confident we could arrange something if you wish to meet them, Lady Lambton said with a burst of energy, her husband appearing less enthused by the idea. There is nothing to worry about in that regard. I'm doing quite well for now, and I expect the right lady shall come in time, Henry said. I, on the other hand... Arthur laughed, eliciting chuckles from their hosts. Well then, we must ensure that you meet some of the better prospects. Have you met the Hatfields? Lady Lambton asked, her husband growing wearier by the minute. No, I can't say that I have, Arthur answered. They have a lovely daughter. Oh, and Lord and Lady Rothfield. I know their eldest is in society, but I'm not certain of the second daughter. I shall have to find out for you, she continued. Henry observed his friend, who seemed to be enjoying all of these possible young women he might court, wondering if he himself might ever be in a place to seek a match. Henry listened with hesitation. Honestly, however, I must say the young women of Stanley Hall are by far the most suitable, Lady Lambton stated. Young women, we have met only Lady Arabella. 
I was unaware that there was another daughter, Arthur said, intrigued. It was curious that they had not heard this before or met the other daughter. But Henry assumed she must have simply been away. Arthur would learn in time if things went well with his intended. Oh dear, Lady Arabella is rather exquisite and would certainly make a fine match. But the other is lovely as can be, Lord Lambton said, appearing interested in the conversation for the first time. We truly had no idea of another, Arthur said again. How odd, Lady Lambton said, her brows scrunching together in confusion. Henry and Arthur waited, glancing at one another, in anticipation of an explanation. It appeared that Lord and Lady Lambton were equally confused and uncertain as to the reason they had not met another young lady. Lady Lambton took a sip of her tea before setting it down and beginning to explain what she did know. Lord Stanley had a daughter, older than Arabella, but not by much. The Countess of Canwick said she'd gone away to stay with relatives. But now that I think of it, I have not seen her in quite some time, Lady Lambton said. So she is staying with family elsewhere? What a shame that we have not met her, Arthur said. Yes, a shame indeed. But it is still rather odd that she has not returned of late. I should dearly like to see her, Lady Lambton noted with a pressing of her lips. We did meet Lady Canwick's son, however. Lord Whitecroft here quite gallantly rescued the lad's governess. It was all very heroic, Arthur told them, beaming with pride. Henry glanced away shyly, noting the intrigue of their hosts. It was nothing, really, he said. What was her name again? The governess? Arthur asked, mouthing different shapes as if trying to find the one that fit her. Laurie, was it? Lydia, Henry replied with confidence. Suddenly he realised how eagerly he had said it, noting how Lady Lambton's eyebrow raised at the quick reply. Lydia Marsh, I believe. The latter, he added with a bit less certainty. Ah, how odd, Lord Lambton said, looking to his wife. Henry noted the expression between them, one of curiosity and suspicion, as if something was wrong with the idea of this. Is something amiss? Henry asked. Oh no. It is nothing. It is only that Lord Stanley's daughter was also named Lydia, a popular enough name to be sure, Lady Lambton remarked. Or was it Olivia? I think it was Olivia, dear, Lord Lambton chimed in. But I do hope she is well, Lord Stanley's daughter. I suppose it's not strange that she didn't wish to stay in that house, she said. Lord Lambton nodded along with her, and Henry felt himself anticipating all over again wondering why the young woman might have left. No, one cannot blame her at all, Lord Lambton said. Especially after her poor sweet mother died in it, Lady Lambton elaborated, and then her father as well. Henry was stunned by this bit of information. He hadn't known anything of the history of the family or the fact that Arthur had not known anything either. It was clear that Lady Canwick had kept a great deal quiet even from the man she was trying to engage for her daughter. Henry shifted uncomfortably. It was almost as though he had stepped into a mystery he ought not to have been privy to. What was all of this secrecy about? Or was it simply too painful for the Countess to have shared? She was a very sweet girl, Lady Lambton added, very like her parents. Henry felt Arthur's eyes again, and they exchanged another glance, both wondering what they might need to learn from Lady Arabella. Surely she would be more forthcoming than her mother but it was none of their business and was hardly appropriate. That was the difficult fact to accept. Unless Arthur formally began to court Lady Arabella, he was not privileged to any of this information, even if it was rather strange that it had all been kept a secret. Nevertheless, Henry was intrigued. He wanted to know more about this daughter, despite himself. He did always love a good mystery. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Chapter 11 The fresh air is as good as any lesson, Lydia said, eyeing Walter as he dragged his feet. 
Leaves covered the ground around them, stamped into the drying mud. The confines of autumn had kept everyone sad that the warmth was found only indoors. But the colours, out along the path away from the estate, were enough to bring delight to even the staunchest of hermits, and Lydia basked in them. How do the leaves know to change colour? Walter asked. I suppose it is just their way, Lydia answered, pulling her cloak tighter around her shoulders and checking that Walter's was secure. Everything changes when its season comes. I like it best when they change. It is much better like this, he said. As he enjoyed running outdoors, being paced slowly and calmly was not his preference of activity. Nevertheless, Lydia had always told him to remain beside her when they walked together, saying that a gentleman never rushes a lady. A game of chase is every bit as good as fresh air, he replied slyly, a grin shared between the two of them. There shall be plenty of time for a game of chase. For now, as we go, we ought to review some of those things which you have studied, she decided. This was not the time for Walter to be impetuous, although he rarely was so. Lydia had other things on her mind and needed Walter to distract her as only he could. She could not help but think of the Marquis all over again. The sight of his face warmed her heart, and his voice reminded her of a melody. She felt foolish for it, but Lydia could not deny the fact. But I've already shown you that I know plenty. Do you not trust that I continue to study? He asked her with a pleading look. Lydia could not help but smirk. She knew Walter well, knew how even at an early age he was able to charm nearly anyone who spoke with him. It was always difficult to resist his ways. Nevertheless, she eyed him with a warning look that he was not going to get his way this time. Walter's face resigned into willingness, and he sighed, kicking a stone along the path. Now do tell me your multiplication, she instructed enjoying the way it felt when her heels sunk ever so slightly into the moist ground beneath her. May I do tens? he asked. You may do sevens, she replied, not willing to let him off so easily as she was often prone to do. No matter how the situation within the home had changed, Lydia still knew she was Walter's sister first. Her duty as his governess was only a position she had been pushed into without any awareness that it was happening until it was too late. Little by little, her stepmother had tried to strip their kinship, but it had not faded. Rather, the position as his tutor had only given Lydia further opportunities to spend time with him, something for which she was entirely grateful. 49, 7 times 8 is 56, he said, continuing the line of numbers. Lydia realised she had barely been listening to them, but she was well aware that Walter was clever enough to get them right. Walter stooped to grab a stick from the ground and continued forward with it, poking holes in the earth with every step of his left foot. He was an ideal student, even if he was being taught by someone who had never thought to be a governess. Lydia couldn't deny that she enjoyed teaching him. She simply would have preferred if the arrangement were not so formal. Seventy, he finished. Excellent, Lydia replied absent-mindedly remembering when these walks were with her father rather than her brother. Back then, it had been Lydia who would pick up sticks and poke holes in the ground. Her father would scold her when she would pluck a flower, telling her to leave nature in peace. Lydia had never stopped Walter from doing that. It all seemed so inconsequential now without their father to enjoy the grounds of the estate. She glanced over at Walter and noted how he appeared rather sleepy. For all his talk about playing chase, it was evident that he was not up for it. Did you sleep well last evening? she asked. Well enough, he said, not giving much thought to the answer. You appear tired, she replied. Maybe a little. It's probably from all of these boring numbers you are having me recite, he said with another of his smiles. Lydia shook her head in amusement. He would always be her favourite person and best friend. Walter managed to not only remind her of her father, but of an incredible young man in his own right. Walter looked up at her with his eyes drooping and asked, Can we go home now? But you've been doing so well. 
I like it when you go out for walks with me, she replied. So do I, but not right now. I want to go home, he debated. It wasn't like him to be so stubborn when she refused him. Despite not wanting to give in to Walter's need to return home, Lydia was still noticing how tired he was. This was happening more and more often as of late, and it was starting to worry her in earnest. She began to wonder if there was something more than he was telling her. Was something the matter with him? Was he having nightmares, perhaps? Was something keeping him up at night? Opening her mouth to speak, Lydia abruptly closed it again as they stepped forward into a brush of trees. The sound of a rider nearby caused them both to pause. It was only moments before the figure came into view. The Marquis of Whitecroft was a marvellous silhouette before them. The sun reflected against the darkness of his hair and created an almost mirror shine. The sharp edge of his jaw held Lydia's gaze for only a second before the blush worked its way to her cheeks. Blinking away from him, Lydia looked down at Walter, wondering if she should take him back to the estate after all. Through her desire to remain and speak with the Marquis, the thought of the consequence pushed through. If she should find herself with him again as before, her stepmother may disapprove. And her own intrigue regarding the Marquis might betray her. Wow, that horse is magnificent, Walter said in awe, bringing a grin to the lips of the Marquess. It was far from the proper ceremonious greeting that ought to be given between two noblemen. Lydia hoped the Marquis would not think less of them for Walter's manners, and although she did not know the man well, Lydia felt confident that he was kind and not the sort who disapproves of a child's nature. Why, thank you. I'm glad you like him. And it is very good to see the two of you again, my lord and Miss Marsh, he said. And you, my lord, Lydia replied quickly, ignoring the confused look she sensed coming at her from Walter. Why? He began to ask a question Lydia did not want asked. Lovely weather, is it not? After so many days of rain, it is nice to see the sun, she interrupted. Lydia did not want to give him a moment to expose her lie, but rather needed to keep it going without suspicion. Might I join the two of you for your walk? he asked, dismounting before they answered. His legs were strong as they hit the ground, holding him up well enough and setting a strong figure beside the steed he rode. Lydia looked at him, wide-eyed. Swallowing her anxiety, she nodded stiffly. That would be lovely. Thank you. Although Lydia was overcome by the pounding of her own heart, her brother was altogether otherwise distracted. I see you are intrigued, the Marquis of Whitecroft said to Walter. Lydia admired the kind look on his face, the way he seemed to want to entertain her brother and give him the attention he clearly wanted. I love to ride, so much. I have a brand new pony, and he is my favourite thing in the whole world. Have you ever ridden a pony? Roderick is not so grand as your horse, but he is a good pony, Walter told him, his eyes brightening a fair bit as he did so. You know, when I was your age, I had a pony as well. And he was a great pony too. I'm glad you like your Roderick, and I can imagine that one day you will have a grand steed like Giles here, the Marquis declared. Walter's eyes lit up, and Lydia could not help but watch the entire interaction. She had not seen Walter so happy in making a new friend in all his life. Perhaps it was because he had this new opportunity to interact with someone outside of the estate, or maybe it was the fact of having someone to admire. Whatever it was, she was glad to see Walter so delighted. You can lead him if you'd like, the Marquis said, offering Walter the reins. His mouth hung open and his eyes widened, eagerly taking hold and setting forward, leaving the two adults behind. Lydia watched him go, with her heart melting joyfully. Don't wander too far ahead and be careful of the mud, she called after him. Walter bounded off and looked back only to acknowledge that he heard her words. Quite a precocious child, isn't he? The Marquess noted. Lydia looked at him, surprised to hear his voice for a moment, as she was still gazing ahead at her brother and noticing how his energy had suddenly returned in a burst. Oh yes, certainly, although he is a bit sleepy today. Typically he has a bit more energy, 
a great deal like his father, she said wistfully, remembering times past. Did you know him well? The late Lord Stanley? the Marquis asked. Lydia looked ahead at her brother, embarrassed that she had commented on her father when she knew to be more careful. Nevertheless, she knew an answer was required of her. I knew him, as well as anyone might know a great man, she replied. Lydia considered the falsehood of that. She knew well that she and her father had been close, closer than most people had realised. Yes, the lie felt like sacrilege, as if she had insulted his memory altogether. Until her stepmother had entered their lives, she and her father had spent all of their time together. They had become closer in their shared grief and found support and strength in each other. And then, all of this changed. Yet telling the Earl all of this would be foolish. The lie was her only choice. This lie she had chosen would be the one she would have to follow through with. The Earl might never understand her reasons if she were to tell him the truth now. Her stepmother, of course, would never forgive her for engaging his attention and telling him the truth about her identity. It was enough for her to exist. The reality of her station had been deemed something to be forgotten. Lydia looked up ahead and saw Walter still enjoying Giles, the steed. His excitement was evident, and she tried to remain distracted and joyful, despite her disappointment in telling the lie. But she felt eyes upon her and glanced at the Earl who was walking beside her. At her returned gaze, he looked away with a hint of a smile on his face. Lydia felt as though she were failing at her duty. She was failing to pretend she was someone she was not. And no matter how much she wondered what the future could be if the truth were known, she knew such a thing was impossible. But for now, Lydia would forget the days of walking and riding with her father. She would forget the times they shared reading together and playing games and how he entertained her. The Lord of Stanley Hall was a great man, and she was a mere governess to his son. Lydia caught herself just in time to sidestep a thick mud. Daintily, she skipped around it, lifting her skirt just enough to keep it clean without revealing anything improper. She took note that there were a few more muddy puddles ahead that she would have to avoid. It appears that the boy has a bright future, the Marquess said, and if his father was as good a man as I hear, then I should think it is very bright. As the Lord of Stanley Hall, he is already doing quite well, Lydia agreed. Who is handling his affairs? Who is ensuring he is properly readied for the station that lies ahead of him? he asked. His mother is, Lydia replied blankly, not wishing to dwell on that fact any further. It didn't matter how she felt about Lady Canwick's interventions in her brother's life. It only mattered that she answer the question and remain genial. I suppose that is as good as anyone. She must certainly know what is best for her son. What sort of plans do you think she has for him? I understand that as his governess you must have some interest, he said, blinking against the sun that was reflecting brightly through a wisp of cloud. Indeed I do, and he shall be headed off to a prestigious school soon. Just as all young men of his station are, I suspect, she replied. Oh? he asked, looking at her once more. Lydia felt as though his gaze was too interested in how she felt about it, like he was searching for her emotions in the answer. Yes, I have prepared him as best as I can. But obviously I am no schoolmaster. I can tutor him well enough, but he needs to be under the care of learned men, she said, swallowing against the thought. It was a thought she hated, one that embittered her greatly. It was not right that she should have to lose her little brother like this, that she should have to be parted from him. It had been enough to be demoted to his tutor, but now she was not even going to have that. Just the next in a line of punishments from Lady Canwick. I greatly enjoyed school as a boy, the Marquis stated. Really? she asked, wanting to hear more about it. What did you love about it? Was it the friends you made, the things you learned? What made it so good? All of it, he said, although something in his eyes told Lydia that there was another reason behind it all. She could not quite place the emotion she saw there. Well, that is good to hear, she replied quietly, rounding another bit of mud and hoping the Marquess did not see her paranoia that she might become dirty. 
Do you fear for him? Having him leave? He asked as if understanding her tone. Lydia sighed. I cannot deny that I do. I have taught him as well as I can, and I know he shall be fine. But it is not easy to let go of one's prodigy. And I have ensured that he understands the most important thing in life, she said. And what is the most important thing in life? The Marquis asked, intrigued. How he treats others. He must always be good and kind to them. He must always show gratitude and loyalty. He must always be generous, Lydia began. There are a great number of things that I have taught him in our time together, but I believe this to be the most important. And although he needs the teachings of great men, perhaps the simple character lessons from a woman shall be enough to prepare him for what lies ahead, she concluded. I think that is a very wise thing to say, and a very important thing for a young man to learn, the Marquis said. Then perhaps I am doing something right after all, she smiled lightly, trying to return to a calmer air. Lydia's mood had darkened somewhat, but she did not wish for the Marquess to see that. She wanted him to perceive her better than that, cheerier. And although she would never be so light as Arabella, perhaps she could pretend to be lighter than she was, happier than she was. And if she could be so fortunate as to succeed, maybe she could even convince herself that life was good. That it was not so grim as she had begun to make it out to be, certainly not when she felt the comforting presence of the Marquess at her side. Chapter 12 He found himself eyeing her again. Just as he had been choosing his own words carefully, Henry sensed that Miss Marsh had been doing the same. He thought about his answer regarding school. Yes, he had enjoyed it. But more than anything, he had enjoyed that it got him out of his home away from the unhappiness there. He enjoyed that it left him with room to breathe away from his mother and father. But it was hardly appropriate to mention all of that. Instead, he tried to remain jovial and figure out Miss Marsh. He watched her swell with pride as she looked over her pupil. He saw the kindly affection she held for him, as a mother in some ways. It would be difficult for her to let him go off to school. More than likely, it would mean she would have to find a position elsewhere. Out of a job, she could even have to leave the area for other places throughout England. It would not be an easy life. I have heard there is rather a lovely meadow just up ahead, Henry noted, remembering what Arthur had said about the terrain. He hadn't been up in these parts yet, but he was enjoying himself now that he was exploring. Perhaps it was not even so much the land that he was enjoying, but the company... Despite himself, Henry realised that the company of this young woman was better than the vast majority of interactions he had in society at any given time. Indeed, the meadow is beautiful. It is the very reason that Walter, I mean Lord Stanley, and I often take this route. It converges upon a few properties, and we are glad to be able to indulge in it, Miss Marsh replied. Her voice was soft and delicate, the very essence of a lady. He couldn't help but wonder where she had come from. She told him she was from the area and had been in the house for quite a long time, but there was not much more he knew about her. Miss Marsh paused in her tracks, and he looked in the same direction that her eyes gazed. Henry watched as the young eel looked back from the crest of the hill, his eyes wide and his smile wider. He paused and Giles did the same. Henry was glad the horse was well trained otherwise the boy would struggle to keep him restrained. What is it? Miss Marsh called to her charge. You have to see it, he replied, urging them to quicken their pace and follow as instructed. Miss Marsh went faster than he expected, faster than a lady might normally be seen. Cresting the hill, Henry could not have imagined it. Before they knew what had happened, they were surrounded by butterflies, drifting up from the wildflowers. Their colours were as vibrant as any that Henry had ever seen and ranged over the entire spectrum of light to dark, blue to pink, small and delicate to large and strong. Some shimmered and others appeared velvet. Some were veined and others looked to be covered in eyes. But he had never seen anything like it. Miss Marsh's face was one of awe and disbelief. Her hands lifted, unbidden, and allowed the wings to soar around her. It was clear she had barely any awareness of her sweet actions. 
I'm going to catch all of them, the Earl exclaimed, running off and leaving Giles to stamp a hoof, which only sent more butterflies into the air. I have never seen so many before, certainly never in October, Miss Marsh said, enthralled as her gaze drifted around them. She appeared to have forgotten his presence entirely, and it only made her more lovely. Henry could say nothing. All he was able to do was watch her, standing as she was in such a beautiful silhouette against the manifold insects. It was the most beautiful picture he had ever seen. It was an astonishing sight that he could not take his eyes from. And at that moment, he noted how his breath staggered and caught in his chest from the vision. Miss Marsh turned her face to him for the first time since entering the meadow, with a smile that rivalled all of the radiance of butterflies and their intrigue. He could be nothing but smitten by that smile. No matter what others might think of him for it, he was astonished at the beauty of the governess. Unbidden thoughts came into Henry's mind about his duty. He had to marry a woman of noble birth. He had to find a wife that society would appreciate and value and respect. No matter what his thoughts of marriage had always been, there were expectations upon him to marry someone like Lady Arabella or her ilk. A mischievous desire within Henry wanted to do away with all of that. The man who had no desire to ever marry was realising he had no desire to marry the sort of woman who might not stop in the midst of a field of butterflies and allow herself to be transported by the magic of it all. But all of that was to be set aside to think about another time. For the moment, he was still enjoying this walk, enjoying this company. I suppose we ought to continue, Miss Marsh said with a sudden air of defeat after a few moments. The brightness of her face faded into a resigned expression of expectation and awareness of the world once more. Of course, she would have to get the Earl back home. There was no time to indulge in this. She had a duty, and Henry would have to respect that and not get in the way by demanding all of her time and attention. Henry allowed himself another brief glance at Miss Marsh, but realised that she was looking around with her brows drawn together. Where has that boy gone off to? She mumbled to herself. Henry turned his head to look for the Earl, but it took only a moment for everything to change. A scream rang out to the east, and Henry jerked his head in the direction of the sound. Miss Marsh was already on foot towards the stream that had clearly risen above normal levels due to the rain. Walter! came the panicked, strangled cry from her elegant throat as her dress seemed to float around her. Henry rushed after her, recognising she would never be able to swim with all of that fabric. By the time he was closing in on Miss Marsh and the young Earl, he could see the boy's arms flailing, his head dipping under the water. The boy tried to yell for help, but took in a gulp of the stream, and Henry forced his legs to speed further. The child evidently could not swim. From an instant of flight, Miss Marsh landed in the stream, splashing in fury to reach her charge. Henry's legs landed only moments later, his body turning horizontal and pushing with great strokes to reach the Earl of Canwick. Walter! Miss Marsh screamed again, the weight of her clothing pinning her back, unable to move with speed. She reached towards them, but took in her own spluttering mouthful of the dirty water. Henry reached the boy and pulled him higher, so his head was safely above the water. Those grey eyes of his lolled to the back of his head, and his lids closed over them. Henry dragged him up the bank, and the Earl heaved out gushes of water. Turning back towards the overflowing stream, Henry was able to reach in and help Miss Marsh back up to the wet grass and out of the shallower edge of water she had been trapped in. My, my heel was stuck, the mud and my dress, Walter. Thank you, you saved Walter she said in a rush of apology and gratitude, dragging herself over to the boy. It's all right, you're safe, you're both safe, Henry reassured her. But Miss Marsh was not listening. She was lying beside the Earl's small frame and brushing back his hair with her hand, whimpering his name over and over. I'm sorry, he said in a small voice, trying to lift his body up. Oh, Walter, you did nothing wrong. I'm so sorry I let you go too far she cried. I just wanted to see the water. But I felt faint. I got dizzy and I fell in, he explained to her. Henry watched the look exchanged between the two of them. Fear, panic, 
relief that they were now safe. It was a series of emotions he could hardly bear to imagine. Miss Marsh was acting in such a motherly manner that he couldn't shake the feeling that there surely must be something connecting them, something deeper than the bond between a governess and her pupil. Feeling like an intruder, Henry wanted to give them a moment of privacy, but despite the evident need, he knew they would be ice cold if he did not get them home urgently. Forgive me, Miss Marsh, my lord, but we must get the two of you back to the estate before you catch a cold. Please, allow me to assist you home quickly, he said. Thank you, thank you, Miss Marsh repeated over and over, nodding and trying to scoop the Earl in her arms. Henry considered putting the boy on Giles, but worried about the fact that he had been dizzy and deemed it unwise to put him up so high. The Earl of Canwick assured him he could walk, but Henry stayed very close by in case there was any help needed. The moment they arrived back at the estate and the Earl was inside, his mother was called for. Walter, Walter, oh my boy, whatever might have happened to you, she heaved with great dramatic flair. Her eyes remained dry, but her voice was that of a terrified crone. Something about her reaction left Henry wondering whether or not she was genuine. It was a terrible thought, a terrible thing to suspect of a woman. But he simply could not shake the feeling that she was acting over dramatically due to the presence of an audience. And then there was the glare he saw in her eyes when she looked at the governess. An angry, resentful look. Henry worried that Miss Marsh would be punished for this. After all, it was her duty to look after him. If something happened, what would the Countess do about it? Was Miss Marsh going to be all right? Chapter 13 Lady Canwick calls for you, Tabitha said after knocking on the door to Lydia's room and entering. Lydia's face fell. Of course, the Countess of Canwick would demand an audience with her after the events of the afternoon. Of course, she would be curious. And of course, Lydia would have to answer for her decision to walk with the Marquis of Whitecroft rather than vanish into the day. It was only to be expected after she had the audacity to walk with a man who would never be a part of her world no matter how she might desire it. Her footsteps were slow as she drew closer to the rooms of Lady Canwick, each one dragging despite herself. She simply could not bring her legs into motion. After a brief halt before the Countess's door, Lydia put her fist gently to the wood and heard the call to enter from the other side. Ah, Lydia, I have been waiting for an eternity. You ought to come more quickly the next time I call, the Countess criticised. Forgive me, I did not mean to delay you. Lydia replied, holding her head high and straightening her spine, but keeping her eyes down as needed. She had learned the sort of behaviour that was expected of her by her stepmother. Well, perhaps if you were not so worn out from your earlier walk, you might have been here faster. Remember that in the future, Lady Canwick warned with a tone to underly what she truly meant. Certainly, Countess, Lydia said. She understood the message. She understood she was going to be in a great deal of trouble for having gone around with the Marquis, even in the appropriate manner as she had. Now, on the topic of your walk, there is much I should like to ask you regarding it, she began. Lydia remained like a stone, prepared for whatever questions were soon to be thrown her way. She was certain they would not be the sort she would like to answer, but there was nothing to be done about it. How exactly did it come about that once again... You found yourself walking with a nobleman in a most improper fashion, she asked. I assure you that there was no impropriety. Walter can attest to that. We simply ran into the Marquis, having no knowledge of his plans to ride at the same time in which we departed, Lydia promised. And what led to him walking with the two of you? How did you encourage his interests in joining you, she asked next, with her lips pursed in anticipation of Lydia's reply. He simply insisted that he escort us back to the estate. He spoke with Walter at great length about Roderick and his own horse before allowing Walter to take the reins and lead the way, she answered honestly. And Walter walked beside the two of you, she asked next. In front, Lydia replied, damning herself at that moment. Leaving you and the Marquis of Whitecroft to walk alone behind. Immediately behind, Lady Canwick. Walter remained within hearing she said, not knowing if that was true for the entire walk. In fact, 
she thought with certainty that he had ignored them completely and had heard nothing. What did you speak of? The Countess continued, the coldness in her voice creeping through Lydia's spine. There was only one acceptable answer she could give. Only one thing that would calm the Countess. Nothing out of the ordinary for acquaintances. Primarily Walter himself and the fact that he should be making his way to school soon, Lydia said. Do you know who he is, Lydia? The Countess asked, her tone sharp and challenging. It appeared as though she was not so calm as Lydia might have hoped. This was a far more serious issue than even she had realised. Things were not going very well at all and it brought her gut to churning. I know his name and his title, but very little else, she answered. The Marquess of Whitecroft is a gentleman. A gentleman with ten thousand a year. He is a far bigger catch than his friend, that Lord Ranton fool, Lady Canwick said with a nonchalant wave of her hand. I see, Lydia said, trying to remain unimpressed and emotionless. I mean to have Arabella marry him. That is the goal in this situation, and you had best heed it. You are to support this family and our intentions, do you understand? Otherwise you will be put out. You will find yourself penniless, and there shall be nothing to incur my forgiveness once that happens, she warned further. I understand, Lady Canwick. I support the family and the intentions you have for it, Lydia assured her, no matter how it broke her heart to do so. Very well, then. That is what I expect from you today and always. Should you ever find yourself thinking anything different, you shall have no more union with the Canwick title or estate. Remember your place in the world now. You are to be a support, the Countess reiterated. Lydia counted and steadied her breathing knowing she could hardly bear to hold back the wrath that was pulsing beneath her veins. She had never unleashed her true feelings in the midst of these instances. She never would. But that did not mean she felt nothing. Certainly, Countess, she agreed with as much dignity as she could muster. As for the matter of Walter's accident, your carelessness is not easily forgotten. There shall be further discussion on that matter, the Countess threatened. Lydia nodded, keeping her eyes low and humbled. You are dismissed, the Countess declared, with the same wave of her hand she always used when something meant very little to her. Lydia curtsied and departed the room, leaving the Countess to her lavish lifestyle in the home of her father. He would never have stood for any of this. But he was gone, and he would never return. This was the life Lydia was left with. She made her way through the halls and back towards her own room before deciding she could not go there just then. With a turn of her heel, Lydia descended and made her way to the kitchen, where she knew Tabitha would be baking a special cake that they ate every Friday evening. The door to the kitchen creaked slightly, and Tabitha whipped around, a bit of cake batter flinging from the spoon she had been using to mix it. Good heavens, you gave me a fright, she exclaimed, bringing a chuckle to Lydia's throat. It helped. She needed something simple to make her laugh. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I just knew you would be in here and I need to speak with you, she said. Oh, what do you need from me? Don't tell me it was something that old, the Countess said. Tabitha asked, changing her words at the last second. Lydia sucked her lips together to hide her smile, although she knew Tabitha would see it. It was very risky for them to speak of the Countess at all and they had to be on guard against anyone overhearing them. No matter how the rest of the staff felt, although they shared the same disapproval, it was not safe to be vocal on the subject. Indeed it was, Lydia replied. Tell me, Tabitha urged. Sitting on a stool near Tabitha and heaving a sigh, Lydia proceeded to tell her about the entire conversation and how difficult it had been. She could not share the fact that she had so enjoyed the walk with the Marquess, or how much it had meant to her. She left out all the details about the butterflies and how the man had looked at her, but she knew in her heart what those moments held for her. We simply spoke about his schooling and how Walter would be leaving not long from now, she added, defending herself as best she could. And the Countess simply couldn't handle that. She had to be on the attack as usual. Tabitha dared to ask. Certainly. 
and she shared with me how his wealth meant that she intends for him and Arabella to be wed. That is all he is to her. That is all any man is to her. Someone to be paired off with her daughter, Lydia pouted. You ought not to become bitter. It is their own foolishness that will get them into trouble, and if that Marquis falls for it, all the worse for him, Tabitha added. Lydia nodded, still trying to hide her own emotions. And it's not as though Arabella is entirely to blame. She only does what her mother tells her she must. But it is terrible to see how she blindly follows. It breaks my own heart to see her falling into such character in order to appease the Countess, Lydia said. Once more, I shall say it, all the worse for her. Lady Arabella has a head on her shoulders. How she chooses to use it isn't up to sensible people like you and me. If she wants to throw everything away, so be it, Tabitha concluded with anger in her voice. She said I'd be out on the street, Tabitha, that if I don't support this family and the intentions she has, I'll be penniless. I shall have nothing if I do not bow to her bidding in every way, Lydia shared forlornly. Tabitha's face grew red with rage as Lydia's words came. She's your stepmother. She's no right to treat you this way. This is your home, that of your father, she steamed. I know, Lydia said, barely audible. This is no way for anyone to live, Lydia. At least I get paid a living wage. You haven't even got that. You are a slave for her, something she forced you into the moment your father passed away. I can hardly believe she managed to manipulate you into this. Tabitha continued. Lydia began to wonder if the housekeeper would stop. She was saying everything Lydia had wanted to scream for such a very long time. But hearing it from another's mouth gave her the slightest ease of agony, and she was willing to take as much as she could possibly get. It is true. But you know as well as I do that there is nothing for me to do about it yet. I have nothing until I am twenty-one. And it's not only about that... Lydia trailed off again. Tabitha's eyes lost their hatred and found compassion. Walter, Tabitha nodded in sympathy. Yes, Walter, I'm terribly concerned about him. If I do anything against Lady Canwick's wishes, you know as well as I do that she will try to keep him from me as punishment. She knows how close I am to him. I cannot allow him to become a bargaining piece for her, Lydia said. Tabitha handed her a strawberry and Lydia put it in her mouth, enjoying the taste for only a moment before everything became ash all over again. I love Walter. The idea that I might not be allowed to see him is devastating. I cannot imagine it, and nothing could prepare me for that. I have lost my parents. My mother and father are both gone, and I cannot lose my brother as well, Tabitha, she said. You shouldn't have to. I'm certain we can figure something out. Tabitha told her softly. But Lydia wasn't so sure. She wondered if there would ever be anything she could do to prevent her stepmother's vicious choices when it came to manipulation and getting her way. She heaved another sigh, wishing she could feel more positive about everything. The door creaked open again, and both ladies turned in a quick fashion, hoping that nothing they had said was overheard. Walter, Lydia said surprised that he had entered and seemed so lax in his stride. She hadn't anticipated his company and wondered how he knew she was in there. Not only that, but how had he been allowed to leave his room? What are you doing out of your bed? Lydia asked. I wanted to find you, he said. You don't look well. You are clearly ill. Oh dear, you have caught something, Walter. You must get back to bed she insisted. My stomach hurts, he winced. Lydia rushed to his side and saw the paleness of his face. He didn't look well at all. Brushing her fingers against his forehead, she felt the warmth and sweat of his brow, and immediately her heart began to race with all the worries she had already been feeling. You've got a fever. Did you catch a chill from the water? Did you swallow any? Lydia asked. Walter simply shrugged. Tabitha, call for the doctor. Tell him it is urgent, she instructed, scooping her brother into her arms. It's all right, Walter. You're going to be fine, she whispered as his eyes drooped with exhaustion. 
He was light for his age, but Lydia wished she was stronger. Carrying a child was not easy, and she had steps to climb. But Walter needed to get to his bed. She would have someone call for the Countess later. For now, she just had to get him comfortable. Almost there, she strained, heaving her breath on the final few stairs. Lydia pushed into the door with her shoulder and got Walter to his bed, where she covered him generously in blankets under which he shivered. You're going to be all right, she repeated, again and again, more to herself than to Walter. More than ever, Lydia knew she could never be separated from her brother. More than ever, she knew he was a part of her that she could never lose. Chapter 14 Arthur's estate was filled to the brim with friends who had come from the city to enjoy the evening. Men sat and drank brandy, young women flirted, batting their eyelashes and flattering the men. Henry could not have cared one bit less even if he tried. He had been a fool to allow for such an accident to take place. A young earl, a kind governess, and he very nearly allowed them both to freeze to death. If he had not joined them, the two would have been together and the Earl of Canwick would not have run off. He would have been close to Miss Marsh. Henry felt the weight of that knowledge, the awareness that he had provided a false sense of security. Now that he found himself caring for Miss Marsh, thinking about her more and more frequently, he worried. He could not leave her to take responsibility for what happened to the Earl. It had not been her fault, but as an employee of the estate, she would surely end up taking the blame. He had to do something about it. Draw, Arthur said, flipping a card on the table. Henry snapped back to himself, noticing the game at hand nearby. There were four tables set up with groups of men and women enjoying the games. Meanwhile, other young women took turns playing the pianoforte or singing as another played, trying to show off their skills. Two sisters were in an evident bid for the same man's affection and tried to get their turns at the piano as often as possible. One had a considerably better singing voice than the other, but she was the lesser beauty of the two. Henry remained alone on the couch, simply observing all of this, allowing his thoughts to continue wandering and planning for his confession to the Countess. He was unable to block out the conversation of a potential couple standing nearby, the man having had already drunk enough to be speaking at rather a loud volume. But I should think that billiards would be more impressive to a young woman, he noted. Billiards? How would that make any difference? She asked, appearing offended. He hadn't heard the earlier part of the conversation, but it appeared that billiards were somehow a matter of conflict between the two. Judging by the man's countenance, Henry wondered if perhaps this was a matter of his work ethic versus his love of entertainment. No. These shallow individuals were not the sort Henry wanted to spend his time with. Seated on the couch with so much going on around him, the only thought in his mind was Miss Lydia Marsh and how he could make things right for her. When had he become so sentimental? What was it about her that left him brooding and desperate to know more? Certainly she was beautiful. She was kind, she was genteel. But she was a great deal more than the simple things all young women tried to show. Miss Marsh was also warm and intelligent. In fact, she was quite bright, and it was clear she had experienced a fine enough education. Based on her interactions and mannerisms, he felt certain she had been raised significantly stronger than the vast majority of governesses. In fact, suspicion clouded his mind. She was refined enough that she behaved more like a lady and less like a girl from the country. If she had been raised in a noble home, it might have made a bit more sense. But there were a few things that appeared to add up differently than the explanations he had so far received. Lady Lambton had mentioned Lord Stanley having had a daughter. Her name was possibly Olivia, but it might have been Lydia. And he recalled that this was Miss Marsh's first name. Not that it was an unusual name, but it was quite a coincidence that the daughter who seemed to have disappeared had the same name as a governess who looked very much like her charge. And yet, how could she have ended up as a governess? No matter how the Lady Canwick behaved with her clear intentions to marry her daughter off, she could not be so bad as this. 
She could not be the sort of woman who would demote her stepdaughter to the role of a common servant. It would not even be possible. Lord Stanley's daughter would have a claim to her position in the home and therefore would not have to worry about things like this. The Countess would be unable to get away with it. Such a thing would be something out of fiction. Not at all possible in true society. No one would stand for that, and people would easily learn the truth through the chain of gossip that London was so well known for. You're being a bore, Arthur noted, in a low, sing-song voice from behind Henry. He jerked his head back, caught off guard by his friend's sudden appearance. Oh, sorry. My thoughts were elsewhere, Henry said. Evidently, Arthur replied, flicking the Queen of Hearts between his fingers. Ah, you know this is not the sort of thing I generally spend my time doing, he said. That matters not. I'm having a party, and you are one of the most eligible gentlemen here. If you think you cannot find a wife for yourself amongst these beauties, then I should think you expect to live the rest of your life alone, Arthur told him. And what makes you think I mind that option? Henry asked, even as his own thoughts on the matter had begun to change. Because no matter how stubborn you are on the issue, eventually every man decides that he cannot live without the love of a beautiful woman. It's our nature, Arthur shrugged. Need she only be beautiful, Henry challenged. Have we not had this conversation? Beauty says a lot more than you seem to think it does. It is a fairly accurate predictor of the sort of future you might have together, Arthur said. Henry scoffed and shook his head. Then it appears that you and I have very different ideas of the future. Arthur collapsed lazily onto the couch beside Henry and let his head loll backward. Think about it. We are noblemen. Our reputation in society is determined by what is seen. If we have an exquisite woman, if we have someone who reaps the notice of other men, they shall envy us and think more highly of us. They shall think there is something exceptional about us that brings us the ability to find a wife like the sort we desire, he reasoned. The thought wounded Henry's heart. The very fact that people could make their determinations of the value of another based solely on the appearance of a man's wife. It was cruel. I shouldn't like to judge a man based on nothing but his wife's beauty. There is a great deal more that he ought to be known for, his character, his kindness, the work that he does. Do you not think these to be equally important? Henry asked. They are, but they are not what society judges by. I am not saying it is right. I am telling you that this is how it is, Arthur stated. Henry wondered how he would be viewed if he were to fall in love with a governess. That would do far more harm than good to his reputation. And yet he didn't care nearly as much as he ought to. Anyway, all of that aside, it is expected of you, and there is little you can do to get out of that, Arthur told him. True, Henry sighed. He would have to marry eventually, no matter his feelings. He would have no choice in the matter, and more than likely, if he did not choose a wife, one would be chosen for him. My Lord Ranton, said the butler, who came over quietly. Feldham, he replied. I have a card for you on behalf of Lord Lambton, Feldham said. Certainly, he said, taking the card from the little silver platter. Henry observed his friend's face brighten and his posture straighten into a needle. Whatever was on the card, Henry noticed how Arthur deemed it to be of utmost importance and apparently of great esteem. Everyone, Arthur called, rising to his feet and commanding the attention of all his guests. Heads turned and the notes of the piano paused. The whole group of them were at Arthur's attention, ready for whatever he had to say. From the puffed out chest of his friend, Henry could see how Arthur relished this. Lord Ranton was always happy to be at the centre of a room. I have a card from Lord Lambton, who has heard that you are all in attendance in the area. He says that as you have come out from London, he should like to invite you all to the masquerade that he and his wife shall be hosting three evenings henceforth for Halloween, Arthur announced. Excited gasps sounded around the room. The young women whispered to one another immediately, and it was evident that they were thrilled by the opportunity to dress up once more and garner attention. 
For those who lived in London, this celebration near the Scottish border, celebrating a tradition uncommon to them, was a delight. It appears we all must find our costumes, he added. Arthur sat back down and gave a whip of his hand for everyone to resume their activities. The women were all speaking excitedly to one another about the opportunity they now had to enjoy the masquerade. The mystery of such an affair was always thrilling for them, and Henry knew there were probably not as many masquerades as people would have liked, but the air of excitement in the room was more than even he would have expected. A masquerade? How thrilling, Arthur said, waggling his eyebrows. Thrilling, yes. The young ladies certainly appear enthralled. Henry noted. And why shouldn't they be? It's not just a normal ball. A masquerade is wholly different. It's a chance to show a whole different side to oneself. You ought to appreciate that with all of your ranting against beauty, Arthur laughed. Henry gave him a light glare. You know that's not what I meant, he said. Regardless, you speak of these things, and I think you ought to appreciate a masquerade, a chance to meet others without seeing their appearance. I think I shall be a lion, Arthur said with a thrill at his decision. A lion, Henry laughed. Show society that I may not be the King of England, but I can be the King of this jungle. What do you think? he asked. That you are entirely ridiculous, Henry said, bemused. He wished he could talk some sense into his friend, but that seemed unlikely at this juncture. Still, Henry was determined that the time would come in which he would be able to help Arthur understand. It might not be at that moment, but there would be a chance. He had to believe Arthur would learn to see the good of a life that was more than the shallowness society had to offer. He had to believe Arthur could have more. The evening continued with chatter about what everyone would dress as. Some of the young women were deciding on whether they would be angels or simply wear gilded masks, a full costume or a new gown, I... Henry shook his head and wished they would go back to singing and playing the piano. Anything to save him from the droll of their fanciful thoughts. No, these ladies were nothing like Miss Marsh. He still hadn't figured her out, but more than ever he wished to. He wished he knew what sort of events she might like to attend. He wished he could understand her daily life and whether or not she was the young woman Lord and Lady Lambton had spoken of. Whatever has you brooding now? Arthur asked, irritation peppering his voice. I think I shall go and speak with the Countess about the Earl and the fact that it was really all my fault, he replied, more to himself than to Arthur. It was not your fault. She's his governess. Isn't it her responsibility to ensure nothing happens to him? Arthur asked. But I was in the way. She also has to be kind to nobility and if I had not caused her to be distracted, if she hadn't been forced to converse with me, she would have remained with the Earl, Henry said. Don't go. It is foolish. And the Countess may think less of you if you do, Arthur reasoned. Then she shall think less of me, Henry said in a nonchalant manner. After all, he did not think so highly of the Countess either. You are being reckless, Arthur said, says the lion. Lions are wise. I'm sure of it. Now, if you are insistent upon this visit, you must take me along. After all, I'm charming, and Lady Arabella may have need for a conversation. Arthur grinned mischievously. Oh dear, whatever you wish, Henry said with a wave of his hand. He felt certain that this would go awry, but he knew he had to try. Miss Marsh had to be cleared of all blame in this matter, and if Arthur wanted to charm Lady Arabella at the same time, all the better. Chapter 15 The Countess leaned back in her chair, pondering what to do about her inconveniences. Lydia was in the way. She had been from the first day she met the late Earl's daughter, a child to inherit what she wanted for her own. And if it had not been for Walter, a fortuitous birth, she might have even less claim to the estate. But Lydia was the real problem. She had been irresponsible, a terrible risk to Walter's health. No wonder he needed a doctor after she was so distracted by the Marquis that she allowed Walter to fall into a frightfully rushing river, or overflowing stream, as the case may be. And every time Lydia interacted with the Marquis, she was getting in the way of Arabella's future. 
What would happen if the nobleman learned of Lydia's station? Had she told him already? Was Lydia trying to vie for his affections? There really was only one solution. Lydia would have to remain in the home. She would have to be confined. Part of it was prevention. By being at the estate, it was certain she would not meet with the Marquis again. But there was also the sweet sense of revenge, knowing it would destroy the young woman's future once and for all. Stuck at home, with no one at all. Walter gone away to school. Maybe even sending away that dreadful housekeeper who was so taken by the late Earl's daughter. Yes, there were ways to punish her. Worthwhile ways. She need only be clever in how she went about them. The Countess grinned to herself. She would make it work out for herself and Arabella. And Walter, as needed. But for now, the Countess had to put those thoughts aside. The doctor would arrive at any moment, and once he did, the grieving mother would have to put her plans into action. Lydia tried to steady her breathing, taking it in great waves and releasing the tension from her neck. It had been over an hour. Arabella paced back and forth along the left-hand side of the bed, but remained as quiet as Lydia. The two of them had nothing to say and were simply trying to comfort themselves in the only ways they could think of. The Countess busied herself with a series of questions aimed at the doctor and evidently slowing his ability to do his job. You are checking it again. Did you do it incorrectly the first time? she demanded. Forgive me, Countess, but I cannot hear the child's lungs if I am answering your questions. Dr. Wick said, his frustrations finally beginning to crack after an hour of interrogations. Lady Canwick's mouth dropped open wide, unable to believe he had spoken to her in such a frank manner. She was unaccustomed to anyone being willing to speak to her honestly and without pause. The boy? That is not just some boy, Dr. Wick. That is the Earl of Canwick. And you shall speak about him thusly, she said with a snap. Forgive me, Dr. Wick sighed, trying to appease her. I did not mean any offence. I am simply trying to do my job. The Countess made a clicking sound with her tongue as if she was still unhappy with the treatment she had received from him. Lydia had seen this side of her many times, but she had never seen Walter ill, at least not like this. He had never spent a few days feeling tired or with a stomach ache, and the fever he had now was something she had never experienced with him. And it was all her fault. If he hadn't fallen into the water, he would not have gotten cold. He would not have swallowed the rushing, muddy water. She had every reason to be blamed. Walter's room felt stuffy from all of the people and the fact that the shades were drawn, blankets piled high, and his own temperature rising. It was suffocating. Lydia wanted out of there. But she would never leave him. She would never be willing to exit the room for even one whiff of fresh air to breathe. All right, Dr. Wick sighed again, removing the stethoscope from his ears. I think all is well. You think? the Countess asked in her demanding way. Forgive me once more, Lady Canwick. What I meant to say is that all is well. The boy merely has a cold. It is nothing to worry about, he said. Just a cold? the Countess repeated in question. Indeed, a mere cold. All is well and there is no need to worry, he said again. Oh, thank heavens, she exclaimed, falling all over the doctor with tears in her eyes. A dramatic display it was, but Lydia could hardly blame her. Looking to her stepsister, Lydia and Arabella shared a smile of relief. She could hardly believe it was something so simple and all was going to be just fine. Walter was going to be fine. That was all that mattered. Thank you, Dr. Wick, Lydia said in a soft voice, echoed by Arabella. The Countess continued to thank him profusely, all whilst overindulging in the attention she was receiving as a terrified mother. Lydia wondered for a moment if the emotions were genuine. Surely they were. They had to be. Lady Margaret Stanley could not be so cold as to perceive her own son as a mere pawn. In the midst of his sudden illness, she was clearly as heartbroken and terrified as her daughter and Lydia. Are you all right, Walter? the doctor asked. I feel all right, I suppose, 
Walter answered, squirming a little in discomfort under the many layers of blankets. Lydia wondered if it was going to help at all being piled under so much weight. Her stepmother had called for nearly all of the blankets in the entire estate to be brought to Walter's bedroom. I'm glad to hear it, Dr Wick replied to Walter. Can I go out and see Roderick now? He's probably very worried about me and I want him to see that I'm all right. We missed our ride today. He might think that I've died, Walter reasoned, his eyes barely remaining open even as he spoke. Dr Wick smirked on the right side of his mouth and shook his head slowly. I am afraid not today, my lord. Roderick knows you love him dearly, and he shall wait until the time comes that you may ride again. But until then, you need to rest up. You must regather your strength before you ride him again. Am I correct, Lady Canwick? he asked, needing her to confirm her understanding of these orders. Certainly, Roderick shall just have to wait, or the groom can explain it to him for all I care. Those boys in the stable just sit around talking to horses all day anyway, she said with judgment. They are ever so lucky, Walter added dreamily. Lady Canwick scoffed, and Lydia saw she was back to herself. She would be just fine now that her son was showing himself to be on the mend. In a day or so, you may be able to go and be with your pony. But for now, you must take it easy. If you do not, there is a risk of this illness coming back, my lord. Or possibly growing even worse. You cannot allow that to happen, or Roderick shall be a very lonely pony indeed. I do not think any of us want that for him or for you, Dr Wick said. Lydia hated to think about the meaning behind those words. Roderick being lonely would only happen if Walter passed away. It was unbearable to imagine, and she wished the doctor had not said it. Her stepmother seemed entirely appeased, and that brought a bit of peace into the room at least. It made for a moment of calm without her hysterics. Do not worry, Walter. I shall give you a great number of treats while you remain here in bed, and as you recover, Lady Canwick promised him. Lydia was glad for these words, glad to know her stepmother was thinking about Walter and how to keep him in bed. He needed incentives. He was not the sort of boy who could happily enjoy a lazy day. Active and always on the move, Walter preferred nearly anything over the idea of being stuck inside. But if his mother would give him good reasons to remain indoors, perhaps he would settle enough to recover well and get back to his old self. What sort of things will you allow me to do? he asked. Well, Lady Canwick began in a genuinely caring voice. I shall have Tabitha bake you an extra treat for each of your meals, and your meals shall be quite special, all of your favourites. Lydia felt herself soften. Her stepmother may have been terribly cruel at times, but at this moment she realised that all of the emotions were genuine. Everything the Countess was expressing, no matter how rudely, was a true concern for her son. Tenderly, in a manner Lydia had never seen before, the Countess stroked Walter's hair. Not only that, but I shall insist that you are read to. Grand adventures. Even a book your father once told me he had enjoyed as a boy. And once you are strong enough to sit up, there shall be card games, she continued to promise. Walter smiled, relieved he would have something enjoyable to do. It gave Lydia a small peace as well, knowing he would not be overly bored and that there would be reason enough for him to enjoy his time. But more than anything... She was simply relieved that Walter was all right. Nothing mattered so much to her as her little brother, and to lose him would leave her devastated. He was her only living family member. The knowledge of her orphanhood often wounded Lydia, but she had always held on to the fact that she was not entirely alone. She had her brother, and she could always hold on to that. But if she were to lose him, everything would change. Not only would the grief consume her, but her pain would be compounded by the loneliness of having no family and being a mere servant in the home that had once belonged to her. Truly, then, she would have to rely on the Countess, not only for survival but for a semblance of a familial tie. That was something she had no desire for. It would be agony to consider the Countess as her family. Arabella would be fine enough, but it was only a matter of time before she was married and moved away. Not only that... 
but she was growing more and more like her mother each day. It was not too late for her by any means, but she would have to make a decision about the sort of woman she wanted to be. Lydia waited in the room for a time, hoping the Countess might give her a chance to be alone with her little brother. But alas, she did not depart and gave a dismissive look to all the others who remained, Lydia included. It wounded her soul to have to leave the room. She looked back at Walter, and he made eye contact with her for a moment. Lydia nodded to him and gave him a smile that he would be all right, and he nodded right back. With that, she departed and made her way back to the kitchen to find Tabitha. He's going to be all right, Lydia reported. Oh, that's the best of news. I've been beside myself this whole time with worry. Did the doctor say what the problem was? She asked. Just a cold due to his fall in the stream. It must be a terrible one because I've never seen Walter like this. But honestly, the knowledge that it is no more than a mere cold is all I need in order to be at peace, Lydia said. I imagine so. You deserve a bit of peace in this house, Tabitha said. Lydia glanced away into the floor. She didn't think she would ever have a great deal of peace so long as she was living there. But until she became of age, there was no other choice. Would you like to help me with the cake? Tabitha asked. Lydia smiled at her and agreed, appreciating the distraction. Tabitha knew her well. There were still maids in the home who would never dare to ask Lydia to help with anything. They respected that she was the daughter of the late Earl and that no matter what demotion she faced, she was not a servant like them. But Lydia appreciated an opportunity to help. She felt that it gave her a sense of meaning and something to do when Walter was otherwise occupied. And if she was not going to live the life of an heiress, this was as good as anything. I can make anything he wants, Tabitha noted in reply to Lydia's informing her that the Countess had promised all of Walter's favourite foods. That's good because I imagine you shall be making a lot of sweets in the next few days, Lydia laughed. I am just glad to know that he is well. You have lost enough in your life. Walter brings you so much happiness. I should hate to see you lose him as well, Tabitha remarked. I honestly don't believe I could handle the loss of him. It would be a burden too great to bear. And if I should ever have to face life without Walter, I think it might be the end of me, Lydia confessed. Don't go saying that. You are strong, and you would make it through. But as it is, the whole topic is far too macabre to even discuss. Your little brother is fine, and that is what matters. He shall be just fine. The two of you will remain close always. She cannot take that from you any more than a cold can, Tabitha reassured. I suppose you are right. It is only because I cannot imagine my life without him that I even dare to mention it. For those hours we waited before the doctor saw him. I wondered how my heart might be able to take any more loss. Oh, Tabitha, I cannot handle it. I cannot handle losing anything else, she said. The solution to that is quite simple, Tabitha said. Lydia scoffed. Hardly. If it were simple, then no one would ever face a loss. If it were simple, then we would not even need to have this conversation because I would simply not lose anything, she said. It's like that. And that is close to what I am going to tell you, Lydia. If you cannot lose anything more, don't lose it. Or if you do, take it back. Take it all back. Your home, your title and your little brother. They were all yours once, anyway, she said, bustling about the kitchen and sounding as though it were all so simple. Lydia stared at her for a moment, considering it. Take it all back. Such a thing would never be easy. But would it be possible? The next morning, those words continued to ring in Lydia's mind. As she went to Walter's room to check on him, one of the younger, newer maids stood from a chair outside and stared at her with wide eyes. Miss Newport, Lydia asked, curious at the girl's reaction. Forgive me, Miss Lydia, but the Countess, she has told me not to allow you in to see the Earl, Miss Newport said anxiously, barely able to look Lydia in the eye. Lydia felt her heart drop and a thick, curling sickness roiled in her gut. She was not allowed to see Walter. Of course. That was just the sort of punishment the Countess would love to give. What are you doing here? came a demand from behind her. 
Lydia whirled around and saw her stepmother in the hallway, tall and imposing. I am not allowed to see Walter? she asked. Ha! Huh. See him? You're the reason he is ill in the first place. No, Lydia, you may not see him. You have proven you are not to be trusted with him, and I told you that your punishment would be discussed. I have settled on what it is, the Countess declared, making Lydia feel even worse. And what is my fate? she asked. So you shall be confined to your room for the time being. Perhaps if I'm feeling in good graces, I shall allow you around certain parts of the house. But for now, you are to remain in your room only, she said. Lydia's jaw dropped despite herself. She could not imagine the cruelty that was being shown to her. That she should not even be allowed to see Walter was a harsher punishment than she had ever dreamt of. But the Countess turned away before a word more could be shared, and Lydia slowly dragged her legs back to her room with a numbness around her heart that she had never before felt. Later that evening, Tabitha appeared at her door with food. I cannot eat, Lydia replied, her arms wrapped around her legs as she leaned against the wall beside her bed. Her grey eyes focused out the window, unable to feel much of anything at all. I know she has been cruel to you. I know there is nothing that can bring about the kind of obedience she expects of you. And you know you have my full support in ignoring her wishes, Tabitha said. Ignoring her wishes? How could I even begin to do that? It's hopeless, Lydia said in resignation. Not with my help, Tabitha insisted. I won't allow her to keep you from your brother, Lydia. Now eat your dinner and we will make a plan. Chapter 16 Arthur was a bundle of nerves that wouldn't settle, but Henry's anxieties were far more internal. He was glad to be doing this, glad he could check in on Miss Marsh and ensure she was not having to face any consequences from what had happened at the stream. Just calm down, Henry teased his friend as they ascended the steps to the front door of the estate. A shiver ran down his spine from the chilly air and he burrowed further into his coat. Arthur glared at him but gave a firm knock on the door, which opened in seconds, as if the maid had nothing to do all day but await the possibility of guests. After a brief greeting, the maid scampered off to retrieve the Countess. Oh dear me, what a lovely surprise, she boasted, coming down the hall towards them. Countess, it is our pleasure to come and see you. Forgive us any intrusion, Arthur said in a charming way. Henry noted how the Countess pursed her lips ever so slightly at his friend. Her eyes lit up, however, in turning to him. My lord, how fares Whitecroft? she asked. Henry was taken aback that she would so brazenly ask about his family's title and estate, and yet somehow it did not surprise him. The Countess had shown herself to be greatly concerned with these things. Like an innocent child, Lady Arabella bounced down the hall behind her mother. Excitement was evident on her face, and Henry saw the way she gazed at Arthur with great indulgence. In return, his friend's gaze was on her face. Whitecroft is well, but rather, we came to ask after the Earl and his governess. How are they? I have been terribly concerned since that day, and the fact that I consider myself responsible for what passed, Henry said, getting out much of what he had wished to say. My lord, you cannot possibly take responsibility for what occurred. It was not your fault in the slightest. I fear it was carelessness in another regard, she replied vaguely. Oh, there was no carelessness, I assure you. It was only an accident, he insisted. Yes, well, I am glad to know that, the Countess said, as if trying to appease him without believing his words. Now we ought not to stand here like this. Please join us in the parlour. Henry and Arthur followed the two ladies, and the looks continued to pass between his friend and Lady Arabella. Henry felt certain they were going to get themselves into trouble if they remained so obvious about their affections. So how is the Earl? Henry asked again once they were seated with tea before them. The Countess looked at him intently over her cup as she took a sip. I fear he has grown ill from the fall, caught a cold. But he is on the men now, she answered. I am terribly sorry to hear it. Is he all right? Is there anything I might help with? Henry asked. No, no, he is doing better. I have the doctor on hand as needed. A very good one. 
He has been a friend of my family for quite some time, and I trust him implicitly, she said. Well, that is a relief to hear, Henry remarked. As he opened his mouth to ask about Miss Marsh, a gentleman came into the room, and Henry recognised him immediately as the doctor. With his little leather bag, likely filled with all manner of vials and syringes, there was no mistaking him. The greetings took place as necessary, and when the doctor looked Henry over, there was another sense that he was missing something. Ah, yes, Whitecroft, I have heard of your family, the doctor said, eyeing him up and down. Is that so? Henry asked, uncertain. Well, you know how it goes in England, came the vague reply. I suppose I do. And how is Walter? the Countess asked with that same blush of rehearsed concern. He is doing very well, the doctor said. It seemed to be the only reply anyone would give when showing concern for the Earl. And his governess? Henry dared to interject. In a quick jerk of two heads, the doctor and the Countess both looked at him, wide-eyed. His governess? the Countess asked with a hint of panic. Resting, the doctor said all too quickly, lying back at ease in the chair he had occupied. Yes, she is ill as well, the Countess said. Oh dear, I was not aware, Henry said, feeling his heart beat a little faster with concern for Miss Marsh. How awful that she and the Earl had both become ill from their fall into the stream. And although he did not wish to think it for even a moment, Henry found himself again wondering about the Countess. True, the doctor confirmed it, but they held a similar tone of a lie that was being told. That they were eager to bring about a belief. The doctor had spoken too fast and the Countess had spoken too slow. The doctor held an apparent comfort and, air of authority, in the estate, as if he expected to somehow share in the spoils. Perhaps that was what left such a bad taste in his mouth. Well, she must remain in bed for now, the Countess added after the moment of awkward quiet. Please pass along my regards to both, Henry said, the words coming slowly and deliberately. Yes, yes, I certainly shall, the Countess promised hollowly. Another round of tea was served, and Arthur made himself known in the wider conversation, engaging Lady Arabella as well as he could. Henry kept quiet, except when necessary, but by the time they were ready to depart, he felt entirely relieved. On the way back to Arthur's estate, the two men chatted about their plans for the Halloween masquerade, as if there was nothing more on either of their minds. Henry remained quiet about his suspicions and he was relieved to not have to listen to Arthur go on about the beautiful young daughter of the Countess. Right then, tomorrow we shall go into town, Arthur said once they arrived back at his home. As you wish, Henry agreed, before making his way up the stairs and to his room, where he found himself further in thought about Miss Marsh and the possibility of her position. Arriving in London, Arthur instructed the coachman to take them to a small shop nearby that specialised in unique crafts and costumes, just the place for a man getting ready for a masquerade. What sort of a place is this? Henry laughed. The very place for men like us, preparing for a costume party? Arthur replied. Looking at some of the queer objects in the shop, Henry was taken aback by the sight of a fake skull. This is rather dark now, isn't it? he asked. Dark indeed. But I am going as a lion, not a crypt keeper. What are you going to dress as? he asked again. Henry sighed and hung his head. He had answered this question a number of times. As I told you, I shall go as myself, with a mask, that is all. You needn't go so far and be so bold as to dress as a lion, Henry said, also repeating himself. Arthur was fitted for his costume the mane looking shabby around his face and the entire ensemble being utterly ridiculous. Henry worried that his friend was going to be the laughing stock of London in that outfit. If he were not careful, he might spend the rest of his days as a joke. Oh, Arthur, have I not told you what a bad idea this is? You ought not to wear that. Please tell me you won't, Henry urged. Nonsense. It looks rather clever, I think, and you are cruel to try and warn me against it, Arthur declared. Cruel? Henry asked. You know what I mean. 
If I believe this to be the best thing for me to wear, which I do, you ought to support me. Not many men shall be bold enough to go as a lion. But I am not like those men. I take what I please, Arthur said with a self-satisfied smile. I do hope you mean catnip, Henry mocked, eliciting a glare from his friend. Do you not think I make a very fine lion? Arthur asked, striking a pose with his hands like claws. I think you make for a tame feline. Now please do yourself a favour and remove that costume at once, Henry said, unable to contain his laughter any longer. All right, but only because I wish to save it for the evening of the masquerade. No point in letting the whole world see me in it now when it is meant for another time, Arthur declared. Yes, certainly, Henry said, dismissing the remark. Arthur changed back into his clothing and spoke with the store owner, striking bargains and trying to get the best deal on the costume. Henry wandered the shop and looked at other trinkets until he came upon the masks and made a quick choice for the one he would wear. A simple black and silver mask that covered only the area surrounding his eyes. It was enough to feel as though he were making an effort without making himself a fool. An ideal mask for the evening at hand. My lord, came a voice from behind. Henry turned and was surprised to see Lady Arabella and her mother in the shop. The two wore charming smiles and they curtsied upon seeing him. Henry bowed in reply. How wonderful to see you both, he said. And you, my lord, what brings you to town? Lady Arabella asked. Lord Ranton and I have come to prepare for the masquerade, he said. Oh, how marvellous. We are in town for the very same purpose, she replied. Indeed, my daughter is going to be the most exquisite young woman at the ball, I've no doubt, the Countess declared with pride. I am sure of it, Henry said with a polite smile. Are you looking forward to the masquerade? the Countess asked, as if trying to keep the conversation going. Of course, he lied. As are we. It shall be quite grand, I expect. There shall be so many important people in attendance, so many members of nobility and society. I think we shall find that some of the most prominent names will be in attendance, and yet we shall not see them. How thrilling, the Countess said. Indeed, for all we know, the King himself may be present, Lady Arabella added. Henry very much doubted that, but it was a fun thought nevertheless. Oh, hello, Arthur said, coming around a display in the shop and seeing Henry with the young lady. Lord Ranton, Lady Arabella and her mother greeted, curtsying for him. What a pleasure it is to see you both, Arthur said. And you, my lord, Lady Arabella replied, a glint in her eye. Henry saw that Arthur and Lady Arabella looked at one another with a knowing eye, an eye of mutual affection. As Arthur looked upon her with the gaze of love, Lady Arabella seemed to warm to it, growing towards it. His attention was obvious and she preened under it. Her mother, on the other hand, had a sour look upon her face. Henry wondered once more if the Countess had some sort of objection to his friend. How is the Earl of Canwick? Henry asked, careful not to mention anything regarding Miss Marsh, although he was still concerned for the Earl's health. He is on the mend now, the Countess said, a wave of emotion passing over her face before she settled back into her typical appearance of strength. I am glad to hear he is doing better. I hope he is very well soon. I should like to see him again and spend a bit of time with him. He did enjoy my horse a great deal and told me all about his Roderick, Henry said. Oh, so you spoke at length about his pony? The Countess asked as if trying to glean some sort of information. Indeed, a great deal. He is clearly quite proud of the pony, Henry replied. Did you... Speak of anything else? she asked. Henry understood her questions to be searching for something else, and he wondered once more about Miss Marsh and the mystery he suspected there. No, not really. A little bit about school, but that is all, he said, leaving the rest vague. The Countess appeared to be relieved, and Henry felt his suspicions growing ever more. But Lady Arabella sighed lightly with apparent boredom, and he caught another glance between her and Arthur. I do look forward to seeing you at the ball, 
or... I suppose not seeing you, Arthur laughed, directing his remark at Lady Arabella. She giggled in reply. Oh, certainly. I hope I shall be able to find you, she said. You shall mark him quite easily, Henry said in a low, teasing voice aimed at his friend. Arthur looked at him and tried to get around the curious glances of the two ladies. Let us just say that I do enjoy a masquerade and shall be dressing appropriately for a man who likes to be seen, Arthur remarked. Henry tried to contain himself. His friend had no idea how ridiculous he would appear, but as it was, Arthur was quite proud. Well then, until the masquerade, we hope that you are quite well. We shall see you very soon, Henry stated, preparing to depart from the two women. Both Lady Arabella and the Countess appeared disappointed, but as the younger gazed at Arthur, the elder looked hungrily to Henry. He could not quite place her intentions, but he felt a sense of discomfort. Leaving the shop, Henry wished they had never run into the Countess and Lady Arabella. Arthur, on the other hand, appeared dazed with a sense of delight. He had the dreaminess of a lover upon his face. I am entirely relieved to hear about the Earl of Canwick, Henry said. Hmm? Arthur replied, not listening. The Earl? He is doing better, Henry stated, wondering if Arthur had heard any of the conversation. Oh, right, I heard that. Yes, indeed, it is very good. He's a child. I'm certain he shall be fine. Children are rather resilient, you know, Arthur said. How would you know? Have you any experience at all with children? Henry asked, knowing the answer. Certainly not, but I do expect that Lady Arabella shall make beautiful ones when the time comes, Arthur grinned. Good heavens, are you already planning for your family with her? Henry asked. Do you not think it about time that I share my intentions with her and her mother? He asked. As you know, I believe you ought to give it more time. I believe you ought to get to know her better. But if this is what you wish, if you think the time has come to declare your interest, I shall support you, Henry replied. Why? You tell me you disagree, so why would you support it? Arthur asked. Because you know better for your life than I do, and if it would make you happy to be with her, I should like to see you happy, he answered. You are a good friend, Arthur noted. Well, someone has to be, he laughed but I must say I simply cannot understand what you dislike about poor Lady Arabella, Arthur continued. Henry looked at him curiously. Had he ever said he disliked her? He had no problem at all with the young woman. Surely he did not care for her mother, but that did not reflect on the young woman. She was sweet and charming enough. He only hoped she would not follow in the manipulative ways of the Countess. I never said that I dislike her, Henry laughed. Do you not? I thought for certain you didn't care for her, Arthur said. I don't take any issue with her. She's a fine young lady. I have nothing at all against her, he replied. Arthur's brow scrunched ever so slightly, and a gentle worry passed over his face. Henry didn't know what to make of it, but decided to say nothing unless Arthur chose to speak about his thoughts. For the time being, it appeared that everyone was caught up in their thoughts and emotions regarding matches. Henry found himself always observing the expressions and interactions of others, aiming to decipher what exactly each one meant. But the game was far too complicated for him. If only people would simply say what they meant, say what they wished for, then the world would be a far easier place for him to live. It would make a great deal more sense, and he would be able to understand what it was that led to love. As it was, Arthur was being a fool, Lady Arabella was trying to flirt into his attentions, and the Countess appeared to be ranking the men at every turn. Henry wished everything would just be simple. And that was what he had felt when he had been around Miss Marsh. She spoke simply. Guarded, yes. There were few answers, and still he had to try and discern her meaning at times. But she was not the sort to try and manipulate anything. So, you still intend to wear nothing but your coattails and a boring old mask? Arthur asked, as if eager to change the subject. And you still intend to prance about like a kitty cat? Henry taunted. 
We are rather different men, are we not? Arthur laughed. Indeed we are. But I think there is nothing wrong with that. Life would be rather boring with a friend who existed in the same manner as oneself, Henry noted. Arthur nodded in agreement. They truly were different, and their taste in women reflected that. It was a good thing, Henry thought. It was good that the two of them should never desire the same wife because they had so little in common in that regard. Once more, Henry was surprised at himself. He was thinking about a wife. He was dreaming about a future with a woman. Indeed, that was a very strange thing for him, and only made him wonder if perhaps Arthur was rubbing off on him after all. Was it possible he was learning to be a little bit like his friend? Would he find himself at a future masquerade dressed as a wolf? The image was enough to cause him to chuckle. What are you laughing about? Arthur asked. Henry turned and shook his head before answering. Masks, my friend, I am laughing about who we pretend to be. Chapter 17 The parlour was stifling, but Lady Arabella instructed Tabitha to open the windows and let in a bit of fresh air. Lydia was entirely relieved, having wanted the air for the past hour of having sat in the room. But it is going to be so grand, Lydia. You must see my gown. You are going to love it. I certainly hope it is as beautiful as I believe it to be. Mother, do you think it is? Arabella asked, not stopping for breath as she went on and on about the gown and the masquerade ball that was coming so soon. In the brief pause she had finally delivered, her mother replied, You shall be the most stunning young woman in the room, you know that. Our primary goal is that very thing, and I believe we shall succeed. The gown is ideal for your figure, and all eyes shall be on you just as your own face shall be hidden, the Countess said. Arabella's face twitched with disappointment. If no one can see me, then how shall I maintain their attentions after the ball? she asked. Oh, my dear, that is rather simple. First, you astonish everyone with your beauty behind the mask. It shall not be until the end of the night that you remove the mask and reveal your identity in the most subtle of ways, she schemed. Lydia sat in her place in the corner, just listening. She was used to these types of conversations, but it still angered her the way the Countess was always trying to make plans. And what sort of subtle way are we to do this? Arabella asked. It is simple, my dear. You shall fuss with your hair ever so delicately, and as if by accident, tug on the silk thread that holds your mask on. It shall slip off, and everyone is to see it was you all along that had charmed them with your grace and beauty and poise, she explained. Lydia tried not to chuckle at the ridiculous plan. Was it truly worth going to such lengths to make this happen? Was it in any way productive to go about it like this? She wondered if Arabella would ever wizen up to her mother's plans. Would she always go along with them? Or would she come to understand the immaturity and foolishness of it all? And then I shall have my pick of men, Arabella noted with pride. Her mother's face became pinched. Your pick of men has already been chosen. Do not forget that. This masquerade shall be the perfect time to get Lord Whitecroft's attention. Our goal is to get his focus on you, Arabella. He is the only man that is going to matter at the ball. And you had best not forget that, she warned. Arabella nodded, biting her lip against her feelings otherwise. Lydia had heard enough. She could not bear to listen to all of this and wished she hadn't heard even this amount. Faking a cough, Lydia stood and made her way towards the door. Forgive me, she coughed again. I need some water. Lydia breathed a sigh the moment she was out of the room and her eyes closed in relief. When she opened them again, she was startled to see that Tabitha was standing directly before her on the other side of the door. Lydia bit her tongue, trying not to make a sound at her surprise. Tabitha tried not to giggle, and they silently walked off towards the library so they could have a brief moment to speak with one another without being caught. Were you listening through the door? Lydia asked in a whisper of amusement. Indeed. This whole thing about a grand masquerade is all about town. 
I have heard talk from servants in a great many houses. Everyone seems so excited by it, Tabitha said. Yes, well, all anyone truly wants is a chance to dress up and get the attention of all of the best nobility in town, she reckoned. And you know who is amongst the best nobility in town? Tabitha asked. Henry's face appeared in Lydia's mind. Not that she could tell Tabitha that, but still, he was there, unbidden. Who? she asked. You, of course, Tabitha exclaimed, her voice still a whisper. Ha! Lydia scoffed, not believing Tabitha would make such a foolish joke. Why are you laughing? You ought to go, Tabitha reiterated. Lydia suddenly realised that her friend was being serious. Tabitha really thought she should go to the masquerade. You're joking, she said in a matter-of-fact tone. I mean it, Lydia. You should go, Tabitha insisted. Lydia began to walk, pacing away from Tabitha and ready to leave the library just for a break from the whole idea. But Tabitha was following behind her, and there was no escaping the thought now that it had been raised. What would I wear? she asked. Lydia looked down at the simple grey dress she wore rather often. It was by far the nicest dress she had. It was no gown. It was not anything that could ever be worn to a ball. Unless she dressed as a pauper for the masquerade, she had no other choices. I may have something of your mother's, Tabitha admitted with a look of pride on her face. Lydia turned to her, letting the words register. She had never even thought about anything her mother had owned. She knew they had all been done away with by now, but hearing this from Tabitha made her wonder what had become of all of them. You sly thing. Where have you squirrelled that away? Lydia asked, her voice rising barely above the whisper they had tried to maintain for their own sakes. If Tabitha has really kept some of her mother's belongings, they must have been hidden well. And although she was glad for it at that moment, Lydia was a little bit hurt that Tabitha had not told her this before, but rather had kept them from her. Come with me. Come and see where it's hidden. I hid it right before that beast married your father. I couldn't have your mother's nice things poured over by that hussy, Tabitha said, not caring much at all any more for propriety. Lydia knew that when Tabitha was truly angry, she was willing to say just about anything. And what did you keep? Lydia asked, following behind. Tabitha didn't answer, but she drew a finger to her lips to show Lydia she needed to keep quiet. They made their way to the staircase that was used in the servants' quarters, where things were quiet and they did not risk being seen. With each step upward, Lydia grew more and more delightfully suspicious by this secret. It seemed as though something of her mother was still there, not simply in the clothing, but in the mischievous spirit Lydia had been told her mother sometimes had. It appeared Tabitha had held on to that as well. When they reached the final staircase, Lydia recognised that they were in the attic. It was dark and cold, but there was a treasure trove of objects that had been left behind by her father. Most of it was mere trinkets. The Countess had ensured that anything of value was on display or had been sold in order to purchase a wealth of new gowns or jewels for her and her daughter. But behind all of these things, Tabitha pulled a loose panel from the wall with ease. It would have gone completely unnoticed by anyone who had not been aware it was there. But for the woman who had insured it and used it before, it was no secret, and it was the perfect hiding place. Once the panel was free, Lydia watched as Tabitha slid a gilded chest into the open. Lydia's lips parted in awe of the heirloom. It was beautiful enough from the outside, and yet she did not know what existed within. Tabitha grinned up at her but opened the chest, so the lid blocked Lydia's view. She waited until her friend revealed the item she was so evidently excited to show. Slowly and with a great deal of fanfare, Tabitha pulled out a gown that rivalled anything Lydia had ever seen before. With a silver gauze that seemed to sparkle in the light, the gown reflected its surroundings in the most beautiful manner. I shall have to fix a few things, Tabitha lamented. I'll bring it up to fashion, of course, and I shall have to find you a mask, 
or perhaps even make one with the remnants of any fabric I remove. Lydia's fingers found a life of their own, brushing along the fabric of the gown. A flash of memory traced its way through her thoughts, and she recalled seeing her mother in this gown for the briefest of instances. The memory was enough to leave her gasping for air, desperate to reach back and find it again. I remember this dress, she whispered through her tight voice, the tears pressing against her lashes and bringing her to the point of grief. She wore it only twice, but she looked magnificent in it, Tabitha remarked. Lydia nodded, thinking about that memory and trying to hold on to it. You deserve an evening out, Lydia. For all these years you have been a servant in your own home, with nothing at all to show for who you truly are. Go be a fancy lady. It's only one night, Tabitha urged. The conversation with the Countess was the next memory to arise. Only this one left a bitter tang in Lydia's mouth. Being threatened with separation from her brother. Being threatened with ending up on the streets. Those were not the words of a mother. Those were words that would have grieved her father had he still been alive to hear them. They would have shocked her mother that a woman with her own child could be so cruel to another's. Lady Margaret Stanley was a terrible woman, and there was no doubt in that regard. But Lydia could escape all of that for just one night. Her own mother would have loved to see her in this dress. She would have loved to pass down the beauty of the gown to another generation and share in the joy of it rather than hoarding it all for herself and her own offspring. Her mother would have been generous with anyone. You know, Tabitha began, it does not have to be only for one night. What do you mean? Lydia asked, her brows drawn together. I mean, the Countess has kept you hidden better than I have hidden this gown. But society knows your father had another daughter. They simply do not know what has become of you. So why should you not show up at the ball? Why should you not make your debut? She asked. Lydia looked at her with a blend of fear and determination. To present herself at the ball would be a shock to her stepmother and a choice she could never come back from. Would she be strong enough to do it? Or would she allow the Countess to decide her fate? She'd never been so brave, but it was no longer just about her. Lydia wanted to take care of Walter. She also wanted to show him how to be brave. And then there was the Marquis of Whitecroft. Would she stand by as he was used? Certainly he may never care for her, but that was no reason to allow her stepmother to take advantage of him and manipulate him into a marriage with her daughter. Yes, this was about more than just Lydia. This was about standing up to a woman who loved to take control. Very well, I shall do it, she decided, excitement roiling beneath her skin. A grin spread over Tabitha's face, and immediately she set to work. Lydia was still and straight as Tabitha took measurements, pinching the fabric of the dress here and there, deciding which cuts to make. She rapidly fired a series of questions at Lydia to determine certain aspects of the style and how it would best suit her to wear the gown. Very quickly they had settled on a whole host of aspects of the gown and the mask that would accompany it. Lydia felt entirely certain that the night was going to be fantastic. She could hardly imagine that she was doing this, truly going out and enjoying an evening at a grand ball. She had never been to a masquerade, and the balls she had attended had come just as everything began to change in the home, and she was suddenly no longer being invited along with the Countess and Arabella. Yet, here she was, being given this spectacular opportunity all because of Tabitha. You are going to dance with so many fancy gentlemen, Tabitha giggled. Oh, I doubt that. I shall simply blend in. No one is going to notice me all that well, Lydia reasoned. If that is the case, then I am not doing my job very well. I intend for you to be married off that very night, free of this house and its occupants. You deserve for everyone to remember you and your father, Tabitha schemed. As grand as that would be, I can hardly fathom it. Lydia reminded her. Lydia, this shall change everything, Tabitha said. Lydia nodded. Take it all back. 
Perhaps this was her chance to do just that. Perhaps this would be the night that would change everything. Chapter 18 The time had gone by so quickly in the coach, as Henry urged Arthur one last time not to attend the ball dressed as an animal. But once more, it was to no avail. Will you stop it already? Arthur begged, tired of being the victim of Henry's sensibilities. A low and frustrated growl escaped his lips. But Henry said no more, realising that the stubbornness of his friend was at its utmost. Arthur truly thought he was making the right decision by attending the ball dressed this way, and there was nothing to be done to convince him otherwise. The bickering had reached its penultimate point, when Henry decided he might as well give up. There was no talking reason into Arthur. There was nothing to convince him of the illogic of his costume. Thank you, Arthur said, recognising that Henry had accepted his defeat on the issue. Henry recognised that his friend was excited about the costume and knew he perhaps ought to have simply let the matter fall away early on. But the thought of how ridiculous Arthur looked left him feeling anxious for his friend's sake. So many people were going to attend this ball and there would be one animal amongst them. Of all of the things he could have chosen, this was simply not the appropriate one to have opted for. Henry snapped his own mask on, having waited until they arrived before doing so. He hadn't wanted to appear too eager for the dance before this, and now that they were there, he found himself wishing he had gotten a mask that was at least a hint flashier. Perhaps something with a silly feather or that covered the whole of his face rather than just around his eyes. Can you believe it? Arthur asked as a light shot up into the air and exploded in a loud cascade of colour. Fireworks. Henry said in a voice that betrayed his awe. This really is going to be the grandest party in all of England, Arthur said, eyes wandering around the night sky. Henry nodded as he and Arthur made their way up the stairs, seeing the dozens of other guests who were arriving at the same time stand around and wait for more lights and explosions. It must have cost Lord and Lady Lambton a fortune to have hosted the fireworks, but Henry realised that was the sort of thing wealthy people were able to do. He considered whether or not he would ever use his own money for such a thing, and had to concede that he was not nearly exciting enough to do something like that. But it was good that people might get to experience it that evening and enjoy the show and all of the festivities that were on offer. Entering the mansion, Henry grinned at the mood of lanterns flickering by their wicks and the way everything was dim at the entrance, as if trying to add to the air of mystery. Add to the fact that no one could see another's face. It was quite a clever idea. For a moment, Henry found himself rather excited about the night. But as they moved in further, they were able to see the lights glinting off of grand decorations of silver and gold and shiny paint. Henry marvelled at it, wondering how much of it was real and how much was fake. But soon, they entered the grand hall and everything shifted. The decorations were still resplendent and unfathomably beautiful but the lights were brighter and the musicians were at the ready in matching outfits and masks. Their instruments were receiving a final tune before the dance was to begin. The room was fairly crowded, but within moments it was even more so. Everyone was arriving all at once, and Henry and Arthur looked at each other with grand expectations for the rest of the night ahead. I never imagined it would be this spectacular, Arthur said above the din. Nor did I, Henry confessed. Are you less dour, then? Are you glad you came? Arthur asked. I was never dour. I knew it would be grand and likely a nice evening. I simply didn't indulge in the thought so much as you did, he replied. Whatever you say. But if you ask me, I would say you are far too slow to enjoy yourself, Arthur criticised. Henry brushed it off, knowing this speech. Arthur had given it to him a number of times. Simply because he did not spend all of his time engaging in these sorts of affairs, his friend judged him as boring. The room was growing more and more full. From across the room he suddenly heard his name called. Lady Arabella bounded towards him with all the sweetness of a child. Her gown was a sweet pink that came into a tidy V at her waist before fanning out at great diameter around her. For a moment, 
Henry wondered how a man was to dance with her with such a gown between them, and yet he knew there must be a way, or her mother would never have allowed this dress. Lord Whitecroft, it is I, Lady Arabella, she said, as if he would not be able to tell on his own. Henry smiled at her simplicity in that thought. Lady Arabella, how lovely to see you, Arthur said, before Henry had a chance to say anything at all. My Lord Ranton, she curtsied, forgive me, I did not recognise you at first, but I love your costume. It is utterly clever. You were right that you would certainly not go unnoticed, she giggled with genuine appreciation for the lion's mask and mane. Why, thank you, and your outfit is magnificent. The mask is a perfect compliment to the gown, Arthur said. Henry recognised that what Arthur appreciated about the mask was how little of it there was. Lady Arabella's face could be seen easily, and yet she behaved as though she were a mystery. Henry wondered if she really thought herself hidden, or if the entire goal was for everyone to know it was her all along in that dress which commanded so much attention. The decadence around them was stifling, but Henry couldn't deny that he found it ever so slightly thrilling. Despite himself, he thought he might actually be able to enjoy the night. Lady Arabella, would you be willing to accept a dance from the King of the Jungle? Arthur asked, gesturing for her card. A look of delight passed over her face, and Lady Arabella handed the card over without hesitation. Arthur put his name down for three spots throughout the evening, evenly spaced so he might be able to have as much time with her as possible. Henry tried not to shake his head in warning. When he handed the card back, her eyes took on a flattered delight recognising that this was a strategic and borderline improper decision made by Arthur, one that could possibly get him into trouble with the Countess or a governess if one was present. But Henry knew his friend to be daring enough to do this anyway, and he was not going to stand in the way of the happiness of the two. Lady Arabella hardly protested, and it was clear she was glad for Arthur's insolence. I shall hardly have space for another, she flirted. Do forgive me. If you should like me to leave them open, I shall. But as I'm allowed only three dances with you, I thought it best that I take them as I am able, Arthur confessed as a lovesick child. Now, Henry tried not to laugh that the words were coming from a lion, but Lady Arabella seemed to think nothing of it at all. Her eyes then flickered to Henry. It was a hopeful look, and one that tore her gaze from Arthur. No matter how clear it was that she liked his friend, Henry sensed she wanted something from him as well. Those eyes caught his own and held them for a brief moment before she glanced down at her dance card, the hopefulness transferring to what she really wanted from him. Henry realised that although she only really wanted the attentions of Arthur, she longed for the validation of any nobleman. He would have to dance with her for the sake of propriety anyway. Arthur could hardly be the only man to lead her onto the floor that night. He looked at Arthur who had seen the whole thing and understood what was being asked. He nodded ever so gently, ensuring only Henry saw the permission that was being given. Lady Arabella, might I also be honoured with a dance this evening? Henry asked. He placed a gentlemanly smile upon his face and hoped she understood he was genuine, but only assisting his friend in the matter. Satisfied, Lady Arabella handed her card to Henry as well. He put his name down for only one dance, and saw a flicker of disappointment on her face when he handed it back. No matter how nice a young woman she was, and no matter how she longed for the attentions of all the men in the room, he was not going to follow in the actions of his friend. Henry would not fill her card with his name to convey an interest he did not have, or to give her self-esteem a boost. There was proper protocol to consider, and if he wished for another dance with her, he would have to ask again in the night. I shall see you shortly, Lady Arabella, Arthur said as she curtsied and took her leave. Henry watched her make her way back to her mother as if she was ordered to report every little thing. The Countess was in a deep red brocade with a mask of black and matching brocade that hid her face well. But the unmistakable hair was piled high on her head and Henry thought it rather appeared like the nest of a bird. Of course, he could easily find anything to criticise about the woman, and it made him feel a little bit guilty. 
would not all women seek fortune and favour for their daughters. Perhaps the Countess took it a little bit too far at times, but she was only looking out for her child. She was doing the only thing a mother could do to ensure a solid future. In truth, Henry knew why he felt a dislike for her, and it was all based on suspicion, with no facts at all to back it up. He still wondered about Miss Marsh, and the inkling that had been in the back of his mind ever since speaking with Lord and Lady Lambton before. In fact, he wondered if he might be able to ask more details about it throughout the night. Perhaps a ball was not the right time, but if he could learn more about Lydia Stanley, he might be able to put to rest the questions that he felt certain were nonsense. Thank you, Arthur said, interrupting his thoughts. Hmm? Henry said, not having any idea what Arthur might be thanking him for. Thank you for dancing with her. At least if a space on her card has your name, it shall not hold another's. I trust that whatever you may think of her, you shall be honest with me, Arthur said. Certainly, I shall always remain honest with you, Henry said, unsure about the reason behind the statement. Did Arthur still think he disliked Lady Arabella and didn't approve of the match? He was only hesitant about rushing into it and the actions of her mother. But there was something more about the statement that Henry disliked, and it left him feeling disappointed. He had decided to come to the masquerade and try to enjoy himself. He had decided to try and be entertained by society and do the things that were expected of him. He wished to really indulge in one evening that promised to be fantastic. But he had written his name on one card, and for only one purpose. The evening promised nothing more for him than acting the polite gentleman. Yes, he was there more as an escort to Arthur than to enjoy himself in his own right. And perhaps if he were better at indulging society and entertaining others, this would not be a problem. But alas, here he was. No one expected him to bring any life to the evening. Looking around the room, Henry saw no one else he either recognised or desired to dance with. He knew well that there was a young woman at her home, probably tending to some menial task while her mistresses were out enjoying the festivities. But Henry could do nothing about that. He simply had to be here and try to enjoy himself despite the confusion of his friend's behaviour and the manipulation of a young woman's mother. Shall we begin with drinks? Arthur asked him. Certainly, Henry replied, joining his friend and making his way to the table. Whatever the evening was to hold, he was determined that he would try to enjoy himself. And if he could not, he would spend all of his time urging his friend to refrain from setting off a roar. Chapter 18 The time had gone by so quickly in the coach, as Henry urged Arthur one last time not to attend the ball dressed as an animal. But once more, it was to no avail. Will you stop it already? Arthur begged tired of being the victim of Henry's sensibilities. A low and frustrated growl escaped his lips, but Henry said no more, realising that the stubbornness of his friend was at its utmost. Arthur truly thought he was making the right decision by attending the ball dressed this way, and there was nothing to be done to convince him otherwise. The bickering had reached its penultimate point, when Henry decided he might as well give up. There was no talking reason into Arthur, there was nothing to convince him of the illogic of his costume. Thank you, Arthur said, recognising that Henry had accepted his defeat on the issue. Henry recognised that his friend was excited about the costume and knew he perhaps ought to have simply let the matter fall away early on. But the thought of how ridiculous Arthur looked left him feeling anxious for his friend's sake. So many people were going to attend this ball and there would be one animal amongst them. Of all of the things he could have chosen, this was simply not the appropriate one to have opted for. Henry snapped his own mask on, having waited until they arrived before doing so. He hadn't wanted to appear too eager for the dance before this, and now that they were there, he found himself wishing he had gotten a mask that was at least a hint flashier. Perhaps something with a silly feather or that covered the whole of his face rather than just around his eyes. Can you believe it? Arthur asked as a light shot up into the air and exploded in a loud cascade of colour. Fireworks. 
Henry said in a voice that betrayed his awe. This really is going to be the grandest party in all of England, Arthur said, eyes wandering around the night sky. Henry nodded as he and Arthur made their way up the stairs, seeing the dozens of other guests who were arriving at the same time, stand around and wait for more lights and explosions. It must have cost Lord and Lady Lambton a fortune to have hosted the fireworks, but Henry realised that was the sort of thing wealthy people were able to do. He considered whether or not he would ever use his own money for such a thing, and had to concede that he was not nearly exciting enough to do something like that. But it was good that people might get to experience it that evening and enjoy the show and all of the festivities that were on offer. Entering the mansion, Henry grinned at the mood of lanterns flickering by their wicks and the way everything was dim at the entrance, as if trying to add to the air of mystery. Add to the fact that no one could see another's face. It was quite a clever idea. For a moment, Henry found himself rather excited about the night. But as they moved in further, they were able to see the lights glinting off of grand decorations of silver and gold and shiny paint. Henry marvelled at it, wondering how much of it was real and how much was fake. But soon, they entered the grand hall and everything shifted. The decorations were still resplendent and unfathomably beautiful. But the lights were brighter and the musicians were at the ready in matching outfits and masks. Their instruments were receiving a final tune before the dance was to begin. The room was fairly crowded, but within moments it was even more so. Everyone was arriving all at once, and Henry and Arthur looked at each other with grand expectations for the rest of the night ahead. I never imagined it would be this spectacular, Arthur said above the din. Nor did I, Henry confessed. Are you less dour then? Are you glad you came? Arthur asked. I was never dour. I knew it would be grand and likely a nice evening. I simply didn't indulge in the thought so much as you did, he replied. Whatever you say. But if you ask me, I would say you are far too slow to enjoy yourself, Arthur criticised. Henry brushed it off, knowing this speech. Arthur had given it to him a number of times. Simply because he did not spend all of his time engaging in these sorts of affairs, his friend judged him as boring. The room was growing more and more full. From across the room he suddenly heard his name called. Lady Arabella bounded towards him with all the sweetness of a child. Her gown was a sweet pink that came into a tidy V at her waist before fanning out at great diameter around her. For a moment, Henry wondered how a man was to dance with her with such a gown between them, and yet he knew there must be a way, or her mother would never have allowed this dress. Lord Whitecroft, it is I, Lady Arabella, she said, as if he would not be able to tell on his own. Henry smiled at her simplicity in that thought. Lady Arabella, how lovely to see you, Arthur said, before Henry had a chance to say anything at all. My Lord Ranton, she curtsied, forgive me, I did not recognise you at first, but I love your costume. It is utterly clever. You were right that you would certainly not go unnoticed, she giggled with genuine appreciation for the lion's mask and mane. Why, thank you, and your outfit is magnificent. The mask is a perfect complement to the gown, Arthur said. Henry recognised that what Arthur appreciated about the mask was how little of it there was. Lady Arabella's face could be seen easily, and yet she behaved as though she were a mystery. Henry wondered if she really thought herself hidden, or if the entire goal was for everyone to know it was her all along in that dress which commanded so much attention. The decadence around them was stifling, but Henry couldn't deny that he found it ever so slightly thrilling. Despite himself, he thought he might actually be able to enjoy the night. Lady Arabella, would you be willing to accept a dance from the King of the Jungle? Arthur asked, gesturing for her card. A look of delight passed over her face, and Lady Arabella handed the card over without hesitation. Arthur put his name down for three spots throughout the evening, evenly spaced so he might be able to have as much time with her as possible. Henry tried not to shake his head in warning. When he handed the card back, her eyes took on a flattered delight recognising that this was a strategic and borderline improper decision made by Arthur. 
one that could possibly get him into trouble with the countess or a governess if one was present. But Henry knew his friend to be daring enough to do this anyway, and he was not going to stand in the way of the happiness of the two. Lady Arabella hardly protested, and it was clear she was glad for Arthur's insolence. I shall hardly have space for another, she flirted. Do forgive me. If you should like me to leave them open, I shall. But as I'm allowed only three dances with you, I thought it best that I take them as I am able, Arthur confessed as a lovesick child. Now, Henry tried not to laugh that the words were coming from a lion, but Lady Arabella seemed to think nothing of it at all. Her eyes then flickered to Henry. It was a hopeful look, and one that tore her gaze from Arthur. No matter how clear it was that she liked his friend, Henry sensed she wanted something from him as well. Those eyes caught his own, and held them for a brief moment before she glanced down at her dance card, the hopefulness transferring to what she really wanted from him. Henry realised that although she only really wanted the attentions of Arthur, she longed for the validation of any nobleman. He would have to dance with her for the sake of propriety anyway. Arthur could hardly be the only man to lead her onto the floor that night. He looked at Arthur, who had seen the whole thing and understood what was being asked. He nodded ever so gently, ensuring only Henry saw the permission that was being given. Lady Arabella, might I also be honoured with a dance this evening? Henry asked. He placed a gentlemanly smile upon his face and hoped she understood he was genuine, but only assisting his friend in the matter. Satisfied, Lady Arabella handed her card to Henry as well. He put his name down for only one dance and saw a flicker of disappointment on her face when he handed it back. No matter how nice a young woman she was, and no matter how she longed for the attentions of all the men in the room, he was not going to follow in the actions of his friend. Henry would not fill her card with his name to convey an interest he did not have, or to give her self-esteem a boost. There was proper protocol to consider, and if he wished for another dance with her, he would have to ask again in the night. I shall see you shortly, Lady Arabella, Arthur said, as she curtsied and took her leave. Henry watched her make her way back to her mother, as if she was ordered to report every little thing. The Countess was in a deep red brocade with a mask of black and matching brocade that hid her face well. But the unmistakable hair was piled high on her head, and Henry thought it rather appeared like the nest of a bird. Of course he could easily find anything to criticise about the woman, and it made him feel a little bit guilty. Would not all women seek fortune and favour for their daughters? Perhaps the Countess took it a little bit too far at times, but she was only looking out for her child. She was doing the only thing a mother could do to ensure a solid future. In truth, Henry knew why he felt a dislike for her, and it was all based on suspicion, with no facts at all to back it up. He still wondered about Miss Marsh and the inkling that had been in the back of his mind ever since speaking with Lord and Lady Lambton before. In fact, he wondered if he might be able to ask more details about it throughout the night. Perhaps a ball was not the right time, but if he could learn more about Lydia Stanley, he might be able to put to rest the questions that he felt certain were nonsense. Thank you, Arthur said, interrupting his thoughts. Hmm? Henry said not having any idea what Arthur might be thanking him for. Thank you for dancing with her. At least if a space on her card has your name, it shall not hold another's. I trust that whatever you may think of her, you shall be honest with me, Arthur said. Certainly, I shall always remain honest with you, Henry said, unsure about the reason behind the statement. Did Arthur still think he disliked Lady Arabella and didn't approve of the match? He was only hesitant about rushing into it and the actions of her mother. But there was something more about the statement that Henry disliked, and it left him feeling disappointed. He had decided to come to the masquerade and try to enjoy himself. He had decided to try and be entertained by society and do the things that were expected of him. He wished to really indulge in one evening that promised to be fantastic. But he had written his name on one card, and for only one purpose. The evening promised nothing more for him than acting the polite gentleman. Yes, 
He was there more as an escort to Arthur than to enjoy himself in his own right. And perhaps if he were better at indulging society and entertaining others, this would not be a problem. But alas, here he was. No one expected him to bring any life to the evening. Looking around the room, Henry saw no one else he either recognised or desired to dance with. He knew well that there was a young woman at her home, probably tending to some menial task while her mistresses were out enjoying the festivities. But Henry could do nothing about that. He simply had to be here and try to enjoy himself despite the confusion of his friend's behaviour and the manipulation of a young woman's mother. Shall we begin with drinks? Arthur asked him. Certainly, Henry replied, joining his friend and making his way to the table. Whatever the evening was to hold, he was determined that he would try to enjoy himself. And if he could not, he would spend all of his time urging his friend to refrain from setting off a roar. Chapter 19 It had been a great many years since Lydia recalled her father visiting the Lamptons in London. Seeing their new estate in the country close to hers and near the Scottish border, she could hardly contain herself. It was exquisitely decorated with all manner of gold and silver and gemstones. Could they be real? Or was it just another mask? Was it a facade for the sake of the party? The carriage Tabitha had hired for Lydia was coming to a halt, and she would be able to learn the answers soon enough. She stepped out, the silver gown sparkling in the light of a hundred torches that lined the path to enter the estate. Her mask was a shield of armour that flared out like wings. For a moment, Lydia recalled the butterflies in the field. Suddenly, she became one of them. Lord and Lady Lambton came into view just as Lydia made her way up the stairs and into the entrance. The two were greeting their many guests, indulging in niceties, and sharing how honoured they were for each visitor. Yes, Lydia remembered her father's visits to them. She also recalled when she had been given the opportunity to join him and the days in which they had come to see them in the country. Would they remember her? Would they remember the time when she was a child and her mother scolded her to be seated, but she had disobeyed and spilled tea on Lady Lambton's dress? Would they remember when her father had grieved her mother's passing and Lord Lambton stayed with him in the study while his wife entertained Lydia? She couldn't help but wonder. Why had they not asked after her in all these years? And what would they say when she revealed her true identity? Lydia allowed the questions to thud with her heartbeat as she joined the line to be greeted. Her lies were thin but ready. Good evening, my lady, Lord Lambton said as if trying to distinguish her. Good evening, Lord Lambton. You must forgive me for running late. I am a guest of Lord Ranton. She lied steadily grateful for the mask that hid her face. Oh, well, how wonderful, Lady Lambton said, her uncertainty fading into excitement as her husband showed a similar warmth. He must have forgotten to mention a guest, she continued. He is far too excited about his lion's mask to have even considered informing us. But we are delighted to have you join us. Please do come in. Thank you for your kind hospitality. The decorations are exquisite, you have done a magnificent job, she noted. Lady Lambton put a hand to her chest, flattered. Why, thank you. We did work hard on it, she said. No, of course it was likely the servant who had worked so hard, but Lydia was not going to say that. She liked Lord and Lady Lambton, and she didn't want to offend them. No matter the bitterness that had begun to creep inside her chest towards nobility, she wanted to like them still. Do enjoy the party, Lady Lambton instructed. The decadence was uncanny in the ballroom as the lights glittered against crystal and more of the colourful gemstones. Dancers seemed to float along the floor, their masks creating a depth of mystery and intrigue. Did you see the bonfire in the back? asked a young woman to her friend as they passed by Lydia. She tried to listen for an answer curious to know if this was a grand bonfire like the ones she had read about from the ancient Samhain traditions. But the ladies flitted away too quickly, and she decided she would just have to take a look for herself when she was able. Standing at the edge and looking on, she was caught up in the enjoyment of seeing everything. Off in one corner, 
Lord Ranton waited as Arabella pared an apple and read the rhyme she was meant to recite. She threw the coil over her shoulder and squealed in delight when it fell in a mess of a shape. That is hardly an initial, she complained, apples and nuts. The games of the ancient holiday all appeared to involve apples and nuts. She had heard some of them before, but it was entirely different getting to see them. Excuse me came a voice from behind, startling Lydia. She turned quickly and saw the Marquis of Whitecroft standing behind her. Oh, hello, she greeted breathlessly before remembering herself and offering a curtsy. He grinned from beneath his half-mask and held out a hand to her. May I? came his request. The words and the offer behind them, coupled with the melodic depth of his voice, caused Lydia's gut to stir. Of course, she smiled. Yes, this was what she would have hoped for. This was the joy and treat of being at a ball. She could dance freely with anyone who might wish to dance with her. And most importantly, to dance with the Marquess. No. Her feet carried her to the floor behind him and they joined at the beginning of the next dance. Each fall of her feet was a step towards happiness. Do the Stanleys know you have come? He asked her in an undertone careful not to allow his words to be heard by anyone else. The smile that had painted itself onto her face fell. Lydia grew nervous that he had recognised her underneath the mask and the dress that so far outweighed her station. Is it that obvious? she asked. No, he replied firmly. No, Miss Marsh, you look very unlike a governess, to be sure. It was a compliment, one as true and appreciated as any that Lydia had ever been given. If you know the truth, why have you chosen to dance with me? she asked. It was unusual that he might wish to dance with her rather than inform her stepmother about her actions. After all, he was nobility, and he did not know she was as well. For a governess, which he believed her to be, to impersonate a person of station was entirely unwarranted. A societal crime. If you have snuck out, then at the very least you must have a dance. He grinned again, showing his beautifully gleaming teeth. Thank you, she replied. I suppose a dance like this really is what I needed most if I came all this way. Through the holes of his mask, Lydia peered into his eyes. They were honest and compassionate. He cared for her with a greater gentleness than anyone had since her own father. Yes, Tabitha had done a great deal for her, but not with such tenderness. Tabitha was motherly, but also appreciated the shared bond of bitterness toward her stepmother. Lydia was someone of Tabitha's side, and that made her special. It was not so with the Marquis. He received nothing in return for his kindness. I have seen no other young woman tonight in a gown so clever, the Marquis noted. Clever? How exactly can a gown be clever? She laughed. It is a masquerade ball. Everyone is hiding, pretending to be something or someone else. Your gown is a mirror. It reflects them. Your gown shows them what they really want to see. Themselves, he teased. Do you think I'm hiding and trying to be better than my station like them? She asked. Ha! Huh. Quite the contrary. I think you are a queen who is pretending to be a pauper like them, he replied, reversing her understanding. Lydia laughed again, flattered he should say such a thing about her. The Marquis really was a gentleman. The dance was not so long as Lydia might have liked. She wished she would have a chance to dance with him again, but she knew the protocols, and it was too soon. As they departed the dance floor, walking slowly beside one another, they took in some of the sights that surrounded them. Lydia saw the laughter shared of one young woman as she thrust her head into a bucket filled with water and apples. Each apple had the initials of the other players carved into it, and it was all a wonder which apple she might retrieve. The initials would indicate the man she was apparently meant to wed. But Lydia put little stock in these rituals, although it was a nice thought to allow a piece of fruit to determine one's future. She preferred to take responsibility for her own. Nevertheless, she found herself on edge to see if the young woman was pleased or not with the gentleman that the apple predicted. 
A flouncing of auburn hair preceded the lady raising her head with the red fruit between her teeth. Immediately she pulled it out and read the letters LFD with great delight. A young man smiled shyly as the others around him laughed and slapped him on the back for his good fortune. Do you think they shall truly be wed? the Marquis asked, looking mischievous. It appears they would both be satisfied with the match, Lydia replied, not knowing anything about the two of them. Yes, it would appear so. However, I have it on good authority that the young woman, the daughter of Lord Pembroke, is actually meant to be married to a wealthy cousin living in America. It is a shame, for I think she would rather choose love than money, he told her. A flicker of anger passed through her, knowing her stepmother had chosen money over love at her father's expense. He had believed her affections were genuine, but her actions after his passing proved otherwise. That is quite a shame. To be forced into an unwanted union must be dreadful. It should almost make one wish to be a servant after all. That way, no one would even want to be forced into a match, Lydia said, momentarily grateful that she was not being auctioned off, like so many of the young ladies present. Indeed. But I still think a young woman deserves the freedom not to be a servant, he replied. It is a different sort of freedom, I suppose, Lydia said. Still, it is strange that you should have such knowledge. Her brother is a friend of mine, and even he has pleaded her case to their father. You can imagine he was met with a reminder as to what is and is not appropriate to ask of a father, the Marquis added, sounding bitter. Lydia opened her mouth to reply, but realised she had nothing to say. She could not ask about his apparent displeasure nor could she share anything regarding her own father. At least, not yet. He always seemed to dislike talking about his home and his family. But she needn't have worried about speaking. The Marquis turned to her with a renewed smile on his face. Would you care to join me for a game? He asked, gesturing forward towards one of the doors. Lydia nodded. Certainly. She could not help but observe his long strides as they made their way outside, where a smaller fire was set up. A short distance away she saw the grand bonfire and was as impressed as anyone else might have been. She only hoped it would not grow out of control. But where she stopped with the Marquess, there was very little to worry about. Care to burn a chestnut and learn your destiny? asked a servant dressed as a crone. Lydia giggled and looked at the Marquis, who returned her gaze before nodding and taking a pair of chestnuts into his hand. You must each take one and throw it into the fire at the same time. If they burn together into ash, your destiny is forged together. But if one jumps from the other, you had better hope your mother and father can find you a new match, the woman cackled in character. Lydia laughed again delighted by the show and thinking nothing of the game other than it being a bit of fun. All right, then, with me, the Marquis said, preparing to throw his chestnut. One, two, three, he counted, throwing it at the end. Lydia added hers in time with him, and the two nuts fell together into the fire. There was no jump, nothing to lead it away, nor was there even the slightest space between them. Merely two chestnuts, touching side by side and burning into ash. And at that moment, the silliness of the activity burned away with them. Lydia felt his gaze before she looked up to meet the eyes of the Marquis. Warmth flooded her body, and the ritual felt all too real. Her emotions, her hopes and dreams, her fears and neglect, all of it came pouring down on her in the flickering light of the fire. It was too much. She had to get away. Her plan for self-revelation abandoned. Lydia turned to leave, needing to rush away. She didn't want the Marquess to see what was in her heart or in her eyes. She didn't want anyone to know the truth. Suddenly she became a governess all over again. It was easier that way. It was better than accepting that hopes could come true. They never had before, and they would not start now. Before anyone could recognise her, Lydia had to return home urgently. Miss Marsh, came that beautiful voice in concern. 
Miss Marsh, where are you going? But Lydia was already disappearing into the darkness and fleeing to the coach that had brought her. She had to find it, had to leave. Otherwise, she might start to hope again. Chapter 20 She was fast, even in the gown, but Miss Marsh could not outrun him. Despite himself, he listened to the voices of other guests as they asked their questions about the young woman who had just run past them. Who is that? Do you know that young woman? Who is that lady running away? Have you seen her before? There was no time to answer the wonderings of other men. They were not important. Only she was important, and their admiration of her caused a childish boiling in his blood. They had not earned the right to wonder about her. Henry had to be the one to follow her, to learn more about her. <laughs> he made his way around the corner of the home in the direction she had gone and saw her figure in the gardens. It was clear she had grown tired from her running, or perhaps she was becoming emotional. It was difficult to tell in the darkness, but she had slowed and it gave him a better chance of reaching her. Miss Ma, he began to call, stopping himself. She paused at the sound of his voice, and he walked up to her more slowly and said her name quietly. Miss Marsh. It was better for him not to call it out. The Stanleys might hear him. Her identity might be revealed to the very people she was trying to hide from. She did not turn to him, but gently traced her fingers along the jasmine that bloomed beneath the moonlight. I had forgotten how lovely these are, she whispered as if to herself. It surprised him. Did she mean the flowers? Or the garden itself? You've been here before? Henry asked. Finally, Miss Marsh turned to face him. Her expression was vacant, almost hopeless. As a young girl, she confessed. It has been an age. I came with my mother. But it was a very long time ago now. Henry took in the sight of her all over again. The silver gown the reflective silver-winged mask that looked like the mythical Queen Mab and the woman who hid underneath it all. Who are you? he wondered aloud, desperate for an answer. Miss Marsh was not who she appeared to be. Certainly she was closer to a fairy queen than a governess, but neither category truly fitted her. She was someone else entirely, someone he deeply wanted to know. But his question elicited a forlorn expression on her face. I thought you recognised me, she said in dismay. No, really. Who are you? You seem like a lady, not a rich child lord's governess, he said. And how is a governess meant to seem? she asked in frankness. Henry realised how offensive the question might have sounded. What if he was wrong? What if she really was a governess? Had he judged her and criticised that as an offence? Forgive me. I did not consider how that sounded, he apologised. You would hardly be the first to think such a thing for a position like mine, she said. But as I said, it provides a different sort of freedom, and a different cage. He was quiet for a moment, but chose not to address the latter part of her statement. She was too downtrodden to speak further on it, he thought. I simply meant you are nothing like the governesses I have known, or what I might have heard of them. You have all the characteristics and sensibilities of a lady of position, he clarified. Perhaps I've lived in a rich lord's hall all of my life. One is able to learn a great many things that way, she told him. Miss Marsh's evasiveness was compelling. And yet, Henry was embittered by it. He wanted to know more than she was willing to tell. It was painful. And worse yet, Henry knew he had no right to feel pained. Well then. If you're only pretending to be a lady, then I suppose I ought to treat you like one. If I behave as though you are a noble lady, then everyone else shall as well, he promised. And it was true. If there was anything at all that might bring her joy, that might awaken her dream to become a truth, he would do it. Yes, please. If I were a grand lady, what would you do right now? She asked him in the same despairing voice. I would escort you through the gardens. I would ensure you saw the most beautiful of all the flowers and that you knew they paled in comparison to the mystery woman in the silver gown, Henry said, 
trying not to embarrass her with the compliment. His arm crooked in an offer, which Miss Marsh accepted. She looped hers through his, and they began to walk forward. They were quiet, but there was not much to be said. It was enough just to be there with her, arm in arm, enjoying the flowers that surrounded them. Henry was overwhelmed by how much he enjoyed spending time with Miss Marsh. A sound came from behind them, the rustling of leaves in one of the rose bushes. Henry turned quickly and saw a shadow vanish. Someone had been watching them. Miss Marsh glanced back but seemed to think nothing of the sound. She must not have seen the figure of the person who had been spying, and Henry did not want to startle her. Had the person heard very much? Although his heart was racing, Henry wanted to continue their walk, thinking it could have just been another guest who happened to have been going through the garden at the same time. There was no need for him to grow wary. I am rather fond of the hyacinths as well. What a shame that they are not in their prime, Miss Marsh noted as they continued through another section of the garden. Indeed, he replied, still distracted. Movement caught Henry's eye and the figure was back, mere paces from them and trying to hide before being seen. Miss Marsh gasped, startled by the presence of another. Who goes there? Henry called. The figure broke out in a run, having been caught. Henry did not take time for formalities in leaving Miss Marsh behind. Rather, he took off running after the miscreant, unwilling to allow someone to spy on them senselessly as if they had done something wrong. They might have heard the details they spoke of, her name or even her station. His legs carried him strong and fast, but he had gotten a late start, and this spy was hardly dressed in a gown, but rather a black cloak. Eyes peeled and determination set, Henry continued in the direction the figure had gone, but he saw no one on his path. Reaching the gate of the garden, he slowed, taking a moment to look around and decipher a location. To his deep dismay, Henry found only a black cloak thrown unceremoniously over the wrought iron gate. He was too late. Miss Marsh was a statue in the same place where he had left her. He knew his eyes told her everything, that he had no idea who had been watching them and that he felt like he had failed to protect her. We should go inside, otherwise there may be suspicions that I've acted dishonourably, Henry said, far more concerned with Miss Marsh's reputation than his own. Worse still, he worried that her identity might be revealed if the spy had been lurking during the greater portion of their conversation. It could already be too late as it was. We cannot have that, Miss Marsh replied, her words accepting a truth she had no power over. No, absolutely not, he determined. It would not be right for her to have to face consequences thanks to his desire to get to know her better still. Slow feet prodded the two back inside, where they found themselves in the main ballroom once more. It was better that they be seen in public, and perhaps they could spend at least a brief bit more time together. Henry bowed low, a grand gesture of politeness. It was not simply for the sake of those around them who might gossip. It was an effort to let Miss Marsh know how truly he respected her. How he thought of her as a lady, whatever society said and whatever she claimed. It was a pleasure to escort you, he said, as it always is. In her silver gown, Miss Marsh curtsied low. Once more he thought of the gracefulness of her form and how it resembled a noblewoman more than a governess. But she had protested, and who was he to force her to be anything more than a tutor? Oh, good. You found one of the gentlemen staying at Cold Creek Manor. Lord Ranton shall be relieved. I was worried, Lady Lambton said, honing in on the two of them. Her warmth continued, and Henry looked at Miss Marsh intently, realising she had claimed to be amongst Arthur's friends. Clever. Arthur would never deny the presence of an exquisite and mysterious young woman. Yes, it is clear that Lord Ranton's friends know one another, Lord Lambton added. The intent was obvious. Henry saw how Lord and Lady Lambton eyed her, trying to figure out who she was. He couldn't risk her being identified here in front of everyone when the Countess of Canwick was present.
it was far too dangerous. Indeed, we have known one another for quite some time, and I really must get her back to the dance floor as quickly as possible. I don't know if you've noticed, but one of the gentlemen in the black masks was rather familiar with a few of the young women, he lied. Lady Lambton's mouth fell open beneath her mask in horror. Familiar? How so? she asked, worried that an impropriety might have occurred at her ball. Oh, nothing so horrendous. Just little things like requesting more dances than is proper and joking about what his family could offer a young woman who was willing to give her hand in marriage this night, Henry continued. Who was it? Lady Lambton asked. I am not sure. But for her sake, I had best get her dancing again before he requests a place on her dance card, he said again, still avoiding giving Miss Marsh a name he could not come up with at that moment, one that would assuredly be debunked in the future. But it did not take too much to get away from the hosts. Henry rushed Miss Marsh back out to dance again, and they joined the other couples who were already twirling and moving about with each choreographed step. Thank you for rescuing me. Miss Marsh said with gratitude and a sigh of relief. It was my pleasure. I could not allow them to sniff around you until they learned who you are, Henry said. For a moment her lips parted as if she might say something, and Henry looked through the holes in the mask to Miss Marsh's eyes. A spark lay within them, but in a moment it was snuffed out. Her mouth closed, and she gave the smallest of nods. No, they cannot learn who I am she said with resignation. It would not do well if they should learn it just now. You see, a servant must bide her time if she is to be revealed. Henry questioned her meaning. Did she want to be revealed? Was he right all along? Would she ever stop playing these games and just tell him who she really was? The music played on and they moved with the beat. Each step only served to drive Henry's need forward to learn of this young woman. Maybe it was the magic of the evening. Maybe it was the burning of the chestnuts. Whatever it was, he knew Miss Marsh was growing more and more important to him by the day. From the corner of his eye, Henry saw Arthur dancing with Lady Arabella. He glanced over long enough to see how the two looked adoringly at one another from beneath their masks. The lion and the fairy princess or whatever it was she had decided to dress as. Lady Arabella certainly looked beautiful, but she was no match for the household staff who taught the Earl. Nor was the Countess who stood on the other side of the room, wearing a deep, blood-red gown and a brooch better suited to a younger woman. Now, in fact, there was not a single woman in the whole of the ball who even began to compare to the beauty of Miss Marsh. And if one had tried, she would have found herself terribly embarrassed. Henry allowed his eyes to rest on her once more as he took her hand again in the dance, hoping that each movement would draw her closer. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Chapter 21 The music came to a close and the Marquis led Lydia away from the floor and to the refreshments. His steps were a beat ahead of hers, guiding her in such a way that she found herself adoring. There was no way to deny how much she found herself appreciating every step from him, and every moment they were together. No matter how important he was considered by the rest of society, the Marquess did not deem himself to be so. Rather, he was humble. He was willing to spend his time with Lydia, despite thinking of her as a mere governess. Of course, it had taken her aback when he began asking questions that alluded to the truth. Was it possible he knew her true identity? Could it really be that the Marquis of Whitecroft had noticed her enough to care about how she was being treated? Or that he might suspect there was more to her story than what he had heard thus far? I do love the punch he stated, as if looking for anything to comment on that would not get them into any trouble. Oh, yes, and the decorations, she replied. It is just as I would have imagined, having heard of the holiday up north. It is quite magical and mystical, but I cannot help wondering what is real and what is not. 
I imagine the silver is all real and perhaps some of the gold, but the gemstones. They are surely paste, he said, feigning an interest in his own statement. Their chatter was meaningless, and they both sensed it, but Lydia understood the intent behind it. Whoever had been spying on them was likely to have heard her real identity, and if that was the case, she was only moments away from being exposed. In fact, it was possible that it had only been the good graces of the spy that had prevented her from having been outed already. Unless the man or woman was deeply kind, she would have to remain as careful as possible. And yet Lydia remembered the entire plan for the evening. To reveal herself. To expose her stepmother. Maybe she wasn't brave enough after all. Or maybe she knew deep down that she might not be believed. My Lord, giggled a rather enthusiastic voice that caught Lydia's attention. Arabella. She turned far enough to see her stepsister standing just on the other side of the Marquis. His body shifted and faced her almost as if to hide Lydia. Ah, yes, Lady Arabella, how wonderful to see you. And how are you this fine evening? The Marquis asked. Oh dear, you knew it was me, Arabella asked. Certainly. I know few other women who speak with such delight in their voices, he remarked. Well, I suppose that is not such a bad way to be recognised, she said. No, not a bad way at all. I saw you dancing with Lord Ranton again. He seemed to have been rather enjoying himself, and I noted that the two of you are quite lovely dance partners, he remarked. The smile faltered only a fraction. You think so? she asked. Oh, but I mean, there are others I might consider dancing with. It would be terribly rude if I did not save more space on my card. I mean, you are a lovely dancer as well, as I recall. And I think we make for quite a compelling couple on the dance floor. The last sentence Lydia knew was added at her mother's behest. Arabella could not exclusively dance with the man who interested her. She had to dance with the man her mother wished for her to marry, the Marquis of Whitecroft. Lydia tried not to sigh in her annoyance of this fact, or her irritation that Arabella was going along with it so easily. Certainly, the Marquis replied. And of course, there are rumours that you have been dancing with someone rather mysterious, Arabella hinted, trying to find a kernel of knowledge. At this, Lydia froze, and the Marquis turned slowly and haltingly. He was nervous, but he revealed her behind him. Ah, yes, actually, this is another of Lord Ranton's friends, the Countess of Birkenstock, he lied managing a name just quickly enough to sound as if he were speaking the truth. Not that Arabella would have noticed. She was often rather slow to discernment. Oh, she exclaimed in surprise, forgive me. How rude that you should hear me mentioning you as if you were not even there. Please do not worry at all. I understand, Lydia replied, saying as little as she could and in a timbre higher than her own. But rather than get to know this new woman, Arabella simply gave a polite smile. That is very kind of you, she said, before turning back to the Marquess with a renewed light in her eyes. Oh, but you've hardly danced at all this evening. Although you have had a loyal partner, there have been only a few others. And it is such a shame to waste an opportunity, Arabella said, urging the Marquess, another of her mother's orchestrations. Indeed, you must forgive me. Countess, he began, turning back to Lydia. It appears I have been neglecting the other ladies. I am a terrible man, am I not? Lydia gave an off-handed laugh, the sort reserved for carefree women and those who sought only status. Arabella appeared confused under her mask, but laughed along anyway. Your dances are entirely up to you, my lord, Lydia said as if she had not been the reason for his neglect of the others. However, I am perfectly happy to find my dear friend Lord Ranton, if you should like, Lady Arabella, the Marquis offered. Again, her smile faltered. Lydia knew it to be torn between what she wanted and the expectations of Lady Canwick. If only Arabella were strong enough to choose what she wanted and break free of her mother's chains. She would have been so much happier. She would be able to choose love, 
Oh, I do believe I have danced the maximum number with him already. Indeed, I think you and I ought to dance, shan't we? I promise you that I too am a lovely dancer and can absolutely offer you a wonderful time, she said, speaking a higher praise of herself than necessary. Lydia tried not to cringe as she watched the interaction unfold. It was far too embarrassing, and Arabella did not even realise it in her desperation to appease her mother. Well then, I suppose I have no other choice, the Marquis said, in as kind a manner as he was able. He looked at Lydia and gave her an apologetic eye, but it was clear that he was amused by Arabella's behaviour and the ways she thought it appropriate to get what she wanted. All over again, Lydia felt sorry for her stepsister. She wished the young woman would learn to have a mind of her own and not simply do whatever it was she had been told that day. She wished Arabella understood her own worth and value and the fact that she ought to be able to have happiness as well, rather than simply trying to appease her mother. But the two stepped away from the refreshments and towards the dance floor, all over again. For a moment, Lydia simply stood and sipped her drink, watching everything that was taking place in the room around her. The indoor games, the dancing, the flirtation, the extravagant decorations. There was so much to enjoy. My eyes must be deceiving me, came a cold tone that crept up Lydia's spine and sent a shiver running back down it. She turned quickly and faced the Countess before her. A mask and gown that were equal parts black and blood red. A face of hate pulsing underneath the fabric that hid her features. If you do not wish for a public scene, your best option is to leave, the Countess said. For a moment Lydia felt frozen, and in the next instant she was desperate to flee. But neither of those were going to save her. This instant! the Countess added, urging her to go as soon as possible. It was a threat more than a suggestion. And at that moment, Lydia remembered what she had originally planned with Tabitha. There was another option. She could make things right. She could fight for what was hers. You have no right to tell me to leave. I am from the nobility. I have every right to be here. I have never been to this house before but I have been in the home of Lord and Lady Lambton a number of times in London. They are dear to me. You do not know them, and you oughtn't to pretend otherwise, she said, a surge of courage coursing through her veins. The Countess's lips pursed, and her nostrils flared. Through the eye holes of the mask, Lydia saw fire. The hatred was palpable. You dare to speak to me like this? I could have put you out on the streets a long time ago, but I have chosen to be merciful to you. How dare you speak to me as though you have any choice in the matter at all? Lady Canwick asked. How can you put me on the streets? It is my home. It has been long before you married my father, Lydia said. Yes, but your inheritance is under my control. You think I would ever allow you to take it when you treat me thusly? when you are so inconsiderate and unappreciative of everything I've done for you. Foolish girl, she snapped. All you have done for me is threaten me and be cruel. I am the one who ought to be telling this room who I am. You believe they would come to your aid when they hear of everything you have done to the daughter of the late Earl of Canwick? Lydia challenged. A cruel smile formed on the lips of her adversary. You really are foolish, aren't you? Why would anyone take seriously the word of a young woman who cares nothing for her own reputation? After all, it is I who have been protecting it. And if you accuse me of anything, I shall share how you were seen, just this evening, alone with a man in the gardens. Lydia felt cold all over once more. If I were so cruel as you say I am, I would have told all of the guests the shameful fact that the late Earl's daughter is loose with propriety and cares nothing for the reputation she represents. And do you really believe the Marquis would be allowed to marry a woman with such a reputation? She asked further. You would do that? Lydia asked, knowing the answer well. You would give me no choice, the Countess replied, and you ought to think not only of how it would impact your reputation, but also that of the Marquis you appear to be so fond of. Lydia was quiet for a moment uncertain what else there was to be said. She was trapped. She had landed herself in a terrible position. 
Does Arabella know? she asked, realising her stepsister might accidentally say something to the wrong person about her true identity. She certainly does not. It would be appalling even to her, the Countess said. But if I go, you will not say anything about the garden. You know as well as I do that nothing improper occurred. And yet I think you care little of that, Lydia said. Oh, certainly I do not know what might have taken place, and for a young woman like you with a history no one here can vouch against, it would be no surprise, the Countess added. You would claim that I have a history of improper behaviour with men? She asked, realising the depths of the woman's cruelty. Tonight there was a witness to your actions. Therefore no one could say anything against such an accusation, the Countess confirmed. Lydia looked to the floor, defeated. She nodded slowly. It was not only her reputation, not only these lies. She had to think about the Marquis as well and his prospects that could be ruined if such a reputation got out. If the Countess was willing to embarrass him, it meant she was willing to lose him as a potential mate for Arabella. And if she was that desperate to punish Lydia, there was no telling what else she might do. Then I have little choice, she said. With that, Lydia turned and slipped out the door. Back through the garden she ran for home. Chapter 22 Thank you for a lovely dance, Lady Arabella, Henry said, bowing and taking his leave of her. He was desperate to return to Lydia. He had to find an opportunity to speak to her again, to make sure she was safe from her stepsister noticing her. As he made his way back towards the refreshments looking for her, Arthur came alongside him. So you danced with Lady Arabella? he asked. Mm-hmm. Henry nodded, his eyes still scanning, but not seeing the woman he truly wanted to dance with all night long. Good. At least that stops her from dancing with others, Arthur said, apparently reassuring himself once more that she was in good hands. Yes, indeed, no one else. You have her attentions well in hand, Henry said, paying only half attention to his friend. That's very good. I myself am having a splendid time. And you? I have heard a great many rumours about you tonight. Something about a mystery woman? Arthur asked. Henry turned and looked at him, inhaling. Oh, yes, of course, he replied without further comment. Arthur stared at him, waiting. Henry gave nothing in return. So, are you going to tell me anything about her? Or are you going to leave me desperately wanting to know more? Arthur pushed. What exactly am I meant to say? Henry asked, still unsure what he was going to tell his friend. Everyone is wondering who she is, Arthur said. Henry laughed. I have no idea, he replied, deciding that feigning ignorance was the best option. Then I suppose you have no idea where she has disappeared to, Arthur asked. At that, Henry turned and gave him his full attention. What? Disappeared? he asked. There was something about this news that left him unsettled, as if a great and terrible thing might have taken place. He was being overdramatic. He had to be. There was no grand plot, no terrible thing having taken place. No, indeed, Henry was overreacting. Certainly Miss Marsh had simply gone for another dance or was being spoken to by some other gentleman who had noticed her beauty. And yet... No matter how much Henry tried to convince himself of these things, he was overwhelmed with the belief that there had to be something amiss. It was all far too suspicious to be a coincidence. You really mean she disappeared? he repeated, looking intently at Arthur. Vanished, he replied, like fairy dust. It couldn't be. Henry didn't trust something so unusual, and more than ever he believed Miss Marsh to be in jeopardy. Arthur, you must forgive me, Henry began. For what? his friend asked. I must abandon you once more. You ought to go and find Lady Arabella for another dance, he suggested. Ha! Arthur scoffed. You know we've danced the limit. Yes, well, who's going to remember that? Henry asked in a voice that betrayed his irritation. What is you so overwhelmed? Arthur asked. Henry sputtered for a moment, searching for a lie. It's that ridiculous costume, he said. I'm embarrassed to be seen with you. 
Henry meant the words to come out as a bit of jest between two friends, but he saw the underlying hurt in Arthur's eyes. He would have to make it right later. But for now, he was busy with other preoccupations. And it was always possible that he could explain to Arthur another time why he had used such an excuse. With that, Henry searched for her about the room. The silver gown, the brown hair pinned up, anything that would set his mind at ease. But she was not in the ballroom. Of that he was now certain. She was not dancing or entertaining with others. Henry went in search of her outside and made his way to the bonfire where the guests were enjoying a new bout of games. The fire appeared to have grown more menacing, although Henry wondered if it was his own mind playing tricks. It was possible he was growing paranoid. But as he searched the masked in the eerie glow of the flames amidst the backdrop of a black sky, he grew more and more frightened by the possibilities. Goblins could take many forms, he considered not just the stuff of nightmares and fairy tales, but those who claim to be family, who claim to have one's best interests at heart. Perhaps they were the greatest villains of them all, but still, she was nowhere around. Still, he could not find her. All the wondering in the world seemed to drive him mad, but it didn't make a bit of difference when Miss Marsh was lost to him completely. Pardon me, have you seen the young woman in the silver gown? He dared to ask one guest. The young man shook his head. He wouldn't mind finding her either, but he ma fried e have nigh, the man replied in a strong Scottish accent that struck Henry. Sometimes he still forgot he was near the borderlands, and they were celebrating a northern holiday. With no sign of Miss Marsh, Henry began to make his way back towards the gardens in case she had returned there. But would he only get further into trouble if he tracked her back to that location? alone. As he rounded the corner, Henry jumped at the presence of another woman. Have you found what you are looking for? asked the Lady Canwick in a stern tone. Henry's heart had skipped but was beginning to settle. A gentle rage and genuine disgust started to stir within him. How was he to speak with this woman without showing his dislike of her? No, no, I have not, he answered, his tone stiff with displeasure. There was no possibility of hiding his feelings, and at that moment he decided there was no reason to either. Well, you needn't worry, she replied. Whatever do you mean? Henry asked. I have sent my wayward servant home. It was about time she left the ball. I do so apologise, the woman said in a dishonest and mocking way, a cruel smile toying at her lips. <laughs> but Henry was beginning to learn a thing or two of his own about the Countess and her secrets and if he could prevent her from telling any more lies, he would, even if it meant embarrassing himself. Lady Canwick, may I ask where your stepdaughter is? he questioned, leaning forward and resting a hand under his chin, a victorious grin sliding up the corner of his mouth. For a moment the Countess faltered. Lydia? she asked. Indeed. Lydia, he replied. Why, she is away, the Countess replied vaguely. Away, he repeated. The pauses of her words were a far greater statement than the words themselves. Henry eyed her closely despite the darkness. His eyes had adjusted as well as they could, and the glow of the fire still revealed enough of her to watch closely. Yes, away, with relatives, she added. Ah, relatives. And are these relatives of yours or her late father's or her late mother's? He asked, leaving the question open for other possibilities. Her father's, the Countess said, her confidence flickering to Henry's delight. Yes, well, that is rather convenient, he said. In that small moment, Henry felt like he was going to break the Countess into honesty, that he could fool her, that he could find the truth. But it was short-lived. Her strength returned, and the Countess straightened her back, bringing that satisfied expression back to her mouth. One he could see, even though the mask covered so much of her face. Are you accusing me of something? she asked. Suddenly, Henry realised he had underestimated her. He had thought she would break down and confess as to whatever had been taking place. 
but he had not been so fortunate as that. No, rather, the Countess was stronger and more cunning than ever. Or perhaps she was simply greatly dislikable and honest. Henry still had no proof that there was anything so amiss as he had believed. Are you? she prodded, wanting an answer from him. Henry held her gaze a moment too long, an attempt to weaken her once more. But he failed. Her eyes only grew brighter with confidence, and he noted how she ever so slightly puffed out her chest, unconsciously. She had won, and she knew it. No. I did not mean to offend you in any way, Countess. I am not accusing you of anything. I simply wish to ask a question, he replied. The smirk on the face of the Countess set itself firmly, and he knew he had no hope of remaining there with her. In fact, he didn't wish to be at the ball any more at all. With his suspicions stronger than ever before, Henry recognised his defeat and turned away from the Countess. He was gone before realising he had done so without any of the polite formalities that were expected of him. He couldn't bring himself to care. She was hardly worth his concern if he was right. And if he was wrong, he had made a grave error in judgement. Henry made his way into the ballroom once more and found Arthur flirting with Lady Arabella again. It was the last thing he wanted to interrupt, but Henry had little choice. Quietly sidelining his friend, Henry leaned over and whispered, I should very much like to leave now. Arthur turned and Arabella, as if trying to be polite, gave a shy smile and looked away. What do you mean? We can't leave. Not yet. There is far too much still happening for us to depart this early. Can you imagine everything we might miss? He asked. Yes, well, I'm more than willing to miss it, Henry confessed. Arthur's shoulders sagged, and a low sigh growled in his throat. I don't understand, he said. I know, and I am truly sorry for that. But I promise to explain everything soon. At least, I shall try. At the moment, even I do not understand what is happening. But if my suspicions are correct, you will come to know it in time, Henry said. Arthur pulled back the lion mask, and his brows drew together in concern. You are making me worried, he said. Henry sighed, unable to say anything else that might explain his actions. I know, but all of that aside, are you joining me, or shall I send the coach back? he asked. Arthur appeared to be torn. Henry saw in his eyes how he wanted to remain behind, but loyalty to his friend compelled him. Realising it was unfair to make him choose, Henry decided to make the decision for him. You know, I suppose that's the better option. You ought to remain behind. Lady Arabella would be sad if you left. I shall send the coach back, he said, turning to leave before Arthur could do his duty in protesting. Henry felt alone as he left the estate. All of his thoughts collided, and he had no one yet to share them with. He had no one to ask or to clarify whether or not he was correct in what he believed. But he would do whatever it took to find out, starting with asking Miss Marsh who she really was. Chapter 23 Tracking mud into the kitchen, each footprint was evidence of her actions. Evidence that would surely be used against her the moment the Countess arrived home. At least she had not told Arabella. Of course, perhaps Arabella would have been so overwhelmed with a lack of understanding that she would have happily shared the news of her stepsister attending the ball. And then people might have listened. But that was unlikely. The Countess would have prevented her from saying anything. Arabella would have been fed some lie. Lydia would only have looked worse to her stepsister, who was already growing false under the influence of her mother. Shallow breaths sounded her arrival in the kitchen, and Tabitha turned to take in the sight of her. Good heavens, I didn't expect you this early, or this dirty, Tabitha said, her eyes looking worried. Nor did I, Lydia confessed. What happened? Tabitha asked. Lydia sat on a chair in defeat, her energy sucked from the alternate running and walking on the journey home. She had to tell Tabitha what had happened even if she had no emotional capacity to do so. The Countess saw me. 
She knew who I was. The woman has spies, Tabitha. She hates me that much, Lydia said. Spies? She sent someone to watch you? She asked. Indeed, and because I was alone with the Marquis, she knew exactly how to threaten my reputation. You know me well. There was nothing improper that took place. But she said that because she had a new witness. She could even say this was not the first time, that I have a history of behaving in such a way. Lydia trailed off. She said that, Tabitha demanded. It surprises you, Lydia asked rhetorically. So you came on foot, Tabitha asked. Yes, I fled as quickly as I was able, she answered. But there was mud everywhere. The dress has been made a mess of. We can always clean it, Tabitha said. Unless she takes it, Lydia replied, only just realising that she might lose the one thing she had only just found of her mother's. We can't let that happen. We will hide it again. Somewhere she won't ever find it, Tabitha insisted. Lydia looked at her with evident hopelessness. It's no use, Tabitha. She has won. We tried to ensure this evening was my victory. But she won. And she always shall. I will never be able to return to my old life or get anyone to listen. She has too much power, too much influence, and now she is even able to ruin my reputation. All because I was foolish enough to be alone with the Marquess, she said. Lydia was forlorn and stuck. Not only that, but she had abandoned the Marquess at the ball and had no way of getting him a message now. She wished she had been able to say goodbye, but such a thing would have been impossible. No, it was all too late now. Lydia opened her mouth to speak again, but steady footsteps were heard on the other side of the door, and both ladies went silent. They watched for it to open, knowing the gait of the woman on the other side. The wooden door pushed open with ease, and the Countess's spidery fingers rested against it for a moment as she loomed underneath the frame of it. Tabitha, you are dismissed, she began. Lydia and Tabitha made brief eye contact. Nodding to her friend, Lydia let her know she would be all right. She couldn't allow Tabitha to get into trouble on her account. The moment Tabitha was gone from the room, Lydia and the Countess met eyes. Each stood firm, although Lydia knew she was greatly weakened in anything she might use as a defence. Her stepmother had already defeated her. I am willing to forgive it. After all, you grew up spoiled. I ought to have known you would try something like this. Something to push us away, to make me look as though I have been unfair to you when we both know how good you have it under my watch, the Countess began. Lydia's jaw dropped open at that statement. The audacity was too great for her to accept. She wondered if her stepmother truly believed the words coming out of her mouth, or if she was just adding to her manipulation as one might expect from her. But I am a gracious woman, as you well know by now. I understand you wish it to play the part of nobility this evening, but we needn't continue this foolishness any longer. Your father is gone, your mother as well. I am the rightful keeper of this home, and your acceptance of that is all that I require. However, this is your final chance. Truly there shall be no more. If you ever do anything like this again, I assure you that you shall be put out on the streets. Do you understand? She challenged. Once more, Lydia opened her mouth to speak, but she was silenced by a hand raised by her adversary. Let me be clear. When I tell you that you shall be on the streets, I mean, you shall never see Walter again. Your brother shall be estranged from you, and he will hear nothing positive about you, she stated menacingly. That was the worst possible threat, and the Countess knew it. Lydia was bitter towards her more than ever for such a thing. To separate the two siblings was beyond cruel, beyond shameful. And the worst part of it all was the evident joy that spread across the Countess's face as the words dripped from her grinning lips. She took pleasure in causing Lydia to suffer. She rejoiced in bringing pain to her stepdaughter and causing her grief and Lydia wondered if it could get any worse than this. Was it possible that the Countess would try further to break her? Or would she finally be satisfied with her work? Was this enough? Was this the end of it all? 
If Lydia accepted all of her stepmother's terms, would she live free in her surrender? And certainly you shall have nothing further to do with Lord Whitecroft. You shall not speak with him again. Although I should think that would go without saying. I do hope it is of no shock to you, the Countess continued. A cold grip reached around Lydia's heart, one she wanted to deny. She could hardly admit to herself the feelings she had for the Marquess. How had her stepmother come to watch so keenly over the two? Henceforth, when he comes to our estate, you shall be locked in your room, she continued. Oh dear, do not look at me like that. Lydia made herself aware of her own expression that had betrayed her to the Countess. Immediately she tried to make it stone again. You shall be locked away and out of his sight, and once Arabella marries him you shall have to go, she concluded. You shall have to go. The words rang in Lydia's ears on repeat, echoing over one another. Despite herself, tears pricked behind her eyes. Her throat tightened, her muscles stiffened. Lydia's thoughts drifted back to Walter. If she was to be forced out anyway, the Countess intended for her to be separated from him regardless. Would she have any mercy if Lydia agreed to these rules? Would she be allowed secret visits with him so long as she stayed out of Arabella's way? Of course, it was not only Walter who sprung to her mind. She would miss the Marquis of Whitecroft as well. Lydia would be sad to be apart from him and without him ever finding out the truth. It would be a terrible loss of someone who was growing to be a friend. Possibly more. And yet none of these pleas would mean anything to the Countess. She did not understand the bond of family that linked Walter and Lydia. Arabella was a tool more than a daughter. It meant nothing to the Countess that there was blood that linked them. Nor did she understand love. Lydia hardly felt ready to confess that she felt something so strong, but she knew it was the truth of what she was growing to know. So, appealing to the Countess for the sake of love or family meant nothing. There was truly only one thing she understood, and that was greed. If Lydia was going to try and learn anything about the woman's real plans, she would have to appeal to that sense. And my inheritance, she asked boldly. The Countess looked at her with mock innocence. Why, your money is gone, my dear Lydia, she said. It had not been the thing she had expected to hear. Certainly she would have thought the Countess would have an accounting of her funds, perhaps even try to steal a little bit now and then. But gone? How could it have all simply vanished? Although she had never had a great love for money, Lydia was still in shock. That money was supposed to provide for her. It was supposed to be her refuge in order to escape her stepmother. It was what she had been depending on to get Walter out of the house and free of his mother. But alas, it was gone. It had vanished. And she'd never had a say in that. You spent it? All of it? My inheritance is gone? Lydia asked in disbelief. Of course, on your upkeep, the Countess reasoned. This was even more ridiculous than Lydia had anticipated. The Countess was claiming it had all gone towards Lydia anyway. That she had truly cost that grand amount. And Lydia was meant to believe her. That is impossible. I have barely cost you anything. I have had no grand designs and have lived as a servant. I have been a governess to Walter, saving that expense. And you claim that my upkeep has cost my inheritance? Lydia dared to spit back. It doesn't matter now, Lydia. It's all gone either way. Complain as you wish. What's done is done, the Countess said. And that was all it took for Lydia to understand the truth. None of this was as simple as jealousy or greed. It was not a mere matter of providing for Arabella or gaining her own wealth. This was about making Lydia disappear. That way, the inheritance could truly be signed over to her. The Countess wanted the money and the power that went along with it. She wanted everything. Lydia remained silent but held Lady Canwick's eyes with a stony gaze. A piece of her wished to return a thousand threats over, but it was pointless. She would not allow herself to become like the Countess. No matter the damage she could do to her stepmother, it seemed she would never win. Now I am going to go upstairs and wait for Arabella. She should be returning from the ball fairly soon the Countess declared, turning to leave the kitchen. Lydia watched her go. 
Tabitha, the countess called as the door closed behind her. She seemed to expect everyone to do as she pleased. Bursting into the kitchen through the back entrance, Tabitha rushed to Lydia's side. You are being called for, Lydia said in a dry, emotionless tone. That woman can wait. Oh, Lydia, I heard everything, Tabitha confessed, pulling Lydia into a hug. I'm so sorry for everything she has done to you. A part of Lydia wanted to accept the pity and sadness on her behalf. Another part was far too numb to recognise it. She was finished with believing that things could ever work out in her favour. The world had proven time and time again that it would not. We are going to sort things out, I promise, Tabitha said, pulling back and smoothing Lydia's hair. No matter how much she wanted to believe it, she would not allow herself. Not any more. Not if her only option was to obey until she was put out. After all, perhaps her obedience would gain her privileges with Walter. Ever and if she allowed her stepmother to spread rumours about her dignity, she would have nothing left in society anyway. There really was no good choice left to her. Lydia would have to let it be. Otherwise, she would lose what little remained to her. Chapter 24 There was a hope in his heart that he would find her. Miss Marsh often went out walking, and that was how he most frequently stumbled upon her. If he could only be so fortunate as to find her today. Bearing that in mind, Henry pulled on his boots, knowing there would be a lot of mud to try and avoid as he walked. But he didn't mind if he got dirty. He cared only for finding her. For learning what it was that had frightened her away, and if it was indeed the Countess who was doing all of this. Where are you off to? Arthur asked, grumbling as he made his way down the stairs to breakfast, still wearing his robe. A walk, Henry answered. Isn't it terribly early for that? Arthur continued. Not for those of us who returned early and got a few hours of sleep. Really, Arthur, it's the middle of the morning. It shall be noon before you know it, he replied. Arthur shrugged, and Henry laughed before they parted ways. His feet led him out onto some of the same paths he had crossed before when he stumbled upon Miss Marsh. Listening for the sound of horses, he was disappointed to hear nothing. He thought that perhaps the Earl might be out for a ride on his pony, but alas, it appeared not. Two full hours passed before Henry finally stumbled upon Miss Marsh and the Earl, walking along a smaller path nearer their home. Ah, my dear friends, Henry greeted, striding up to them casually. He did not wish to alert the Earl to anything being amiss, but Miss Marsh looked at him with a hint of fear in her eyes. What had been said to her to cause such a response? He wondered if the Countess had been even worse than he'd imagined. My Lord, Henry greeted, turning his attentions to the boy in order to give Miss Marsh a moment of relief. He sensed her frustration and sadness. Now, seeing her face in full once more, without the mask from the ball, he saw a different sort of mask. She was trying to hide, trying to avoid him, but there was nothing for it. Her emotions were clear and evident on her face. Something was terribly wrong. I trust everything was well for you both the previous day, he asked, trying to hint to Miss Marsh about the evening. Certainly, was her only reply. I had to remain in bed again, the Earl said, his face still weary. Neither had given him any sort of real response, and both were terribly dull. He wondered how he was meant to learn anything when they wouldn't speak to him. Miss Marsh looked at her charge and then back at Henry. She crouched a bit, as if to give instructions to the Earl, but being frightened to do so. Walter, she began, I think it would be good for you to check on Roderick. The Earl nodded and slowly made his way back a few long paces to where his pony was tied to a tree. Lethargic hands brushed along the beast's mane at an agonisingly slow pace. Whatever he was recovering from, he was still not fully himself. I'm surprised he was not insistent upon showing me the pony, Henry noted, remembering how excited the child was only days before. His enthusiasm has lessened with his health. I'm certain that once he is on the mend he shall be thrilled to show you his pony, Miss Marsh replied. Her figure was stiff and unwelcoming. Her face remained a stone, and she did not show any true emotion from where she stood. She took a deep breath in, 
and Henry sensed she had something further to say. Perhaps the truth. I am sorry. I apologise for yesterday evening and both my appearance and my disappearance. I overstepped my station, not only last evening, but in speaking with you. I shouldn't see you at all any more, she told him. Henry's heart began to sink. These meetings with Miss Marsh were one of his greatest joys. Not only that, but he knew his feelings for her were on the verge of something greater. She was the first woman in all his life who had ever made him consider the blessing of marriage. Even if her station was not the sort that would allow for such a thing, even if he had been wrong in every one of his suspicions, he couldn't deny that he was feeling so strongly for her. What do you mean? he prodded. Why can we not see one another? Please, tell me what you mean by that. Exactly as I have said. We ought not to see one another. It isn't proper. I am not the sort of woman you should be spending time with. It is a blight on both our reputations, and yours is in far greater danger than my own. No one cares about someone like me, but you are important amongst them, she replied. Is it the Lady Canwick? he asked boldly. Has she threatened you in any way? Is she the reason for your hesitation? What is it that has changed between last evening and today? Things were different between us. But Lady Canwick spoke to me as well. What did she say to you? Henry had not realised how his posture had changed. He had drawn close to her, and his hand reached out and landed upon her shoulder. It was far too familiar a move. Not only that, but it was the very thing she had just been concerned about. Their reputations. And here he had touched her in a moment of compassion. He had allowed his desperation to get the better of him. Her eyes were wide when she looked up at him in surprise, and Henry drew his hand back, shyly glancing away. When his eyes reached her again, Miss Marsh was looking at the ground. Not in shame from his action, but with the sadness of her situation. It is my own fault, truly, my own responsibility, she said, the sound of her throat tight and a glint of tears in her eyes. Yes, whatever was happening, it was clear she was being coerced into her answers. This was not the young woman he had met previously. This was someone who was being held under duress in a circumstance of another's making. I was a fool to have stepped so far out of my station last evening, and I put the reputation of this estate in jeopardy, as well as yours and my own. It was unwise of me to have gone and pretended that I belonged at the masquerade, she insisted. Whatever you think you know of me, you must understand that I am a governess who made a grave mistake in trying to be more than I am, and you and I must not speak further on these matters. In fact, we must not speak at all. I wish you well, my lord, she said, turning to leave. Her words sounded rehearsed, as if she was repeating what she thought she ought to say. All of it was a facade. That much was evident. That much Henry could see. I don't believe you, he told her outright. That stopped her in her tracks, and she turned back towards him, speaking deliberately and with a frustrated insistence, wanting him to believe her words. Well, that much is not my fault, she said, glancing back towards her charge to ensure he was safe. Henry could see she was unwilling to let him run off again and get hurt. She wouldn't take such risks again. She had likely been in enough trouble as it was. If you are being threatened, please tell me, Henry urged. I want to help Miss Marsh. No, not Miss Marsh. I know who you are. I cannot call you that name again when I know who you really are, he revealed. Henry hadn't meant to do it. He had told himself time and time again that he had to wait until he had evidence, until it had been confirmed. But he knew well that this was no Miss Marsh. This governess was the daughter of the late Earl of Canwick. She was the heir of his estate. He could no longer pretend he was ignorant of the fact. This was Lydia Stanley, and he knew it. Her eyes confirmed it. Once more she looked at him in surprise. This time there lay a number of other emotions behind it. Fear, relief, hope, shame. <laughs> but the look in her eyes was not enough evidence for him to do anything he would have to hear it from her own lips. He would have to be able to say he had proof, her word, anything. Without it, he would be considered a fool for accusing the Countess of anything so heinous. 
I am sorry, she said again. If anything happens, I will not be able to see Walter again. He is all I have. Henry understood now the terrible place the Countess had put her in, threatening her, telling her she could not see her brother again if she did anything she was not meant to. But spending time with him could hardly be a part of that, so long as they were not alone. But I can help you. We are friends, are we not? he asked. And he meant it. He would do anything to ensure she had her freedom and her relationship to the Earl secured. He would do anything for her. She had utterly changed him. I cannot be seen with you, she insisted. It will only make things worse. You do not understand. Whatever it is that you believe about me, it must all be pushed aside. I can't risk losing Walter. He is the only thing I have in my life. He watched her gaze find the Earl and saw the resemblance clearly. The same dark hair, the same grey eyes. Everything was lining up. Everything he believed had to be true. The late Earl's daughter was not away with relatives. She was here with her own brother. It had to be. He knew it in his heart even if he couldn't voice it to anyone other than her. And yet she had still confirmed nothing. His certainty in what he believed to have happened still held no clout. There was no evidence for any of it. Goodbye, my lord, she said, turning to leave. Miss Miss Stanley, he said, trying to stop her. He thought saying the name might bring her back to him, make her confess everything. It was a bold manoeuvre, but it was something. And if it worked, he could finally stand up for her. But she continued away from him, and he saw the tears that ran down her cheeks until she was facing the other direction. She was leaving, and there was nothing he could do to stop her without getting in her way and placing his hands on her shoulder all over again. She made her way to the Earl, and he overheard the way in which she urged him on taking the pony. The two dragged their feet as they forlornly moved forward. There was no light in their step, no joy. No, they were stuck, both of them most likely, and there was nothing now he could do to make things better for them. He still had no real proof, only his own unconfirmed suspicions and certainties. But he had only grown more confident in it having seen her attachment to the young Earl. And with that, there really was only one explanation. He was her brother. Chapter 25 Lydia brushed her hand along her cheeks, trying to rid them of the tears that were still falling. She made every effort to hide them from her brother and swiped them away just in time to reach him. How is he? she asked. A smile spread across her face. Hungry? Walter replied, pulling an apple from his pocket to feed to Roderick. He must have hidden it there after breakfast. With his small hand, Walter held it out, and the pony pulled his lips back from his teeth as he bit into it. Lydia noted how he still looked rather tired. His complexion was pale, and his skin had the sheen of illness even now. He was rather wan, and his lethargy left her with a continued anxiety. Now, more than ever, she could not risk being separated from him, not while he remained ill. I suppose it's a good thing you've brought him some food. I don't know what he would do without it. Roderick is a very lucky pony to have an owner like you, she complimented. Walter's face lit up a bit at that, and she was glad to have made him smile. Even if it was only for a moment, her brother looked a little bit more like his old self but it lasted only a short time before his face fell again. He was back to his dull, sickly expression, faster than she had imagined he would. It was unnerving to see him like this. She wondered if his cold was growing into something worse, but Lydia could not think about that. She had already lost too many people in her life. Why are you sad? Walter asked suddenly, not looking at her directly. Lydia was embarrassed that he had noticed. What do you mean? she asked in reply. You've been crying. Your eyes and face are all red and blotchy. What's wrong? he asked. A sigh escaped her lips as she untied the pony and led them both away, making every effort not to look back at the Marquis. She wondered if he had gone or if he was still watching them. He might be standing just a short time away. But Lydia did not wish to look back like Lot's wife. She would not turn to salt. She would have the self-discipline to move forward. 
The path ahead opened, and the house stood tall and wide before them. Large and looming, a place that was once warm had grown dreaded and dark in Lydia's mind. How could she explain all of that to her brother? Your mother is angry with me, Lydia confessed. I did something she did not like, and now I have to face the consequences of that. Walter nodded, as if he was unsurprised by that. It was a shame that at only seven years of age, he already recognised that things were uninviting in his home. She's angry a lot, I think, but it's fine. You shouldn't worry too much about it. I love you. You know I'm the lord of the house, and I shall always take care of you, he said, keeping pace with her, Roderick following behind. The pony swatted a fly that landed on his side, his tail swishing and falling back into place. For a moment, Lydia imagined herself as that fly, buzzing around her stepmother as a nuisance, being swatted and forced away. Lydia paused and turned to her brother, reaching her arms around him in an embrace. She felt the bones of his thin frame and the meat of his belly and his cheek against hers, where he still held some of his babyish fat. He had grown so much and slimmed down, but there were still a few of those features she could hold on to. He hugged her back, but his grip was not so strong as hers. Lydia didn't mind that. She knew he was still ill. She knew that soon they would share a strong embrace. She would risk nothing to be separated from him. They had to stay together always. His mother, however, was the problem. She had not only tried everything to destroy Lydia, but she was also ruining Walter's future. She was spending his fortune faster than she could count it. Walter, when he grew up, would likely have nothing. It was entirely possible he would have nothing left, and his mother would ruin all their lives. He would be a pauper rather than an earl. Oh, Walter, she said warmly, I mean it. I will always take care of you, he reiterated, seeing a puddle and stepping into it before looking up at her guiltily. I know you will, brother, she replied, emotion overwhelming her. Lydia chose to ignore the fact that he had jumped in the water. He knew he wasn't supposed to, but she hardly cared at that moment. Instead, Lydia took his small hand in hers and pressed it with appreciation. She held on to him, not willing to let him go for even a moment. Walter squeezed her hand in return, and she knew he at least understood that the two of them would always be at one another's side, as long as they had any choice in the matter. Lydia, are you going to marry Lord Whitecroft? he asked, innocently. Has he asked you yet? I think he wants to. It was a hard question to hear. It was impossible. Impossible with her situation as it was, not with what everyone believed her station to be. Even if he trusted that she was more than what was claimed, they could never join in marriage. She inhaled the smell of the air, the dying leaves, the mud of the earth. Walter picked up an orange leaf from the ground and twirled it in his fingers. Seasons changed. And in this season, Lydia had nothing of what she once imagined. No, Lord Whitecroft and I should never be allowed to marry even if that was something either of us wished for, she replied. Why not? Why would you not be allowed to? And don't you wish for it? I think he does. Did he tell you he doesn't? Walter continued. None of it matters. As I said, we wouldn't be allowed to, she said, as if it were final. But why? he asked further. Important men like that do not marry nobodies like me, she finally answered allowing her feet to fall harder into the soft earth. She could leave her prints as evidence she had existed, that she had lived here. But you had the same father as I did. Doesn't that also make you someone? I am an earl, so surely that must make you someone with a good position, doesn't it? He asked, still dwelling in his innocence. Lydia wished she could dwell there with him. She wished it could all be that simple, and she could just tell him that yes, she was important, but she was a governess now. Nothing more. Sometimes things are not so simple as that, Walter. Yes, we have the same father, but we have different mothers. Yours now has a grand station, and because of that I do not. And that is how it is. 
You shall understand some day, I hope, she said. But it is fathers who determine nobility, isn't it? And why does my mother seem to cause problems for you? I know people think I don't listen, but I do. And I heard one of the maids say she was being mean, Walter said. Your mother may tell you one thing, and you should always be obedient to her. But you should always remember that I love you and will always be honest. I want you to be safe, but I want you to know the truth. Always, Lydia told him, a vague warning underlying her words. She also hoped he would not return to the fact of their father. It was too much to explain. I don't know exactly what you mean, but I see nothing wrong with it if you and Lord Whitecroft want to marry. I think you are both the same. His father is important, and so was ours. So I think that should mean you two can marry, he told her simply. Moisture filled her eyes all over again, and Lydia tried to hide it from her brother once more. She wished his mother would see things from his perspective. Thank you, Walter. We shall not marry, but I am glad you see us as the same, she said. I would be a fool if I didn't, he replied, sounding very much the wise adult Lydia hoped he would grow to be. But only a moment later, he was taking his hand from her and rubbing his belly. A small grimace made its way to Walter's face, and Lydia's eyebrows drew together in worry. Are you all right? Lydia asked, observing the motion and trying to decipher his expression. Yeah, he sighed. My stomach hurts again. It always hurts these days. Feeling her face twitch a little, Lydia was deeply concerned. Walter should not still be having a stomach ache. It had been days. Whatever had caused it ought to have been out of his system by now. It grieved her to see him in pain. I shall call the doctor again then. He will know what to do, Walter. He helped you feel better after your cold, did he not? She asked. I didn't even have a sore throat, Walter replied. I always have a sore throat with a cold. But yes, I guess he did make me better. I can go outside now again at least. It was very hard to stay in there. But I didn't feel like I had a cold. It was true. Walter was rarely ill, but now and then he would have a small cold. It was always resolved within a day or two and consisted only of a cough, sore throat and runny nose. There was never a stomach ache, and his throat was always his main complaint. He had none of those symptoms now. And although she was hardly a doctor, Lydia wondered if the doctor that had looked at Walter had misdiagnosed him. She wanted him to take another look. Walter had always been healthy until now, but with his continued exhaustion and the stomach pains, she wondered all over again if there was something more serious at play. Saying a silent prayer, she exhaled the hope that it was nothing more than too many sweets. Tabitha had made a great number of treats for him when he was bedridden. Maybe whatever stomach pain he had before was resolved, and now he was aching from all of the cakes and treats he had been eating. Well, whatever is causing you to feel ill, I think we should have the doctor take another look at you. He will tell us what's really going on and how we can get you better. Does that sound good? she asked. I suppose so. But I don't like the way he smells, like some really strong medicine, Walter said. Lydia tried not to laugh. She had noticed it as well. There was a strange, sickly, sweet odour about the doctor that had put her stomach a bit on edge as well like a blend of licorice and cherry, but stronger and with a sharper edge. But doctors were always smelling of their concoctions and tinctures. Yeah, do you think you can handle his smell long enough to get better? She asked. I suppose so, he replied. With that, they made their way back to the estate. Lydia suppressed all of her conscience and just chose to enjoy the moment she was having with her brother. Snap. After all, there was no telling when it might be her last. Chapter 26 The decision had been made. Henry was ready to take the next step. Perhaps he was being foolish, but he had made up his mind, and he was not going to back down this time. He would not second-guess himself and be stopped from moving forward. Arthur, are you ready? he asked again. Arthur sighed and put on his coat, taking his time to straighten the collar. Yes, I am ready. For what, I do not know. 
I can't understand your mystery here. Why don't you just tell me what's going on? Arthur asked. I shall. When we get there, I'll tell you everything. But it doesn't make sense for me to tell you everything now. Lord and Lady Lambton will be able to help if I'm right, and I want us all to figure it out together. If I tell you now, you will only discourage me and say I'm being foolish, Henry said. Then I shall tell you now. You are being foolish. I don't know what you're being foolish about, but I guarantee that you are, Arthur said, grinning to himself for the statement. Right. Anyway, I'm ready, Arthur said. Let's go. They got into the coach and headed for Lord and Lady Lambton's estate. It had been two days since the party, and the decorations had already been wiped clean. No sign of a bonfire or mask was in sight. Henry marvelled at how quickly everything had been taken care of. Welcome, welcome, they were greeted when they entered. I am delighted you were able to come for a visit, Lady Lambton said. Thank you, it is our pleasure, Henry replied. They followed her to the drawing room, where her husband was already seated. Lord Lambton put his book down once they entered, and he stood to greet them. Ah, gentlemen, do have a seat. Betty, please bring the tea, he instructed. Now, to what do we owe this visit? Lady Lambton asked once everyone had seated themselves. That is what I should like to know, Arthur added under his breath. It was rather rude, and Lord and Lady Lambton heard it as well, but they said nothing. All eyes went to Henry, who was clearly the mastermind behind the whole arrangement. Well, what I have to say may shock you all, and I have no evidence at all. So I do understand if you believe me to be mad, but I'm certain I have discovered a terrible secret. One that I need help to uncover, he began. Lord Lambton leaned back in discomfort just as his wife drew forward in intrigue, a delighted light playing behind her eyes. A terrible secret, she repeated. Indeed, he confirmed. Arthur looked confused, but at least he didn't appear to find Henry crazy. I imagine you must recall the mysterious young woman in the silver gown who attended the ball the other evening, he asked. Lord Lambton nodded, curious. Lady Lambton was a bundle of delight at the gossip. Arthur, on the other hand, simply looked confused all over again. The Countess Birkenstock? he asked. Birkenstock. Lady Lambton laughed. She never gave us a name, but I would have recalled that. Henry gave Arthur an amused expression. Forgive me. It was a silly alias to give. But I am glad you believed me. But what about her? You said you didn't know her, Arthur pressed. Her identity is a grand mystery, because she is a mere governess, Henry said. Lady Lambton took in a sharp breath, as if embarrassed that a servant should have come to her ball. Meanwhile, her husband appeared dubious that Henry had allowed this to go on without warning anyone. Except I do not believe her to be. You see, she is more than that, he continued. Please, just be out with it, Lord Lambton instructed. She told me her name was Lydia Marsh. But I believe she is truly Lydia Stanley, the daughter of the late Earl of Canwick, he dropped. The three each became like statues, taking in his words with disbelief. It was just as Henry had hoped. A shocking enough revelation that they would listen and need to know more. It was just terrible enough to bring them all to listening with eager ears. Whatever do you mean? Lady Lambton asked. Exactly as I've said. Miss Marsh has been forced into the shadows of the estate. She is acting as the Earl's governess, but her features are almost identical to his, and she cares for him as a sister would. And Lydia Stanley has suddenly vanished to the home of relatives, and yet no one knows who or where or any such detail. It stands to reason that... Henry trailed off, knowing that once he made the accusation, there was no taking it back. It stands to reason that the Lady Canwick had orchestrated the disappearance of her stepdaughter by hiding her in plain sight, he finally said. The intrigue was palpable in the room. Henry was frightened that he would be ordered to leave told that he ought to be ashamed for accusing a noblewoman of this type of action. But instead, Lord Lambton leaned forward with concern. You really believe this to be true? he asked. I do, Henry confirmed. 
Does Lady Arabella know about this? Arthur asked in horror. I think she does not realise the extent of her mother's actions, that she has not noted how terrible they are, Henry answered. Yes, it would not surprise me if she hadn't thought through the realities of it, Lady Lambton nodded. I must confess that I am in shock, Lord Lambton said. We cared a great deal for that family, and if she has been here under our very noses, I am ashamed that I was not aware and did nothing to help. As am I, his wife agreed. I feel terrible that we didn't know about this. We could have done something. Well, now we all can, Henry said. Now is our chance to make things right, to fix what happened, to rescue her and make everything as it should be. What do you propose? Lady Lambton asked. We must storm over there this instant, Lord Lambton said. We have to see if this is true. We need to lay our eyes on her immediately. I remember what she looked like. We can resolve this right now. Henry respectfully shook his head. I think that such an approach would not work with the Countess. She is calculating. Forgive me for the use of that word, but I fear it is none too harsh. She even accused me of impropriety for having been in the gardens with the young woman. Nothing immoral occurred, but it was a strategy to threaten us both, he shared. She did such a thing? Lord Lambton asked. Arthur looked at Henry with a raised eyebrow, as if to ask if they had really remained chaste. Henry rolled his eyes at his friend, hoping the noble couple before them would not notice. It was just like Arthur to wonder if anything improper had taken place. So what do you propose? Lady Lambton asked. I believe we ought to show up at the estate, not storming in and demanding answers. I am certain more lies would be spun. But if we go and simply declare a visit to Stanley Hall, there would be no opportunity to hide Lady Lydia, he said. And then you wish for us to ask for her? Show that we recognise her and begin talking to her in front of her stepmother, Lady Lambton asked. I imagine she will not be in plain sight. They cannot send her out at that moment, but it does not mean they will freely let her around us. Again, the Countess is clever, he said. So, I propose that you, Lady Lambton, excuse yourself. The Countess will be forced to remain and entertain the three men. Lady Arabella shall remain, of course, as her mother is seeking a wealthy husband for her, he continued, laying out what he had put together as a plan the day before. Lady Lambton, you must make your way to Walter's rooms. You shall find Lady Lydia and confirm that it is her. Once you do that, we can move forward. We can rescue her from the house that very moment, and she shall be free, Henry declared. I think that should do just fine, Lady Lambton said. And she would be welcome to stay here with us. Once we get her out of there, she will need a place to live, I imagine. We can provide that. Can't we, Lord Lambton? Certainly we must. It is our duty, both to her and her late parents. Lady Lydia must be freed, and if we are not the ones to do it, no one is, he agreed. Then it is all settled. Do you think we may go now? Henry asked, hoping they would be as enthusiastic as he was. Absolutely, let us go, Lady Lambton insisted. And how will we make sure to protect her reputation? Arthur chimed in just as the others stood. There has to be something that can be done, Lord Lambton said. I should be terribly ashamed if we rescue her only to have her name slandered after. Yes, there is something, I am sure of it. The Countess is not loved by many circles, forgive me for saying so, but there are those women who love to gossip, and she is often the subject of it. She seems nice enough, but we all know she worked hard to marry into her wealth and had no love for either of her husbands, Lady Lambton added. Henry was surprised by her willingness to share this gossip in front of gentlemen. Typically, this was reserved for the ladies at tea time, but at that moment, he was glad she confirmed that no one would be unwilling to hear a word against the Countess. I only say that to ensure you we can protect Lady Lydia's reputation by reminding society of her stepmothers. It is far from a perfect plan, but it is something. Henry nodded. With that, the four of them stood again, and they made their way to the door. Relieved that he was finally able to do something about all of this, Henry stood tall and secure. And despite his outward confidence, he still had a terrible knot in his gut, 
warning him that things may not go as planned. He hoped there would be a light at the end of this. He hoped Lady Lydia would be free within the hour. But he was no fool. Oftentimes plans did not go as he wished. Still, with Lord and Lady Lambton at his side, he felt stronger. The Countess could not dispute so many names with such high clout in London. It would be a terrible idea for her to even try. Henry sat in the coach with Arthur, riding just behind that which held Lord and Lady Lambton. Soon Stanley Hall came into view, and he knew it was almost time. His stomach continued to churn, but he looked at Arthur and hoped for the best. Do you really think she was ignorant of it all? Arthur asked, speaking of Lady Arabella. I think if she had understood the full circumstances and the cruelty, she would not have gone along with it all. She's a good woman, if not a little bit naive, Henry said. You think she is naive? Arthur asked. Henry tried not to smile at that. He thought it was not only Lady Arabella who was. Arthur could be terribly ignorant at times as well. But he was hardly one to tell his friend that. Why don't we move forward with our plan and figure out the rest? he suggested. And with that, he made himself ready. Chapter 27 The room held only the laughter of the Countess and Arabella. Lydia was sitting in the corner, mending a hem for her stepmother, when they heard the sound of carriages outside. She hadn't known they were expecting anyone. The Countess looked up, surprised. Now who could that be? she asked. Arabella stood and ran to the window. She threw her hands together in delight and turned to her mother. Oh, how wonderful! Not one, but two carriages. Who is it, mother? It is Lord and Lady Lambton with Lord Ranton and Lord Whitecroft. Arabella exclaimed, narrating each thing she saw and saying it all with great eagerness. The Countess grinned with conceit, but then looked over at Lydia, her smile faltering. She made her way to the window and looked as if to confirm what her daughter was saying. Indeed, indeed they have all come, she said, turning to Lydia. What do you think they want? Are they here to visit? Or are they accompanying Lord Rye, mean Lord Whitecroft, for a proper sal? Arabella asked it, her hopes high. The Countess turned her gaze to her own daughter. If a proposal is to come, it ought to come from Lord Whitecroft himself. He needn't an entourage and you had better do well to remember to whom you are meant to be wed. I'll not have any foolish lions in my den, the Countess warned. Arabella nodded sadly. With that, the Countess turned back to Lydia and eyed her with resignation. Knowing what was next, Lydia stood and followed her stepmother up the stairs. You needn't lock me away, she said. I can stay out of sight, or I can go to the kitchen and help cook but you needn't put me in my room where I'm trapped and cannot even breathe the air of the house. You have proven that I do, and I have told you, if you do not comply, there shall be consequences. Be glad that you may live here as long as I shall let you. Your Lord Whitecroft will not be married to Arabella in the next few months, so you still have time. It is only after that when you must be gone, she said. But I shall still see Walter, Lydia asked. So long as I obey and do what you ask, I shall be allowed to see Walter. Now and then. And only when Lord Whitecroft is gone. But yes, I shall allow you to see Walter so long as you continue to obey me, she confirmed. When do you expect Lord Whitecroft and Arabella to wed? Just so I am prepared for when the time comes, Lydia asked, amusing herself but keeping her face downtrodden for her stepmother's benefit. Oh, soon, I am sure. Perhaps within the next six months. We must arrange a formal courtship, but upon that we will ensure that things happen quickly, the Countess replied. And he had declared his interest, Lydia asked. The Countess hesitated, not realising she was being toyed with. He has. A number of dances have confirmed that. And she is the most beautiful young woman in society. There is no reason he should ever desire another. It is only the fear of hurting his friend that has prevented him thus far from declaring his intentions, she stated. Lydia nodded as if sad for her stepsister. Well, I am sure it shall all come together soon enough, Lydia said, as if being supportive. 
The Countess looked at her with something akin to appreciation. She was believing Lydia's every word as if it were genuine. How strange that someone so good at manipulation could be so easily manipulated. Yes, yes, I imagine it shall. And with your cooperation it shall be easier than previously expected. We need only get that Lord Ranton out of the way, and Lord Whitecroft shall declare his affections, she confirmed. How do you intend to remove Lord Ranton? Lydia asked. Oh, we need to invite Lord Whitecroft without his friend, find another young woman for him to marry, and convince Arabella to drop him even if it hurts. Any of those would work just fine, but regardless, I need him out of the way before Lord Whitecroft will be comfortable proposing, she continued. Lydia was surprised that her stepmother had been so forthcoming, standing there in the doorway sharing these thoughts. It only convinced her further that she had been successful in her efforts to behave as though she were complying. If Lydia could continue pretending to do as she was told, she might learn a great deal. But for now, the conversation had ended. Once Lydia entered the room, the Countess locked her in. The turn of the key was a fate that left Lydia feeling broken, and she grimaced in the knowledge that she was not allowed even the freedom to walk outside. She had to remain hidden away when the man she was growing to love was just downstairs. Would he ask after her, or would that be a great risk? She oughtn't to hope for that, she knew. But she decided to sit on her bed, not having anything else to do. Sitting and waiting was all there was left for her. This was what her life was to be like. Always locked away. She would never have the ability to come and go as she pleased. Even once she was forced out of the house, no matter the reason behind it, she would be locked away. Allowed to come only when there was no one around to tell. Of course, even if the Marquess did not feel for Lydia as she felt for him, she could not imagine him marrying Arabella. But the Countess believed otherwise, and it was not up to Lydia to try and convince her of that. She could make a fool of herself with Lydia's help. And yet if the Countess could make her do this, Lydia realised there was no way to stop her from anything. The Countess could make Lydia disappear entirely. It would be easy for her to do. And once Lydia had vanished, the Countess could take anything that had been set aside for her. Anything left of her inheritance would be gone. Oh, you wouldn't, would you? Lydia asked the Countess, speaking only to herself. She sat, imagining what else could happen. If she disappeared, no one would ever know what happened to her. They would think her dead or run off and away. The Countess could spin any lie. And people would believe it because they would have no evidence to the contrary. She had been long gone from society, long forgotten as it was. And already the Countess had taken everything from her. But there was still Walter. The Countess treated him with so much attention. It was not the loving sort that Lydia felt for him but a watching eye, the kind that waited for whatever might come next, any opportunity to strike. It was a terrible thing to say about the Countess, but it was just the thing Lydia saw of her. She didn't imagine that her stepmother would ever hurt Walter, but if she could make Lydia disappear, what if she tried to ruin him as well? What if she told lies to turn society against him? What if she sent him away to school and he returned to find his fortune spent? <laughs> there were a great many things that could be done without hurting him. Lydia could not leave him. If she tried to escape, she would never run and leave Walter behind to that woman. The lies and the manipulations had already begun. Where would they end? She couldn't allow for it. But taking him with her. If Lydia ran and took Walter, the Countess would be able to accuse her of kidnapping. And she would be right. Lydia had no legal rights over Walter. She was his sister, not his mother. That was no choice at all either. No, Lydia was stuck. She just imagined how it would pan out if she did try, however. If she put Walter on Roderick, and she mounted her own horse, and the two of them rode off together, they could disappear into Scotland. They could ride far away north and make a new life for themselves. Lydia grinned, imaging it. Nonsense, of course. The Scots hated the English. Still, they would probably fare better there than in Stanley Hall. If only she could hear what was being spoken of below. 
or if she could get word to Tabitha, and Tabitha somehow signalled the Marquis. If only she had an option of some sort to escape with her dignity and with Walter at her side. The silence was unbearable and suffocating. Lydia wanted out. She wanted to escape the room, to join the others, to be free of the tyranny she was under. But there was nothing that could be done but wait. Chapter 28 The Countess did not walk to greet Henry. She floated. A welcoming grin on her face, Henry sensed she was desperate to make him forget the confrontation at the ball. My lord, I am delighted you have come, she said. Then, in a low voice only he could hear, she continued. I worried that my words at the masquerade had offended you. You must forgive me, for I was terribly frightened that you thought ill of me. Henry pasted a false smile of his own on his lips and shook his head. Oh, nothing of the sort. It was all a misunderstanding, I am sure, he replied, amazed she would try to believe that after what had taken place between them. I am glad to hear it. You know, I truly would like for you and my daughter to get to know one another better. If I had done anything to prevent that from taking place, I should never forgive myself, she added. You needn't fear it, he said. The Countess drew back and addressed all of them. If we had known that we would be hosting a small party, we certainly would have prepared better. You must all forgive us, she insisted. Oh, my dear Countess, it is we who must apologise. We were terribly rude in showing up without sending a note ahead. Surely you must understand that we simply made the decision to come to you before we thought it through, Lady Lambton insisted, her words dripping with flattery. Henry noted what a tremengoose actress she was. The Countess was beaming with arrogance at the remark. She placed a hand upon her chest as if moved by the fact that they had so desired her company. It is true. I would have done the same, sent a note if I had thought about it. It's just that we have all become such good neighbours that I honestly didn't think it was necessary, Arthur added. With that, Lady Canwick appeared even more overwhelmed. As if their words were her only sustenance, she drank them in. It was all Henry could do not to laugh at her, for foolishly indulging in such pride. Well, you must all relax. Tabitha, bring the tea, she ordered adding the last bit with a less pleasant voice. Thank you for hosting Us with such kindness, Arthur said. It is an honour, the Countess continued. With everyone seated and the tea brought, Henry leaned back and allowed the others to carry the conversation. After the confrontation with the Countess, he had worried that she would be suspicious of his coming. It appeared she had other things on her mind. She continually looked at him after her every statement her expression questioning, as if trying to determine whether or not he approved. He smiled as much as he could, but didn't want to say anything that jeopardised their mission. And Arabella is looking lovely as ever today, is she not? the Countess asked, looking at Henry once more. Henry turned his face to Arthur, expecting him to answer. As ever, Arthur confirmed, his eyes trained on the young woman. My lord? the Countess prompted. Henry turned his face back to her and saw that she wanted his response. Wondering why she cared about his approval of her daughter, he nodded enthusiastically. Oh yes, she is lovely, he said. But Henry knew his voice betrayed him. The words were an afterthought, meant only to appease her. The Countess looked sour for a moment, but then righted her expression. Well, I am glad that men of taste can see that. Although, I would have hoped I needn't be the one to address it, she laughed gently, trying to pass off the insult. Pardon me, Lady Lambton said, standing. Oh, is there something you need, Lady Lambton? the Countess asked. Henry's heart raced. There were few good reasons for a woman to depart the room in another's home. Lady Lambton looked embarrassed, managing to force a blush into her cheeks. Oh, well, forgive me. I don't mean to be rude. I simply... Lady Lambton trailed off and then added in a whisper. I need to use the privy. 
Henry bit his lips together from the inside to stop from laughing. He recognised that Arthur was having the same struggle and had to look away from his friend before they both burst into laughter. The Countess looked embarrassed and somewhat appalled. She ought not to have asked why a lady would depart the room. Of course, she would need to use the lavatory. What other reason was there? In their case, there was a very good reason. But they did not wish for the Countess to know that. As Lady Lambton departed, the others continued in their conversation about the weather and how nice November was shaping up to be. It was a bit of a farce, Henry thought. The cold was already brutal, and there was nothing nice about it. Ten minutes had passed, and the Countess looked to the white door of the room as if expecting an arrival. Henry saw her eyes squint ever so slightly in question. Was she wondering about Lady Lambton? Are you expecting any other guests, Countess? Have we come at an inconvenient time? Henry dared to ask. Ah, uh, startled, she looked back at him and took in a deep breath. No, no, I am not. I was just thinking. I do hope Lady Lambton has not gotten lost, she replied. I'm sure she has found where she is meant to go, replied Lord Lambton. I do hope so, the Countess said, still eyeing the door. Ansiti bit into Henry's goot with teeth that felt like glass. What was taking Lady Lambton so long? What if the Countess sent a servant after her to check on her? He didn't know whether or not the servants were loyal to the Countess. If so, their entire plan could fall apart. Countess, I did wonder if you enjoyed your time at our masquerade, Lord Lambton cleverly interjected. We know you are a woman of great taste and hoped you had a terrific time. Preening, the Countess nodded slowly as if she had to consider. Well, I cannot say I had ever imagined celebrating a holiday from the heathens to the north. But it was a surprising joy, she told him, slipping in an insult just to make herself appear both pious and of a high taste. Lord Lambton's face was flat, and Henry wasn't sure if the Earl understood that the Countess had truly enjoyed herself. Could he not read her false behaviours? Well, I hope it was pleasing enough, Lord Lambton said, not sure what else there was to say. Lady Arabella, did you enjoy it? Henry asked, trying to keep the conversation going. She glanced at her mother, who gave the slightest of nods, a means of granting her permission. Lady Arabella was allowed to share how delightful she found the event to be. Truly it was magnificent. I had the greatest time and should love for you to host another ball or another masquerade in the future. Perhaps every year on that holiday. Oh, but I should hate to have to wait a full year, she gushed. Lord Lambton smiled, glad that someone in the room had enjoyed the ball. Henry saw how Lady Arabella looked over at Arthur again, repeatedly and with desire. It was a shame her mother was so against the match, something he was only now beginning to realise. I am glad to hear that it was a delight to you. Yes, I suppose another ball would be nice in the coming few months and a yearly masquerade would certainly give my wife an excuse to indulge in her love of extravagance, he commented. Yes, your wife, the Countess cut in. I do hope she is all right. Do you think I ought to send someone to look after her? It is possible she has been lost. Do you think she might be? I should hate it if something happened to her, she commented. I'm sure she's simply taking the time to check her appearance. My wife always spends an eternity doing so, Lord Lambton said casually. Henry admired the ease with which the Earl said this, how smoothly he was able to deceive the Lady Canwick. Although he would never want to be known as a liar, he saw how beneficial it was in this moment. They had to preserve Lady Lambton's ability to move freely about the estate. Perhaps I ought to go and check, the Countess said, beginning to stand. Henry's heart thudded in his chest. This was it. They were going to be found out. They were going to lose their opportunity to save the woman he was falling for. Forgive me, I got a bit turned around, came a voice in the doorway. Henry turned, and there stood Lady Lambton, flushed but otherwise calm. She seated herself across from the Countess, a confidence in her gaze that Henry could never muster. Making herself comfortable, she asked a simple question. Now what did I miss? Chapter 29 Lydia could hardly believe what had just taken place. Finally, 
a breath of freedom was blowing in her direction. Things might actually start to come together. Was it possible? A knock had come to her door. Imagining that it was Tabitha, Lydia had called out. Tabitha! Tabitha, I'm here! she cried. It's me, Tabitha replied. I've been locked in. I don't know what to do. She's locked me in here, and I don't think I shall ever be released, Lydia mourned. It's all right. Everything is going to be fine, Tabitha insisted. But how? She will never let me go, Lydia replied. I have Lady Lambton with me, Tabitha replied through the door. Shocked and amazed, Lydia was silent. Are you there? Tabitha asked. Y yes, I am here, she replied, relief flooding her chest. Lydia? came the voice of Lady Lambton. She could hardly believe it was true. Yes, I am here, she replied. Are you the daughter of the late Earl of Canwick? Are you Lydia Stanley? Lady Lambton asked. I am, she replied with confidence. The very same young woman who attended our masquerade, she continued. I did, Lydia told her desperately. Have you any proof, any evidence that you are the same young woman we have heard about? Lady Lambton asked next. Lydia looked around, trying to think what proof she had. Was there any evidence? And how could she then prove she was the daughter of the Earl? Was it enough for them to know that she was the same young woman the Marquess had told them about? Give me just one moment, she requested, running over to her chest. Searching the contents of the drawers, Lydia finally pulled out the best thing she could find to prove her identity. A mask. Ironic, to be sure, but this tool for hiding oneself was the only proof she had. I have my mask from the masquerade. Will that suffice? You saw me with it. The Marquess of Whitecroft knows it was I who wore it. Ask him, she urged. I intend to, Lady Lambton replied. Can you slide it under the door? Lydia crouched low and wedged the mask under the space between the door and the floor. Once it was through, she waited, hoping for a verdict. I recall this mask. I shall show it to the Marquess as well. But I promise you, Lady Canwick, you shall be freed soon. We are going to do all we can to ensure it. Are you able to wait until we can return? She asked. I shall, but please, please come back soon, Lydia begged. I shall do everything within my power, Lady Lambton promised. Here, I am sliding something back for you, a letter from the Marquis. Be of good heart, all will be well. With that, Lady Lambton and Tabitha departed, leaving Lydia on her bed to wait. Lydia grabbed the letter from the floor and opened it as quickly as she was able. Dear Lady Canwick, we wish to help you in any way that we can. I'm terribly sorry for all that you are facing, but we shall not rest until it is righted. I shall not be at peace until you are a free woman. I must urge you to stay where you are. I understand that perhaps you are not able to remain in your rooms as you go about as though all is normal. But you must await news from us. And I my thoughts are with you as they always have been and ever shall be. Henry Radcliffe, Marquess of Whitecroft. She could scarcely believe it, even now. The very fact that she had heard the knock on her door had been a great fortune. But it was more than that. Help was coming. Help was on its way. And Lydia was going to be rescued. And her life would finally be something like she had once thought. And the Marquis had written to promise it. When she'd been young, Lydia had imagined that things would be good, that she would have a future and a fortune and everything would be well. But nothing had turned out that way. Her father's death had prevented it all from coming together. Now she was finally tasting hope again. Now she was finally seeing that a future was possible and there could be joy in her life. If everything truly did work out as she wished, if she was given the opportunity to move forward, she could be Lady Canwick. She could be known as the daughter of the late Earl of Canwick again. She could be restored to her title, and it was possible she could even have freedom with Walter. Oh, she hoped they would hurry. She hoped they would come back to her soon. Being locked away was a terrible fate, and she didn't think she could stand another moment of it. Lydia wondered if the Marquis of Whitecroft knew yet that she was up there. Was he waiting for her? Had he really arranged all of this? 
and what was their plan now? Would they come storming up the stairs to rescue her, or would they be patient and wait for a moment when the Countess was not paying attention? She wished she had asked Lady Lambton more questions. Whatever hope she felt was mingled with the tension and anxiety of her unknowns. It was going to be a dreadful period of waiting if she were forced to remain even another day. And Lydia thought they would likely go to the constable, but even then, she realised she was not immediately free. There would be a great deal to work through. But she had to cling to hope. It was the first sense of hope she'd felt in a very long time. It was all she had. Footsteps clacked against the wooden floor outside her room again, and Lydia perked up. She quickly put the letter she had been holding into her bosom, tucked away where she might keep it forever. Was it them? Had they come? Were they rescuing her? A key turned in the lock, painfully slow. She looked up at the ceiling as if to God and prayed she was about to be released. The door opened. To her agonising dismay, it was her stepmother. They have gone. You may come out now, the Countess announced. Lydia could not form an expression for her face. Nothing would convey what she felt, and she was too tired for a false smile. Thank you, stepmother. Did you have a good visit? she asked, rising from her bed and making her way towards the door. The countess still stood before her, looming and blocking her path. Yes, she replied stiffly. Lady Canwick's eyes held suspicion as they gazed on Lydia. A very nice visit. I am relieved to hear it, and I do hope Arabella enjoyed it as well. Since you have high intentions for her, I hope she's able to indulge in them, Lydia remarked in as genuine a voice as she could muster. Arabella had a splendid time, with two men conveying their interest and vying for her affections. I think she had quite a lovely visit, she replied. Well then, I am glad, Lydia said again. She stepped close enough that the Countess moved from the frame of the door. There was somewhere she had to go. Lydia knew everything would take place without her being aware of when. She had to be ready. She had to make sure she could leave at a moment's notice when rescue arrived. That meant she had to take Walter with her. There was no other choice than to go and collect him as quickly as possible and take him to a safe space where they could wait until help came. Lydia had every intention of doing this, but to her dismay, the Countess put an arm horizontally in front of her, causing Lydia to step back. Where are you off to so quickly? she asked. Lydia turned to her and looked at her stepmother with wide, innocent eyes. It is time for Walter's lessons, Lydia responded, trying to act the dutiful governess. Not so fast, the Countess said, grabbing her arm. She yanked Lydia hard, causing her to cry out in pain. Twisting to be free of her stepmother's grip, Lydia bent forward. In a realisation of horror, Lydia saw the note on the floor. It had fallen from her chest. What is this? the Countess demanded. Nothing! Lydia cried out as the Countess unfolded the paper and read the words. Fury scrawled upon her face. You call this nothing? she demanded. You cannot keep me here forever. Lydia insisted, tears filling her eyes. She had to be free. She could not be locked away again. A bitter smile found Lady Canwick's lips. No, and I shall not, which is the very next thing I wish to tell you. You will not be going to teach Walter anything. You are being transferred, away from here. He does not need you, nor do I, the Countess said. What do you mean? Lydia asked in horror. Her hoarse voice was barely above a whisper. I mean, you are no longer in charge of Walter and his lessons. Is that difficult for you to comprehend? She retorted. But why not? He is my brother. I have done well, Lydia said. I have found you new employment, one which shall be better suited for us all. You will not be here and you shall be free of this estate as you have just told me you wish. You are going to the North Country immediately. Does that suit you? the Countess asked rhetorically. You can't do that, Lydia said. Of course I can, the Countess replied, snapping her fingers. Up the stairs, Lydia saw Colin Anders, one of the manservants, coming. 
Large and meaty, he looked at her with conflict in his eyes. Lydia knew this man. He had worked for her father. He had been around during a good part of her upbringing. But he worked for the Countess now. He had no choice, and she understood that. They had never spoken much. It would not have been proper. She could not accuse him of betrayal, for he had never owed her his loyalty. But even in the midst of that, Lydia could not help feeling angry as he grasped her wrist to lead her away. No! Lydia screamed, pulling her arm. It was too tight in his grip, and she felt the tendons stretch farther than they were meant to. You can't do this! she continued, yelling as she clawed at the air. Colin grabbed her at the waist. It was terribly improper, but he was following orders. From there, he threw Lydia over his shoulder and carried her down the stairs. Tabitha stood by the main entrance weeping, and a few of the other maids watched the spectacle with horror. Lydia tried to plead with them through eye contact, but they all looked away, save for Tabitha. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she whimpered. Lydia tried to look at Colin's face, but could see only his cheek, reddened with shame, from the angle. No one was going to stop him. No one could help her. Nothing was ever going to be the same again. Rescue had come too late. Chapter 30 What a foolish plan it had been. Margaret had worked hard to get where she was. Becoming the Countess of Canwick had been no easy feat. And they thought they could trick her like this? That she would not recognise that Lydia was trying to escape? Of course, she had never imagined that nobility would go in on it. That they would believe a young woman, someone she had put into a position as a governess and this meant he would never marry Arabella. That plan was gone now, an empty, hollow dream. It was perhaps one of the bitterest parts of it all. The whole thing was appalling. They were trying to rise up against her as if she had done something wrong in the midst of all of this. But Margaret knew the truth. She was the victim here. She was the one fighting for any chance at happiness. Margaret was furious. Lydia had actually planned to move forward in all of this. She had to be destroyed, her desire to leave, the evident affection she felt towards the Marquis. It had to be ended. It wasn't fair that she should find what Margaret had longed for. It had been years since she was married. First, to that waste of a man that gave her Arabella, and then working her way up to the Earl of Canwick. A secondary disappointment that had been... It was not long before the Earl had shown his mutual disappointment in their union. He often spoke of his first wife and always wanted to be with his daughter. And then they had a son, and he always preferred him to Margaret. She had suffered for all of this, and now she found herself in danger of losing it. All of this prosperity was now at risk. But this was not only a matter for Margaret. She wasn't the only one who had placed all of their hopes on this. He had to be warned. Rushing to her desk, Margaret pulled out a clean sheet of paper and dipped her pen into the ink that lay beside her. My love, I'm writing to you with a shaking hand. I'm afraid we are facing a serious predicament. The four of them had barely departed Stanley Hall when Lady Lambton grasped Henry's arm with a great sense of urgency. My lord, she urged. Henry looked at her in reply with his heart pounding. They had made it out. They had escaped unscathed. And Lady Lambton had done her part. He was sure of it. Now he had to know what she had learned. There had to be hope. Yes, what is it? What happened? He begged. She said you would recognise this, Lady Lambton whispered. She pulled a silver-winged mask from her bag, the very same mask Lydia Marsh had worn to the ball. He was sure of it. This was hers. His racing heart slowed to a half as the mask was placed in his hand. It was an answer of sorts. Not quite the rescue he had hoped for, but the beginning of one. They would be able to come back for her. I too remember it, Lady Lambton said. I remember her the night of the masquerade, but there had been something familiar about it, something I only pieced together as I came back down the stairs and into the parlour. He looked at her curiously. What was it? Henry asked. 
I have seen that dress before. The one that the woman wore to the masquerade. That Lady Lydia wore, I mean. She was not the first Lady Canwick to wear it. Her mother, the former Lady Canwick. She wore it once to a ball we hosted during a London season, many years ago, Lady Lambton revealed. Shocked, Henry could hardly believe it. It's her? he asked. Yes, and you'd best go quickly. She has been locked in her room. It is shameful. We must get her out of there, Lady Lambton insisted. Locked in. The woman who had enthralled him had been locked away, trapped in her own home. The Countess had done everything within her power to ruin the young woman's life, hidden away and out of his grasp. Henry helped Lady Lambton into the carriage and climbed in after. He could scarcely believe it as they made their way from the estate, knowing that Lady Lydia had endured such a great manner of cruelty. Lady Lydia. Not just another Lady Canwick, not a Miss Marsh. She was Lydia Stanley, daughter of the late Earl of Canwick, and he would be back for her soon. Are you certain? Once we do this, it cannot be undone. The Lady Canwick might be terribly upset, the constable reminded them. We are ready for whatever wrath she may throw our way, Henry confirmed. The constable inhaled deeply, his anxiety as palpable as the rest of theirs. I hope you are, because I have heard that she has an unpleasant temper, he replied. Henry nodded. It was shocking that the Countess had such a reputation in society and yet was still so much a part of it. And how had it not been discussed sooner? Had he truly managed to avoid gossip so well that he had known nothing of her behaviour, or had everyone simply thought this individually without discussing it? Upon exiting the coach, heart pounding and forehead perspiring, Henry looked to the door of the estate and saw that it was already opening. The others joined him in watching, as the Countess exited and descended the stairs to meet them outside, rather than welcome them in. Her face looked pinched, and Henry thought she must know that something was going on by now. My goodness, this is rather a sight. Did the four of you forget something from your earlier visit? Something which required a man of the law? I can't imagine what has brought you all back, she stated, with a vague threat in her voice. Lady Canwick, the constable began, I fear there is something which must be addressed. May we come inside? I rather think not she answered shortly. The five visitors exchanged nervous glances before the constable raised his courage to meet hers. Henry willed the man to do his best, to be strong in the face of the terrible woman. Lady Canwick, if you prefer, we may discuss it out here, but it shall be addressed, he said. And what exactly must be addressed? That I welcomed my neighbours into my home this very afternoon? That I am an upstanding citizen of England? That I am a widow who is trying to do her best? she asked, playing to pity. It is actually a matter related to your late husband, my lady, regarding his daughter. She has not been seen in quite some time, and evidence has arisen that suggests you have locked her away and stripped her of all position, he finally said. The Countess threw a hand to her chest and her jaw dropped in horror. Her chin quivered as a gasp escaped her lips. What did you say? Are you suggesting that I would be so cruel? Have I not given an explanation, time and time again, for the whereabouts of my late husband's daughter? I have done nothing but care for her from afar, she began. I should love nothing more than to see her again. But unfortunately, my dear Lydia has gone to stay with relatives and has chosen not to return of late. Please know that I should like nothing more than to see her again. She is quite a dear, the Countess told them her expression one of grand emotion. It is believed you have made her a servant, the constable retorted. A servant? How could I do such a thing in her own home? Please, I shall invite you in. Search the house. You'll find no trace of her. She's not here, nor has she been in a matter of years. Please do come in, she said with a display of innocence. I believe we must, the constable said. The troop followed the Countess into the estate, where she stood by, gesturing for them to search as they pleased. Follow me, Lady Lambton ordered. The Countess remained by the entrance of the estate, as Henry, Arthur, Lord Lambton 
and the constable all followed Lady Lambton. Henry found himself growing eager with excitement. They were going to find her. Not only would he see Lady Lydia again, but he would rescue her. He would be able to tell her how he worked to get her freed. She might find some gratitude towards him or be impressed by him. It might endear him to her. That was truly all he wanted. Up the stairs they trailed, and Lady Lambton seemed exquisitely confident. Henry was delighted that their plan had worked. Where do you suppose Lady Arabella is? Arthur asked in a whisper, leaning over to Henry. I do not know, but we can find out after. First we must rescue Lady Lydia, Henry insisted. Arthur nodded but looked chastised. Henry felt bad, but he was greatly determined and would not give up until Lady Lydia was with them. It was just up ahead here, Lady Lambton said. They crested the stairs and reached a closed door. Lady Lambton looked to Henry, wanting to give him the joy of finding her first. Henry took in an excited breath as his hand reached the door handle. The smooth brass twisted easily in his hand, and the door gave a mild groan as it opened. He looked inside with a grin on his face and felt his heart sink. Lady Lambton, he asked. What is it? she asked excitedly, coming up close behind him. Before them the room was empty. All grew silent and the five stared into the empty space. Are you certain this was the room, Lady Lambton? asked the constable. Be positive, she spluttered. There must be some mistake. The constable sighed. I had rather hoped to avoid this sort of situation, he said. But you do not understand, she insisted. No, indeed, I do not. The young woman is not here. And we have crossed a line with the Countess, he reminded her. But she was here just a matter of two hours ago, Lady Lambton insisted again. But she is not any longer, and if she truly had been here, there would surely be some sort of mark left behind. A young woman does not simply vanish along with her bed and clothing, the constable said. They must have moved everything, Lady Lambton said. How? How could they have done all of this in such a short time? The constable challenged. Determination, Henry said. The others looked at him, and he felt their gazes, although he met none of them. The floor looked back at him with no great sympathy. It was simply the only place his eyes could go. It seemed like hours that Henry's feet were dragging back down the stairs where they were met by the countess. An arrogant glare was in her eyes once more an appearance of being a victim. I shall see you out unless you have further accusations against me, she said. No, Lady Canwick, we have none to my knowledge, the constable replied. In that case, she said, opening the door and gesturing for them to leave. It does not have to be this way, Henry said as he passed by her. I beg your pardon? This is terribly humiliating. I thought you to be gentlemen and a lady but I have never been so embarrassed in all my life. Neighbours, you say? And this, this is what you think of me? I believed us to be friends, she continued to rant. Tabitha, she yelled, ordering the maid to come once more. Yes, Lady Canwick, Tabitha asked in fear. Her eyes rimmed red. She glanced at Henry as if trying to tell him something, but the Countess was watching her ever so close. See them out. I cannot bear to have such hateful people in my home, she ordered. Tabitha nodded and walked the group outside. Once they were alone, she spoke in an eager and hushed tone. She has been taken from the house, she said, still walking as though simply trying to get them to leave. Henry turned to her with interest, but tried not to give away what she was saying. He knew the Countess was likely watching, and any change in his posture would tell that Tabitha was giving them information. Taken, he asked, trying not to move his lips. Indeed, I do not know where or any of the details, but she was thrown in a carriage not long before you arrived. Immediately all of her belongings were stripped from the room. She had only a few. You must act quickly, she insisted. And with that, once more, Henry began to hope. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. 
Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Chapter 31 The doors of the carriage were locked. Once more, Lydia was unable to escape the prison of her stepmother's making. Once more, she was caught in a place she had not chosen. Once more, freedom was out of sight, and there was nothing to be done about it. She tried to look out the window. Trees, stripped of leaves, flew past her. But they were all a blur, and she could not tell where they were at or what was around them other than the rows of naked bark. She could not think of anything to do or any way of feeding herself. No, it was too late now. Lydia was stuck. But one thing that all of this had brought to her mind was Walter. He would not know where she had gone, and he might believe she had abandoned him. It was certainly the thing the Countess was most likely to tell him. She would lie if it suited her, and it always suited her. What if Walter really began to believe that Lydia had left him? How long would he trust that she had not done so of her own accord? How long? And in the midst of all of his illness, what if the Countess did not take good care of him? That last thought caused Lydia a great deal of concern. But worse, it caused a new question. What if the Countess was allowing something sinister to take place? What if Walter's health concerns were not at all a natural thing or the result of his fall in the river? Had he not said that he fell because he already felt ill? Had it not been his stomach more than just a cold? Lydia thought it was too horrible to imagine, too horrible to accuse. And yet, it began to make sense and grow somewhat clearer in her mind. All of these possibilities. Yes, Walter's life could have been in danger. His illnesses might have been the result of something sinister and wicked. These were the very sort of plans his mother loved to make. And Walter was not so lucrative as Arabella in terms of climbing higher in society and marrying into more wealth. Rather, he was in the way of the Countess accessing the fullness of the estate's fortune. Was it possible that a woman cruel enough to do all of this to her might even be willing to poison her own son? Was it possible that Lydia's closeness to Walter was a problem for the Countess? Was she in the way? All of the questions forged together. The Countess was a cruel woman. She was also determined. She loved her new fortune. She would let no one get in the way. And if that meant killing her own child and removing Lydia, why was it not possible that it was happening? The sound of horses was coming from behind, and Lydia leaned back in the coach listening to them. She wondered if it meant they were in a more populated area. Would anyone hear her if she screamed for help? Most likely, it would only cause the driver to punish her on her stepmother's behalf. But the sound grew closer, and the horses became more insistent. And Lydia recognised that something was happening. The driver sped forward, and she felt her body lift from the seat as they hit bumps along the way. A swerve took them to the left and Lydia shifted with it, hitting her head on the mercifully soft cushion of the seat. She looked out the window again, but it was all a bit of a blur. They narrowly missed another coach that was trying to block the path. Two carriages, a swish of a colourful gown, and the coattails of three no four men. Who was it? Could it possibly be the four that had come for her? And another man? Abruptly and with great force, the carriage jolted to a stop the horses ceasing in an instant. Lydia was very nearly thrown from her seat. At the setback of the coach, she leaned back and inhaled sharply. They had finally stilled. As the carriage stopped, the driver argued with the other, but the voices were muffled, and Lydia could not hear it in any great detail. She was desperate to know what was happening. She had to know. And then, in the midst of that, the door on the other side of the coach swung wide open. Lydia turned and saw, to her great delight, the face of the man she had found herself thinking of more and more frequently, the man who had brought her so much joy in the previous weeks. My lord, she exclaimed, the Marquis grinning in victorious relief. Lady Lydia, we have found you, we are here. Oh, forgive us for taking so long, we tried, we truly tried, he insisted. Lady Lydia threw her arms around him and Henry felt his heart grow warm at her touch. He held her and breathed in the scent of her. Wildflowers. Somehow, 
In the midst of being locked away, she smelled of wildflowers. After a moment, they pulled back from one another, but did not let each other go. She was still in his embrace, and Henry held her gaze with his own. As if their hearts beat as one, he sensed everything she was thinking and feeling. You're all right, he whispered, running his fingers along her cheek and down her jaw. Lady Lydia closed her eyes for the briefest second, a smile of contentment on her face. You're all right, he repeated. Lady Lydia, called Lord Lambton, interrupting the moment. Yes, it is her, Henry said, and now... Now we must go back, she yelled. The Marquis looked at her as though she were mad. She understood how rude her interruption had been, but Lydia could hardly care at that moment. They had to get back to the estate. They had to get Walter out of there. We have to go back. Walter is in danger. Please, we must go, she yelled. First, take my hand, the Marquis insisted. Lydia slipped her hand in his and allowed him to help her out of the coach. No matter how her heart raced in needing to return to the estate and find Walter, she knew there were other things that had to be dealt with first. She ought to have been embarrassed. Lydia had no shoes on her feet. She had been carried out in such a manner that she had lost them in the struggle, and her clothing was dirty. All of the roughness of her departure was visible in the creases and folds of the cloth. It was not the fine clothing of a young lady, but the mess of cloth that any pauper might wear. And yet, Lydia could hardly bring herself to care. She simply wanted to deal with the matter at hand so they could return and rescue Walter. They had to get him out of his mother's care before she did anything truly terrible. My lady, the constable said, drawing near her and looking Lydia up and down as if he too was embarrassed for her sake. Yes, I'm at your service, she replied. You must tell me. Who are you? he asked. She straightened her spine and held her head high. Looking him directly in the eye, Lydia answered. I am Lady Lydia Stanley. I have been my entire life and I always shall be, she said with dignity. The constable looked to Lord Lambton, his eyes a question. She is who she says she is, Lord Lambton replied and I am terribly sorry I did not know all along that she was at the estate, so close to us and yet being treated so terribly. Lady Lydia, you must forgive Lady Lambton and me. Yes, please, my dear. If only we had known, she added. There is nothing to forgive, Lydia replied. Oh, but I ought to have recognised you at the masquerade. In your mother's beautiful dress and everything. I should have known she insisted. Yes, and we may discuss all of that later, but for now we have to go back, Lydia interrupted. You believe Lord Walter Stanley is in danger? The Earl? The constable asked. Yes, he is. I have the most dreadful feeling, she said. Ne then we must return to the estate as quickly as possible, said the constable. He led the way and ushered for the others to do the same. Watching them all go, she was deeply humbled and grateful for everything they had done for her already. Lydia was greatly relieved that they were all so willing to listen to her worries. She thought that by now they must not trust the Countess either. Nevertheless, she had to find out if Walter was all right. He was her priority. He was the one thing she could not live without. Having already lost so much, she could not lose him as well. The thought of poison wound itself through her thoughts. It was a terrible thing to imagine or to suspect. And yet, it would not leave her mind. Lydia felt certain that something had caused Walter's stomach aches, and it was not the river that he had fallen into after they had already started. The coach that had driven Lydia as a prisoner was left behind on the road, the coachman uncertain about what he was meant to do now. What am I meant to do about all of this? he asked the constable. Do you think that is up to me? You accepted work from a woman like the Countess, and you ended up transporting her personal prisoner. We shall not have you drive Lady Lydia anywhere else, the constable told him. Lydia had no desire to end up back in his carriage either, and was grateful that she would not. 
Rather, she found herself in a coach with the Marquis and Lady Lambton. Don't worry, he is going to be just fine. We shall get back there soon enough, Lady Lambton said. Indeed. The Earl of Canwick is going to be fine, Lady Lydia, the Marquis tried to encourage. But no matter how they worked to make her feel better, Lydia continued to feel terrified for Walter. She had such a strong feeling that something was terribly amiss, and it would not go away. If anything happened to her brother, Lydia would not know what to do. She would never have forgiven herself. Walter had to be safe. She would not stand for any other outcome. It's all going to be all right, the Marquis said again. Lydia appreciated his words, but could not allow herself to be at peace until everything had truly been righted. Not until Walter was with her, free of his mother's grip. Not until they were away from the woman who had incited all of this to begin with. Finally, they arrived back at the estate all over again. The coaches pulled in and stopped beside one another, and Lady Lambton gave Lydia's hand a comforting squeeze. The woman then let go and looked out the window. She looked to the Marquis, who nodded in reassurance that all would be well. He then reached his own hand over and placed it on hers. Lydia's stomach jolted, but she did not flinch. Rather, she laced her fingers with those of the Marquis and vowed to herself that she would be a coward no more. Chapter 32 It would not take long to arrive at Stanley Hall, and Henry was relieved that they had managed to find her. Lydia was so out of sorts that he thought she was going to burst into tears at any moment. He was amazed that she had been so strong thus far. But she deserved to rest. She deserved to be at peace and not have to worry about everything that was going on. Henry wanted to take the burdens from her and give Lydia peace. Everything is going to be all right. It was the only sentiment anyone had to offer Lydia. It was the only thing that could be said to her at that moment. And it was a pitiable thing in the midst of the terrible crisis they were in. But he had nothing more to offer. If she truly believed the Countess was evil enough to try and hurt her own son, then there was very little possibility that she might find peace. After everything Lady Canwick had done to her stepdaughter, and after all of the lies she had told in covering it up, why should anyone have been surprised that there was concern for the young Earl's safety? Yes, Henry wished he had a better comfort to offer. But at that moment, he could give her nothing but a small hope that everything would be all right because they were going to do whatever they could to ensure that it was. At least they would now have an opportunity to confront the Countess about her lies and everything she had done to Lydia. They would be able to reveal the nasty secret and express to her that they knew all about it. That they had discovered the truth, and she would be believed no longer. The Countess would not take kindly to it. She had worked hard to get into the position that she had. She was glad to be there proud of her accomplishments, but they would make every effort to tear her down from a height that she had not earned. Of course, was that not the truth of all nobility? They had earned nothing. Henry would inherit a title that his father left to him. His father, who made him terribly angry at times, his father, who had treated his mother quite dreadfully and been treated dreadfully in return. That was his legacy. And yet, despite it all, he knew that at least he had not come by his inheritance through deceit or advantageous marriages. He would make every effort to remain in his position by being the very best he could be. And if he were so fortunate as to have a young woman like Lydia by his side, he would be all the more delighted. Bearing that in mind, Henry allowed himself to break free of the thoughts he had. No, this was a moment for action. And Henry looked to where his fingers were still interlocked with Lady Lydia's. The feeling of her hand in his was the greatest joy he had ever felt. She looked up at him, and he held her gaze as best he could. He saw the beauty of those grey eyes and thought of a wolf who had lost its family. He would help her find them again. He would help her rescue the brother who had those same wolf eyes that matched hers. Henry was determined and as he felt the smooth warmth of her skin, the hands that had taught her younger brother and had ridden horses and stitched for her stepmother. Henry was honoured. He was more than that. He was in love. They had arrived. 
It was time to get out of the coach, and Lydia suddenly thought she would not be able to. It was going to be too difficult to see her stepmother. It was going to be painful to go back into a home occupied by her. But Walter... She could not abandon him. And he was in there. If only she had managed to get him away sooner. If only she had recognised that he could be in danger. But it was too late to worry about the past. She could stop things now. Thank you, Lady Lambton. Thank you for getting us here, she said. It took all of us, Lady Lambton replied as they rushed up the stairs to barge into the estate. The doors crashed open from the force of the constable. Where is the Countess? he called. Three maids stood nearby and Tabitha was rushing forward, lifting her grey skirts in shaking hands. In her rooms, she declared, her voice suddenly growing excited. Second floor. Lydia knew where the rooms were and she ran ahead, leading the constable directly behind, with the others following. They reached the place where the rooms were at, and the constable pushed open the door with the same force, nearly elated with the power of it. Lydia watched as her stepmother stood angry and looming. What are you doing in my room? she screeched. We found Lady Lydia. Your lies have finally caught up to you. Now where is your son? the constable demanded. How should I know? She was his governess. Shouldn't she be the one to tell you? she asked in reply. You dismissed me and didn't let me see him. Lydia replied. Well, that is hardly my fault either. You were terrible. If you had simply obeyed, all would have been well, she insisted. Where is Walter? Lydia asked again, not willing to be sidetracked by her own abuses. The Countess refused to answer, but Lydia knew. He is in his room. He must be, she said. From there they rushed to Walter's room. The whole estate was abuzz with noise from the six of them, as well as the gossip of the maids and footmen. On top of it all, the Countess let out wailing cries of how her home was being infiltrated and she had done nothing wrong. Arabella was nowhere to be seen. Someone tell her to be quiet, Lord Lambton begged, annoyed by the defences uttered by the Countess. Walter, Lydia called, reaching his door. She burst into the room and saw him lying on his bed nearly asleep. Lydia, he asked, rubbing his eyes and trying to wake. Walter, it's me. Walter, are you all right? She asked, sobbing. Lydia, he whispered, barely conscious. Someone, please call the doctor, Lydia cried out. I shall send one of the maids, Tabitha promised. Lady Lydia, the constable began. I understand you are worried for your brother, but we must search the house for evidence of your suspicions. Yes, please do it, Lydia said. I shall lead you. I know all of her hiding spots, Tabitha said with eagerness in her eyes. Lydia sat with Walter and the Marquis remained with her. They were deeply concerned, but she also found herself desperate to know what was happening elsewhere in the home. No. Stop it called the Countess from down the hall. Her cries and insistent demands had echoed all throughout the estate. It was a screech that was driving Lydia nearly insane as she wished she could have the woman removed that instant. I knew it, came Tabitha's voice. Lydia looked to the Marquess with her eyes wide. He appeared equally interested to know what had taken place. A moment later, the constable arrived at the room. You may wish to cancel the call to the doctor, he said. What do you mean? Lydia asked, frightened. No! Give those back! The Countess yelled again, following the constable and Tabitha into Walter's room. Countess, you must stop this instant or I shall have to lock you away, the constable threatened. You can do no such thing. This is my home. Are you mad? Tabitha! Tabitha, send him away, she demanded. Like Lydia looked to the woman who had been so instrumental in her upbringing. Tabitha looked frightened for only the briefest of seconds before her shoulders straightened back. She stood firm and brave as she eyed the Countess. I shall not, came the words, strong and defiant. What did you say? The Countess demanded again. I shall not. He has found evidence that must be known. You have to be held accountable for this, Tabitha seethed 
her anger growing by the second. You fool! the Countess yelled in rage. She lunged forward, reaching her arms for Tabitha. The constable was faster, grasping at one of her wrists and yanking her back. The Countess cried out in pain. Sir. Miss Marsh, do you have keys for an empty room? he asked. Indeed, Tabitha replied. Excellent, he said. We must put her away until we have dealt with this. Lydia watched them drag her away, still remaining without answers. It was moments later, after continued shouts from her stepmother, that the constable and Tabitha returned. You are amazing, Lydia said to the housekeeper. It had to be done, she replied, still strong and courageous in ways she had never been before. Now, I must go and check on the status of the doctor. And, the constable began, we must deal with this. What is it? What have you found? the Marcus asked. Uh, the constable handed the papers over and reached his hand inside a leather bag to pull out vials of some strange liquid. The Marquis glanced at a few of the letters, and then with a grave expression turned to Lydia. Will someone please tell me what is happening? she asked. They are letters between your stepmother and the doctor, he began. This is arsenic, the constable interjected. Arsenic? Lydia asked. But isn't that simply used by ladies to keep their complexions? The constable sighed in horror. In small doses. It often is used by wealthy women for the sake of their complexions. But when used in larger quantities, it is a poison. Arsenic is deadly, Lady Lydia. And those letters between the doctor and the countess state how they intended to use the arsenic in growing amounts. They intended to poison him. Lydia's legs gave way beneath her. She found herself on the ground, weak and utterly horrified. The Countess really had done it. She had tried to poison Walter, and he lay on the bed, ill and near death. If only she had known sooner. If only she had been able to stop this before it all got this far. What can we do? she asked. We must find another doctor, and we must get him away from here, the constable said. Lydia pulled herself back up and went to Walter's bedside. Oh, Walter, I'm so sorry, she wept. Where is the housekeeper? the constable asked. Lydia was too upset to reply, but heard the Marquess answer that she was coming up at that moment. Please send for a different doctor, he told her. I have to order the arrest of this man, and I must arrest Lady Canwick now as well. See to it that the boy receives help. Lydia did not look to see all that was going on around her. She could not pull herself away from her brother. His forehead was covered in sweat, and he was deathly pale. How had she not figured it out sooner? The Countess was a cruel enough woman to do this. How had Lydia not seen that this was coming? A terrible, deadly method of retaining her fortune. But all would come to an end now. If Walter made it through this, they would be able to escape together even if that meant running away from England forever. She could take him with her. They would be all right. They had to be. He's going to be fine, the Marquis said, coming to her side. He stroked Walter's forehead as well, a look of sadness in his eyes. And once more, his hand came to rest upon hers. A familiar gesture, one they would not wish to have seen, but a kind one. Once they had all the evidence ready, the constable called for the countess to be let out of the room. You are coming with me, he told her, arresting her and leading her down the stairs. You cannot do this. Do you know who I am? I am the Countess of Canwick. You cannot arrest me, she insisted. Lydia held her breath as the countess was drawn past her, and the woman looked at her with hate in her eyes. You, this is all your fault. You are the one who ought to be punished. You shall pay for this, the countess threatened. No, came the word. It was soft, yet firm. No, I think it is time that you are going to pay for all you have done. The quiet strength was building within her. Lydia knew what needed to be said. After all this time, after everything she had been through, she was finally ready to take her stand. You love to hurt others. You want everything they have and you want it to be yours. 
You try to take away anyone's happiness. But that has ended. You have lost. And now you shall be locked away somewhere where you can never hurt another soul again, Lydia said. The Countess opened her mouth to speak again, but the constable raised up a hand in pause, and she closed it again. Instead, Lydia was the one given a chance to speak the final words. It is over. Chapter 33 The room was light and refreshing with the curtains drawn back, and the walls a pure white. The sun infiltrated the air, and Lydia had a new sense of comfort. Everything was going to be all right. Walter lay in the bed gravely ill, but she was confident that he would be restored now, confident that they would finally have their freedom. It had been three days since they had been rescued and brought to Lord and Lady Lambton's estate. In that time, Walter had been seen by a tremendous doctor who was working to relieve him of the poison. But Walter was still very ill, and it required all of Lydia's time and energy to be with him time and energy that she was happy to give. After all, this was her brother, and he meant more to her than anything. All of the Countess's plans had been uncovered. Her intention to keep Walter weak and debilitated for the rest of his life through the overdoses of arsenic. The alcove in her room where a large stash of the substance was held in greater supply. The letters that spoke of how her lover would supply it, and how she could easily administer it. And now all of society knew of the tale. Her reputation had been forever ruined. She truly had wanted Walter's power and authority stripped from him by weakening him. Lydia was relieved that the plan had never been for Walter to die. But she could not fulfil her goals by simply keeping him alive and wounded. She could not forgive Lady Canwick for that. And now it appeared that Walter was near death anyway. All of that everything they had been through, and she still might lose her brother. It had appeared that the doctor had mixed the arsenic with something else, a compound they had not yet identified and that he had not confessed. The man was still professing innocence despite the overwhelming evidence. All of those substances together had been the cause of Walter's illness. And Lydia was finally able to let go of the guilt she had felt when she believed it was her own fault for letting him fall in the river. Lydia, came a soft voice from outside. The door was already cracked open and Arabella pushed it ever so slightly, coming in sheepishly. Arabella, you're here, Lydia said. He seems to be sleeping better now. I'm relieved to hear it. Do you think it's going to help him? Arabella asked. I hope so. Dr O'Connell said that rest was the best thing we could do for him now. Rest and liquids. I fed him a bit of broth an hour ago. We shall see how well it does. I do hope he does not vomit it up again, Lydia said. As do I, Arabella quietly agreed. There was a tension between them, although it was a quiet one that neither wished to recognise. Lydia knew it was the result of Arabella's discomfort. Her feeling that she ought to have known about all of this, ought to have seen her mother's wickedness, that she ought to have treated Lydia better. But for the moment... They preferred to watch Walter as he slept. It was easier to be concerned for him than to discuss the difficulties in their own relationship. I do not know what I would do without him, Lydia finally said, unable to shake the dark thought from her mind. Could she bear to live if Walter did not? Could she bear to move on? Nor do I. The very idea of it is a miserable one. He is the only really happy one of us, in our family. He was always the spark of joy we needed, Arabella acknowledged. Lydia nodded. Arabella had always appeared happy, but it was an attempt to attract others and to appease her mother. It was never true, genuine happiness. It was a way to sell her marriageability. I do hope we shall get to see his joy once more, Lydia said. All was quiet for a moment. Neither knew quite what to say. It had been like this in the days that had passed. Arabella was living alone in Stanley Hall. She had invited Lydia to return, but Lydia said it was better for them to be at the Lambton estate for now, just while Walter was healing, and they were deciding what to do next. She had not meant it to offend Arabella. 
It was just that there was far too much else to deal with at the time, and all of her memories of Stanley Hall were now tainted. Arabella sighed and took Lydia's hand as they knelt beside Walter. I'm sorry. I could have been far more vocal about how my mother treated you. I could have said something, stopped it. But I didn't. That was my own fault, and you suffered as a result of it, she said to Lydia. Emotion strained at Lydia's throat, and she pushed it away. Don't worry, I understand, she said. It's just that I have always feared Mother. I know I am her favourite. I know she was kindest to me because she saw value in what she could get from me. I know I have never been at risk for poison or being put out on the street, Arabella continued. But I have feared her nonetheless. I have never quite known how to appease her, and it has been painful to try and learn. Lydia truly understood what Arabella was saying. Although she could not relate to it, she had seen it. And it was a relief to hear Arabella acknowledge it all, admit that things ought to have been better. It's not your fault, really. You were only a child when you came to live with us, and when your mother married my father, and you were still a child when my father passed away. That was when her behaviour started. You did not know how it was, and you never knew anything else. How could you have stopped what you did not know? Lydia reasoned. She didn't wish for Arabella to spend her life feeling bad about all of this. Arabella was a good woman. She had simply been misguided by her mother. And now that she was accepting responsibility for that, Lydia had hope. But I should have known the difference between our treatment. And I did. But I never allowed myself to admit it. To have done so would have upset her, and it would have meant losing the privileges I had in the home. I was selfish, she confessed. We are all selfish from time to time, Lydia replied. I always did care about you, even if I didn't show it. I hope I shall do better moving forward. That is my wish and that is my goal. I shall ensure you are never in such a position again, Arabella said. Lydia squeezed her hand and smiled comfortingly. We are still sisters. We shall look out for one another, together. You, me and Walter. And I imagine we have quite a lot ahead of us. Quite a lot that we shall have to figure out, Lydia said. It's true. I have heard just this morning that the estate is going to be taken from us to pay off the debts my mother incurred. We are losing all of it, Arabella said. Yes. You will need a place to live, Lydia agreed. The thought of their home being taken was just another tragedy for Lydia. Not only had it been usurped by her stepmother, but now it was to be taken all over again. And it is not as though I am going to be able to marry as I had planned. I wished to wed as soon as possible, to find my husband. But now my prospects have been ruined, Arabella added. Indeed. Our family's reputation has been forever altered. Things have changed quite dramatically. I'm not certain what we ought to do about all of it either. But I do trust that we shall find a solution, Lydia said, for our reputation and for keeping the home. Do you think so? Arabella asked. I do. And I cannot make an offer on behalf of my hosts, but Lord and Lady Lambton have taken Walter and me in. If they learn of your plight, and the fact that you are somewhat of an orphan now as well, I imagine they shall make you the same offer, Lydia said, knowing full well that they would welcome Arabella. I cannot get my hopes up for it, but that would be a delight. More than anything, I should like to be near you and Walter. You are the only family I have now. Even if she were released from prison this very day, she is gone from my life, Arabella declared. That is a loss she shall never regain, Lydia said. She let go of Arabella's hand and stood, taking in a deep breath and moving over to the window. Outside, the cool air was blowing, and she wanted to be out in it. She could breathe better here than at Stanley Hall, but it was not enough just now. Lydia was exhausted from everything that had taken place. She needed more than just a window. She needed air. And yet the idea of leaving Walter was too much. She would stay with him. Family was about sacrifice, and that was a small one in light of everything they had been through thus far. 
Finally discussing things with Arabella meant they could move on as well. They would be able to act as sisters in a way that they had never previously been afforded. It gave Lydia a great sense of happiness to know that. It made her smile that she was going to be equal to someone who had unknowingly caused her difficulty. She wondered if the Marquis would be by that day to visit. He had come every day so far to check on Walter, and it was a treat to see him and to know he cared enough about their family to show an interest. Lord Ranton had joined him once as well and asked after him the other times. Lydia had dared to ask if Lord Ranton had visited Arabella. I think he should like to be certain of her first, the Marquis had replied vaguely. Lydia understood. They were all worried that Arabella had been a part of her mother's schemes. They had all wondered if she was innocent or if she was as cunning and cruel as the Countess. Lydia had nodded to him and said she understood that, but that there was little to worry about with Arabella. She was not like her mother in most ways, and anything of her, which was, could still be righted. She was glad for that now. Lydia realised how much she had meant what she said to him about her stepsister and that Arabella really was a good woman when she was allowed to be. She hoped that Lord Ranton might eventually go visit her. From the window Lydia scanned the trail as far as she could. There was no sign of the Marquess. Her heart sank, but she also accepted that perhaps he would come later. And if he did not come at all, that had to be all right with her as well. He was not bound to her even though she wished that he would become so. Lydia, Arabella said urgently. What is it? she asked. Lydia turned and saw Walter stirring again. She hoped it was not another fit in his sleep as he had been having before. Nightmares from the fever. I don't know. Is he all right? What do you need? Should I put a warm cloth on his head? Arabella asked only having known how to do a few small things so far in his recovery. Let me see him, Lydia insisted. She feared the worst. But something was different. Walter's cheeks looked pink. With delicate fingers, Lydia touched his forehead. There was sweat, but not the blistering heat that had been there before. The fever had finally broken. The poison was leaving his system. Walter was going to be all right. Chapter 34 The cold was not pleasant, but it was a nice change from the grand fire that Arthur had roaring in his home. Henry had begged him not to burn it so bright, but Arthur had claimed he was terribly cold, and only now was he realising that it had been too much. I said I'm sorry, Arthur grumbled. It's fine. I just wanted a ride to get out for a bit, Henry replied. It was funny to him how they always seemed to disagree about what was and wasn't the right decision on these little matters, but they always remained friends and recovered from such disagreements. Arthur would always childishly insist on an extreme, and Henry would always tell him to think it through first. But nothing ever changed, and they would always be the best of friends regardless. What do you think will happen to the Stanleys, Lady Arabella and Lady Lydia? the Earl of Canwick? Arthur asked. Henry had been wondering that as well. In fact, it was the only thing he could think about most of the time. Hopefully, the Earl will pull out of his illness. I cannot imagine how terrible his loss would be, and so long as he recovers, things will come back together. But otherwise, the young ladies will be on their own, he said with sadness. But not alone, Arthur replied raising an eyebrow at Henry in understanding. Henry gave him a half-smile in reply. No, hardly alone. They continued on in the gentle chill, and Henry shivered with delight that it was so cool. He had always been fond of the cold autumns of northern England, but knew that most of society preferred the warmth of summer. And the parties of summer, but that was another matter entirely. He thought back to the day before when he had gone to see how the Earl was doing. It had been a relief to see that Lydia was looking well and that she had been handling things as best she could, considering all that had taken place. The Countess was in prison, along with her doctor lover. They had gotten what was due them. And Lord and Lady Lambton had taken in Lydia and the Earl as guests. 
but standing in the room the day before, watching as she dutifully cared for her younger brother, Henry had been amazed. It was beautiful. It was encouraging to see a young woman show so much love for another. Lydia Stanley was truly one of a kind. And a moment had occurred in which he watched her just too long. She had looked up at him, caught him staring. But rather than rebuking him for his rudeness, Lydia had given a shy smile before returning to her work of looking after the Earl of Canwick. Yes, their reputations would be ruined, but that was hardly their own fault. And he would not allow their names to be smeared due to the actions of the Countess. What are you thinking about? Arthur asked. Hmm, Henry replied. You have a dreamy smile on your face. Are you thinking about a certain young woman? He asked further. Henry looked at him sheepishly. Perhaps. Do tell, Arthur insisted. Do you know those moments when you find you cannot look away from a young woman? No matter how improper, no matter how it might reflect on you, she is all you can see and you wish for no other? He asked. I know exactly what you are speaking of, Arthur replied. Lady Lydia has the ability to mesmerise me. I am quite powerless to it. I cannot help myself when she is around. I see only her. I am overcome by her, Henry confessed. Yes, that is the tragedy of being in love, Arthur laughed. A tragedy, Henry repeated. The very women we are supposed to impress with our strength are the ones which make us weak, he said. I suppose you are right. That does sound quite like the case as it may be, Henry agreed. And you're thinking she might be worth the future, Arthur asked. Worth the future? She is worth a great deal more than that. I should be ever so lucky to win her affections, Henry insisted. Yes, you should, and I am glad that you see it, Arthur said. And what of you? Henry asked. Arthur looked uncomfortable for a moment. Are you still against Lady Arabella? In truth, I have had a great number of questions for you in regard to her, Arthur said. What do you mean? Henry asked. Well, it was rather clear that the Countess wished for you and Lady Arabella to be married, Arthur said. What? Henry spat. What makes you think that? Arthur laughed. Everyone saw it. She was desperate. But I didn't know if perhaps you were considering it. If that was your reason for not supporting me immediately in my affections for Lady Arabella, Arthur told him, you thought that I wished to be married to her? Henry asked. As I said, it was difficult to tell. That was one possibility. Otherwise, I thought perhaps you simply disliked her. And that is what I now believe must be the case since I know your heart remains with Lady Lydia, Arthur said. Oh, goodness, Arthur. That was a foolish assumption, I'm afraid to say. I never had any affection for Lady Arabella, and I am sorry that you ever questioned it. But I also do not dislike her on the whole, Henry said. That is not the enthusiasm I would have liked, Arthur said. His voice was flat, and no emotion showed on his face, but Henry recognised that he had not said quite what he ought to have. He felt he ought to do better than that. He wanted to support his friend. Then. I shall explain it better. Because I think Arabella is a very bright girl and I find her quite agreeable. Perhaps she is easily led. That is my only reservation. But if she is being led by you, then I can only blame Lord Ranton and all of his confounding ways for her behaviours, Henry teased. Arthur laughed. He ought to have expected such a response from Henry. The two were vastly different, and that was a good thing. It kept them grounded. Well, I am relieved to hear it. I must say I quite like her, Arthur stated. I know, Henry replied, trying not to show his amusement. The attraction between Arthur and Lady Arabella had hardly been a secret. Henry was not the only person who had noted it, and he wanted to see his friend happy. If this brought him happiness, if Lady Arabella was the one who could give him joy, Henry was delighted to see it through. Giles stepped in a puddle and Henry tutted at his horse. I just had him scrubbed this morning. Why does this beast like the mud so much? He griped. Does it really matter? Does he have to be spotless to impress someone? 
Arthur laughed. I suppose not, but I should like the Earl to ride Giles when he is strong enough, Henry said, realising what a foolish thought that was. He hadn't even considered that he had been subconsciously doing it daily. Having the horse cleaned in the morning in case he had an opportunity to entertain the Earl. But the Earl of Canwick was still lying in bed, possibly never to wake again. What a flawed logic he had when he now realised he had been waiting all along to show off the horse again. Arthur cleared his throat as if uncomfortable. Forgive me. That was a foolish wish, Henry said. We will see what happens, Arthur replied. They continued on in silence for a while, almost reaching the road that stretched between the estate of Lord and Lady Lambton and Stanley Hall. Henry hoped Lydia would not mind another visit from them. Even if they were quite useless when it came to nursing an earl back to health, they wanted to be there for her if they could. Especially Henry. He was dedicated to being a support as much as he was able. Although he could not imagine what might happen if the earl was lost, he knew they would do all they could to prevent it. He was a young boy, not deserving of the cruelty he had faced. It was terribly important that they find a way to help him in the midst of his illness, even if it meant fronting other doctors from far away. They needed someone who could really ensure the Earl made it through this tragedy. He had to survive. Have you seen Lady Arabella since everything took place? Henry finally asked. No, not yet. I... I suppose I was seeking your permission, Arthur admitted. My permission. Now who is being the foolish one? he asked in reply. Well, you do have rather difficult standards to meet. And I did not know if perhaps Lady Lydia had said anything in regard to Lady Arabella. If she had been involved in any of this mess, Arthur said, I assure you, Lady Lydia believes she did not. That all was in the hands of the Countess and the Doctor. Lady Arabella is a good young woman. Lady Lydia holds nothing against her. She understands that Lady Arabella was in a difficult situation, Henry assured him. I am relieved to hear it, Arthur sighed. So do you think you shall go and see her? Henry asked. Arthur stretched his neck and looked beyond the crest to where Stanley Hall was peeking up the road. His eyes were wandering, hopeful. Henry wanted him to be happy. Perhaps, after we visit the Earl of Canwick and Lady Lydia... Following that, I may go to Stanley Hall and call after Lady Arabella, he said. Henry knew what that meant for Arthur. There was no perhaps about it. Arthur would be going, and he would likely spend a good portion of the day there. But as they went along the road, another figure appeared, a familiar one. Henry's interest was piqued, and he had to see if he could get her attention. Is that not the housekeeper for Stanley Hall? Arthur asked. Indeed it is. Is she all right? Henry asked. He recalled that her last name truly was Marsh. Tabitha Marsh, if he remembered correctly. She was coming from the estate of Lord and Lady Lambton, and she was crying quite openly as she walked. Miss Marsh, Henry called out. He could not imagine anything having her so upset as to be emotional like this out in the open. He feared the worst. Was it the Earl? Had he passed? Was it all coming to an end? And had they all just lost someone very dear to them? Miss Marsh paused and looked up at them before quickly wiping her face as they approached. Drawing nearer to her, Henry saw just how red her eyes were and how embarrassed she was at having been found in such a state. Miss Marsh, is everything all right? Arthur asked. Is it the Earl? What has happened? Henry questioned, unable to hold himself back. Yes, yes, it's the Earl of Canwick, she answered, her voice choked. Henry felt a wave of sadness come over him and thought the tears might be building behind his own eyes. Oh no, Henry whispered. Miss Marsh looked up at him with confusion, her brows drawing together. Oh no, she repeated. My lord, you are mistaken. He looked at her in wonder and Miss Marsh waved her hand at them. She began to chuckle and choked on her own tears, just as a smile spread across her face. It was the most confounding reaction he had ever seen for such a situation. His fever has broken. He is going to be all right. 
I am crying with joy, not with grief. Walter is awake, she exclaimed, her voice cracking on the last word, before another round of tears spilled from her eyes. Henry's jaw dropped, and his eyes lit up with joy. He's all right, he asked. Henry recognised that his breathing had quickened, and he was overjoyed. What amazing news it was. He wanted to see the boy straight away. And of course to see his sister who was caring for him. He had to congratulate them and offer his services if there was anything new that they needed. Yes, my lord, he is well. The doctor has just confirmed it. Walter is just fine. He has gotten most of the poison from his system, and Lady Lydia is still watching over him. As is Lady Arabella. They are making sure he fully recovers, and they are quite magnificent at their duty, she complimented. Henry looked at Arthur, who had a wide, toothy smile at the news. It was wonderful for both of them to hear. The young ladies had done so much to make the Earl better, and he was finally going to be all right. There was nothing left to fear for him. Things were coming together, and those who had been oppressed were finally starting to live their lives with ease. Chapter 35 The estate was bigger now. Not in reality, but to Lydia's eyes, Stanley Hall had grown tremendously. Or maybe it was she that had changed. Yes, that had to be it. Now, in the midst of all that had taken place since the Countess was taken away, it was she who had become someone new. It was reflected in how she gazed at this space. It was no longer an estate belonging to her family. No. It belonged to her brother. And as long as she had guardianship over him, it was her responsibility to ensure that everything ran smoothly. Yes, Stanley Hall had grown a lot bigger. Lydia looked at Walter, his own eyes staring up at the estate. He was looking far better. In the weeks that had passed since his illness, he had managed to walk again, to go about his normal routine. There was still a long way to go before he was truly well, but he had made significant progress. That was something Lydia could not deny. Seeing him with some of his strength returned was better than nothing at all. And Arabella came out the doors to where they were all standing. She looked at Walter, Lydia and the estate staff with an embarrassed smile, as if she did not think she deserved this honourable departure. I'm going to miss her, Walter noted. As am I, Lydia agreed. Can we go visit her sometimes? he asked. We shall certainly try. But it is not an easy journey, I think. Perhaps we may go in a year. Maybe the following year she will want to come back to visit us, Lydia suggested. That would be nice, Walter said. Yes, it truly would. But if we go to visit, it must be during summer. I shouldn't like to see Wales in the winter, Lydia laughed. Will her aunt let us stay with her? Walter asked. I don't want to have to go and visit, but stay far away and have to travel back and forth just to see her. I imagine so. She is the sister of Arabella's late father. Family usually wants to be close, and they will accept that we are a part of Arabella's family, Lydia said, hoping she was right. So Arabella reached the two of them for her goodbyes, and it was clear she had already been crying. She took a deep breath and looked away, as if wishing she could avoid all of it. Lydia understood the feeling. She didn't want to say goodbye either. The two of them were just starting to really know one another. They were just growing into a friendship, and it was terrible timing that they should now be separated. Be good, Walter, she insisted. I will, he said. And Lydia, if there is anything you need, please tell me. I shall do whatever I can, Arabella said, still trying to compensate for the past that Lydia had chosen to let go of. You know you do not have to leave. We've managed to get the estate back. It is ours now. You may stay and live with us, Lydia said once more. It had only been a stroke of luck that revealed a number of other assets belonging to the Countess from her previous marriage, which enabled them to keep the Stanley estate and all that belonged to it. Now that it appeared that the Countess had been hoarding wealth for a number of years and had little intention of sharing it. Lydia had told Arabella how much she would have loved for them all to live together. But Arabella had insisted. She wanted to go to a place where she would be able to have a fresh start, 
where the men would not know of her family's downfall, and she could make a good match after all. No matter how thoughtless Arabella could be at times, Lydia had forgiven her and was sad to see her go. It would be difficult for them all to be apart, but she knew they would survive. They would manage to move forward. Arabella threw her arms around Lydia in an emotional embrace. Lydia was moved, and she cried into her stepsister's hair. The two were finally developing a friendship, and it was time for them to separate. It seemed to be a cruel fate. Arabella gave Walter an equally emotional hug, her half-brother. Arabella was clearly upset at having to leave him behind, but she had said she trusted Lydia, and Lydia did not intend to let her down. I shall write to you both often, she promised. Oh, please do, Lydia begged. Until we see one another again, Arabella said, turning away and being assisted into the carriage by the coachman. He closed the door behind her and climbed up to his seat, grabbing the reins and spurring his horses forward. It was a dreadful thing to watch. Lydia wished she could turn back time and prevent everything that had happened. She wanted to make sure the three of them could all stay together. But there was nothing left for Arabella here, until the sound of another coach was heard approaching. Stopping directly in front of Arabella's, the arriving carriage's door flew open, and Lord Ranton sprung forth from it with great determination. He rushed to Arabella's carriage and pulled the door open. Lady Arabella, don't go, he yelled, thrusting his hand forth. He pulled it back, and Lydia saw that Arabella had taken it on her own. She allowed him to draw her out of the coach and plant her feet back on the earth. Please, Lady Arabella, do not go, I beg of you he said with great passion. Arabella blushed before them all. Why ever not? she asked, her question desperate. Because you must be my wife. You must marry me, he insisted. Please, Lady Arabella, will you be my wife? Lord Ranton dropped to his knee, gazing at her with evident love, a true love. And once more, Arabella blushed. Yes. She trembled in a sweet voice. Yes, yes, and yes. Arthur raised himself up and swung her in a circle, giving Arabella all the joy he felt. There was no denying the love that existed between the two of them. Lydia rejoiced, and Walter clapped his hands. The whole of the estate was in an uproar of delight. The match was ideal and happily made. One that had been long in the making. Oh, but I have new guardians who must be asked. Arabella said with panic. Worry not, we shall write to them. I will give witness about this man, Lydia promised. But they are expecting me, she added. I shall write immediately, telling them what has taken place, and that you are welcome to stay with Walter and me. Please, Arabella, you cannot go to Wales only to turn around again. That would be foolish. Just stay. They shall receive the letter quickly, and I have no doubt they will give their permission, Lydia said. Then it is settled, Arthur said, his face bright and relieved. Yes, it is settled. The two of you must be wed. We shall have to await their permission, but it shall come quickly, Lydia reassured them, hoping she was right. She had never met these relatives, but she was certain. Everything was going to come together. In that case, we must have a celebration rather than mourning, Tabitha insisted. We shall get to the kitchen straight away. The suggestion from the housekeeper might have been ignored in previous days, but now they were all in agreement. Tabitha had an excellent idea, and her words were given value. They all went inside and enjoyed a grand time together. The feast was small, having had little time to prepare, but it was exciting nevertheless. What mattered most was that Arabella was properly celebrated in her new engagement. Lydia felt along her distended stomach after they all departed ways with Lord Ranton returning to his own estate and Arabella asking Tabitha to go into town with her to look at fabrics for her wedding dress. Lydia and Walter sat for a while in the parlour, resting and trying to recuperate from all of the food. How are you feeling? she asked him. Terrible. I have not eaten that much since before I was ill, he replied. Lydia nodded. Walter still did not know the full extent of what had taken place. 
She thought it would be terribly upsetting for him to learn that his own mother had poisoned him and made him ill. It was far better that he believed she had simply done something very bad and was in trouble. But now, Lydia had been made his legal guardian. She would be in charge of the estate and all of its assets until Walter was old enough to take them on himself. But in the meantime, Lydia would work to manage Walter's affairs. She would economise and restore Stanley Hall to its former glory. It would be the home she had known many years ago, before the loss of her father. What would you like to do now, Walter? Lydia asked. Sleep, for I'm far too full to do anything else, he replied. Lydia was tempted by that, but she knew it was hardly in their best interest. I fear I cannot allow that. We must do something better, something productive, don't you think? What will make us feel better other than a little bit of exercise? She asked. I do not think I can walk. I am too stuffed, he retorted. I did not say we need to walk. I'm thinking of a kind pony who has missed his master deeply, Lydia hinted. Walter looked at her with great excitement in his eyes. You mean it? he asked. I mean it, Lydia laughed. She had been making Walter wait until he was feeling much better before he would be allowed to ride Roderick. But alas, she finally felt he was ready and that he would be all right. Would you consent to a ride with Lady? she asked, wanting to bring her horse along. That would be lovely. Oh, thank you, Lydia. I've missed riding so much, he said. Then we must be quick. It is cold out there and the sun is nearly at its peak. Put on your coat, she told him. Walter nodded and ran from the room to get his things. <laughs> he was recovering now and she did not want him to catch a cold on top of it. If he got sick all over again, she would never forgive herself. After fetching her own cloak, Lydia met with Walter again by the front doors, and they made their way out together. Walter was visibly elated and he burrowed himself further into his coat as they opened the door and walked to the barn. The ground crunched beneath them. The grass was already frozen with stones that could have been ice. The autumn was a lovely season, but winter was often cruel. Nah. Lydia was not looking forward to being stuck in the house frequently from the cold. Still, it would be better now. She was less a prisoner and finally had her freedom. Things were going to be different this year. They would celebrate the holiday season with excitement. They would enjoy time together as a family. And her stepmother was far away in a place where they would never have to see her. She was learning what it meant to be a prisoner. And Lydia knew that one day she would have to learn to let go of her anger. <laughs> Not for the sake of the Countess, but for the sake of her own heart. That day would come, but for now she lived in this day and it was a day that would be filled with time spent riding along beside Walter. Chapter 36 There was no reason he ought to have been out save for the fact that Henry could not bear to be around Arthur any longer. From the moment he had come home, his prancing and rejoicing had been overwhelming. As delighted as Henry was, he saw that Arthur simply needed a bit of space to be happy on his own. Company was only a distraction, Going out for a ride was always his choice of ways to escape a situation. He could simply insist the horse needed it, that it was not about him or his selfish wants, but that Giles was growing old and needed to be worked regularly. So he went out into the chill once more. The air was crisp and smelled clean and cold. His nose immediately started to feel the freeze, but it wasn't so bad. He enjoyed it. Henry's thoughts returned to Arthur and his exciting news. It was indeed a wonderful thing. Arthur and Arabella were finally going to be married. It was something that everyone had predicted and hoped for. Alas, it was coming to pass. And once they were married, the Stanley name would regain some of its former glory. But that was not something that impacted him, really. Henry was still on the sidelines, wondering what his future held. He had once despaired the idea of marriage. His own mother and father were such a tragic example that he could hardly imagine binding himself in such a situation as that. Was he a fool that he was now, so suddenly even considering it? 
Was he an idiot for thinking there could ever be something between himself and Lydia? Would she even want that? He had much to consider before ever taking such a step. And even if he did choose to, he knew well that she might turn out to have considered him only a friend in the midst of everything that had taken place. Oh, Giles, my boy, you are so fortunate not to have to make these choices, he thought to himself. No, with Giles, mates were chosen based upon the fitness of the mayor. And while it often seemed to be such the case in London society, Henry was not going to allow himself to be amongst those men. No, he would wait and see what happened with Lydia. And he imagined he might not be able to wait all that long. A coach rode past Henry, and he recognised it as one belonging to the Stanley estate. He didn't know who it might have been, but it only amplified his thoughts on Lydia. And it was in that sudden moment that he saw her, riding with the Earl of Canwick. Quickening Giles's pace, Henry managed to catch up to them. Lady Lydia, my lord, how wonderful to see the two of you again, he said, as if he had not seen them recently. Lydia appeared fresh-faced, but her cheeks were pink from the cold. The Earl wiped the back of his hand on his nose, much to his sister's horror. And you, my lord, Lydia replied, trying to pretend her brother had not just done that. What brings you out into the cold? he asked. He had wondered the same about himself, thinking he must be mad for having stayed out like this. It is my first ride since I was ill, the Earl told him. And he is doing tremendously, Lydia added. I am glad to hear it, Henry exclaimed. But we've just had news. Earlier today, your friend Lord Ranton proposed to Arabella. She has just returned from town, and it would seem that Lord Ranton has joined her and we are to host a celebration this evening far grander than what we gave them earlier in the day, she laughed. Oh, he has returned to your home? Henry asked, thinking it funny that he had gone out to escape his friend, only to be brought back into the festivities. Indeed. Would you like to join us? the Earl asked him. I should be ever so delighted, he answered. With that, Henry fell in line and joined them on the way back to Stanley Hall. Riding together, he watched as Lydia beautifully sat atop her mare. She was exquisite as ever. They reached the stables at the estate, and Henry quickly dismounted so he might help the Earl as well as Lydia. With the Earl of Canwick on the ground, he made his way to the woman that he could not keep his eyes from. May I help you? he asked. Certainly, she replied, although he knew she had no need of him. He gave her his hand and assisted her to the ground. For a moment, they stood facing one another, eyes locked in understanding. There was something between them that they could not deny, and Henry didn't want to pretend he didn't notice. No matter what propriety stated, they were locked for a moment. My lady? asked one of the grooms from beside them. Henry tore his gaze away and they both handed their reins over to the men who worked the stables. He felt a slight embarrassment that they had seen him so enraptured with her, but knew there was no reason to be. They could hardly blame him for noticing her beauty. No, let me do it, Walter insisted when the grooms came to take the reins for Roderick. All right, but you must allow them to help you with it, she replied. Henry saw how desperately she wanted to give her little brother anything he wished, particularly after all that had taken place with his mother. The Earl nodded and worked with one of the grooms to do the job well. Lady Lydia observed but tried not to let the Earl see how closely. He's quite a fine Lord Stanley, isn't he? Lady Lydia asked proudly. He shall do the job well, I think. Quite the horseman as well, Henry added with a chuckle. Side by side, they walked away from the stable and towards the doors of the estate. The cold still crept into his boots, and Henry was glad to be heading indoors. The sounds of a party were already beginning to spill out, and he noted that a few more coaches had begun to arrive. Was it possible that this was going to turn into a grand event? The sort that Arthur would be talking about for days? Bragging and sharing how important his event was? It didn't matter so much, other than the fact that he wanted this time with Lydia. It was too cold out here, but too noisy in there. 
and he wanted privacy with her. Or at least the sort of privacy that was still allowable. It was not as though they were truly alone out here in the open. The door to the estate and all the carriages were on one side and the stables on the other. No one could accuse them of impropriety now. Are you going to be in the country for much longer? Lydia asked as they walked. Henry was glad for her to continue the conversation, as he had been so nervous to do so. But he was not ready to be parted from her. Not until he could discern some of his own hopes and thoughts. He was desperate to learn more about what she wanted, as it had always been. A little while longer, I should think, he answered, wanting to tell her everything on his mind and see if she thought the same. I can't thank you enough for what you've done, she said, sending a glance in his direction and causing him to blush, as he seemed to have been doing rather frequently of late. I'm happy to have helped. Do you think you'll be in town for the next season at all? He asked her in reply. I think there shall be some grand balls. It would be good to know who else might be present. No, not at all, I'm afraid, she said. Walter and I are quite happy where we are. And at the moment, there is a lot of gossip surrounding the Stanley name. I do not know if we should even receive any invitations. Society is cruel at times. Yes, I know, he confessed, and she was right. They likely would not even receive an invitation despite the fact that it was none of their faults. He cleared his throat, somewhat uncomfortable but nervous more than anything. You're more than welcome here should you ever want to come, Lydia said, her eyes catching his once more. In those grey eyes, Henry saw that she was beckoning him to say something. Her lips seemed to tremble in wonder, a yearning to know the answer to a deeply important question, as if she felt as desperately as he did. Lydia deserved more than what society offered, and more than he could ever offer. But if she sequestered herself to this estate, would he be willing to risk the rejection of coming? Would he be accepted? if he did stop by for a visit? Or was she simply being polite when she really just wanted to be left alone? I appreciate that. I'll quite miss you turning up at the London parties, he replied, unsure of what else he might say to get an answer from her. Will you? Lady Lydia asked, pausing in her steps. They were very near the door, but not quite within range yet. They had moments before anyone might see them standing there. Yes, they could speak freely here and if she wanted to know whether or not he would miss her, he had to make a point of confessing to her how deeply it would be so. Oh, how he would miss Lady Lydia during the season, how he would ache to see her, how he would crave these walks and rides upon which he so often ran into her. Lady Lydia would be the only woman in all of London to him, always, and if she was not there, he would see no other. Where she was, that would be his season. Yes, I shall miss you. There will be no one quite like you there, he said. I imagine not, she laughed coyly. It made her lovelier when she looked away, almost ashamed of her boldness. It was that boldness that proved how meek she really was. She was Lydia Stanley, and he wanted her to be Lydia Radcliffe. If I were to ask you to marry me, would you? He finally questioned. Marry you? she asked wide-eyed. Surely you know how I feel about you, he insisted. No. You haven't said, she told him, sadness puckering the corners of her eyes. Had he not said the words? Had he never uttered what he felt? Had he left her to suffer in question just as he accused her of doing to him? I love you, Lydia, he finally burst. Even if I were a lowly governess, would you love me then? she asked. It would cause problems with my father, but yes, even then, he said with honesty. What of Walter? she asked with hesitancy. I can do nothing unless his future is secure. He is all I have. We can stay here for as long as he needs you, Henry reassured her, and he needn't be all you have. He may always be the most important thing you have, but please, you must know that you have more than him. There are those of us who love you far greater than you could ever imagine. She looked at the ground for a moment, pausing to think. But it did not take Lydia very long. Her eyes met his once more. Then yes, she whispered with a quiet joy. 
I've loved you, I think, from the day that you rescued me. Without a glance of caution, the Marquess wrapped an arm around her waist and pulled her in close. Lydia tilted her face towards him and welcomed his lips as they shared the most unexpected and loveliest kiss. Chapter 37 the gown was only the second most beautiful she had ever worn. At first, Tabitha had insisted that Lydia wear her mother's silver gown again, but Lydia did not want to cross the two best evenings of her life. No matter how the masquerade had ended, that night had been the one that changed everything for her. But today was her wedding, and for her wedding, she wanted something entirely unique. The embroidery of flowers was exactly what she had hoped for, and the shape of it was perfectly cut to her figure. Furthermore, the pale blue colour was what everyone had said would bring out the colour of her eyes and make them stand out magnificently. Tabitha braided her hair so that it was held up and off her neck in a womanly manner. She looked the ideal image of a bride. Do you think he will like it? she asked Tabitha. He will love it, she replied. Lydia looked nervously at her reflection. She had been a governess only a short time ago. How had she suddenly become this woman? Who was she now? How could she ever show the world that she deserved this? That it was a part of her heritage? The Countess was gone from the house, but there were still times when Lydia felt as though she did not belong. That she didn't deserve to be wealthy or beautiful or important. But the Marquis had done so much to change all of that. He treated her as though she truly mattered. And it was entirely new for her, new in a way she craved. No matter how silly it was, she needed to feel like she belonged and that she mattered in the world. Alas, she was marrying the very man who had given her that sense of importance. You are marrying your Marquess today, and with that in mind I need you to keep a secret, Tabitha said. Lydia grew anxious. What sort of secret could it be? Tabitha pulled out a small silver tiara. Oh, goodness, what is that? she asked. The final touch, Tabitha said. Lydia watched as Tabitha crowned her like royalty. Do you remember the alcove in the Countess's room, where she kept so many of her secrets? This was one of them, Tabitha said. She stole this from your mother's belongings. Had I known it was in there sooner, I would have given it to you a long time ago. You would have worn it for the masquerade. But alas, I only have it now, and you must wear it on this, your wedding day. Another token from your mother to bring you grace on this very important day of your life, Tabitha said. Lydia was in awe. She hadn't imagined having something so splendid to wear, but it truly finished the outfit. Shall we see Arabella? Tabitha asked. Oh yes, let's, Lydia exclaimed. They went into Arabella's room to see her standing in a pale pink gown, her hair braided around her head with flowers stuck in at random places. The two could not have looked more opposite, but they were both brides. You are a gem, Lydia complimented. Oh, Lydia, you look simply stunning. I cannot have imagined how beautiful you would be, but this is magnificent. Can you believe we are going to be married today? that you and I shall finally be wed to these wonderful men we have loved for all this time? Arabella asked. It is a mystery, but I cannot wait to see them. Oh, what time is it? she asked. Very nearly four, and we must be at the church by five. That means we should be going soon. Where is Walter? Arabella asked. He is having a button fixed on his coat. Apparently, Roderick thought it was edible and he bit it off. I could hardly believe that Walter decided to wear his nicest coat out to the stables where the horses might tear at it, Lydia remarked, shaking her head in dismay. Oh, that boy! He shall grow out of it, don't worry. You are doing your very best to raise him, and you have done so well, Arabella complimented. Lydia was not entirely so confident in herself. She loved Walter. She hoped she was doing well but it was a great challenge to learn to be his mother after so long as a sister. She only hoped she was not making terrible mistakes on a daily basis. Still, he was doing well and improving. His new governess was fantastic, and she made quite a difference for him. 
It seemed as though, no matter how well Lydia had done, Walter knew the difference between a sister and a governess, and now he was ready for those roles to be separated. Ladies, we must be getting on, Tabitha urged them from the doorway. They all departed into two separate coaches. One held Arabella and two of the maids she had grown to be friends with. The other, Lydia, Walter and Tabitha. The three of them giddy at the knowledge that this day was going to change everything. And Lydia would finally be married to the Marquis of Whitecroft. He will think you are a princess, Walter complimented. You think so? She laughed. I know it. I think he's going to be terribly happy to marry you, he confirmed. Terribly happy? Is that a good thing? She giggled. Then, picking at the fray on Walter's cuffs, she felt a sense of dismay and she sighed. Oh, Walter, what are we going to do with you? You mustn't allow Roderick to eat all of your clothing. He didn't mean to. He's a good horse. It won't happen again, he promised. Tabitha tried not to laugh. I'm sure it won't. Probably because now, any time you wish to ride, you shall be going with the Marquis. He's going to ensure you take good care of everything, won't he? Tabitha asked. Yes, he will. He is going to be like a father, is he not? Walter asked. In a manner of speaking, Walter, he will take good care of us. He is going to provide for us as needed. But remember, although he is living in your estate, you must respect him. The Marquis and I are going to be married, and he is your elder. So, until you take control of your inheritance and have a wife of your own in the estate, you must treat him well, Lydia urged. I promise, I always shall, he said, but I am going to miss Arabella. As will I, Lydia agreed. Arabella and Lord Ranton were going to be living in his estate. It was nearby, and that was a great mercy, but Lydia was going to miss running down the hall to speak to her friend and share whatever news she had. In the previous few months, the two had grown so close. She was going to be sad not to have that just minutes away. She would miss hearing Arabella's laugh at all hours of the night or the silly things she did when she forgot to think something through. Lydia would miss the life they had been living. But more than anything, she was thrilled for the life ahead. The church came into view and Lydia stuck her head out the window to see their approach. They stopped in front of it, just behind Arabella's carriage, and got out. A few moments later, the ceremony began. Lydia walked down the aisle first, followed by her stepsister. With two men at the end waiting for them, she wished she could be alone with the Marquis, away from all the prying eyes. She wanted to tell him how deeply she loved him, but in privacy. But there would be time for that. For now, she was here, and she was committing her life to him. He stood there in his black coat tails, a portrait of everything she found beautiful, and his eyes lit up when they saw her. You look amazing, he whispered when she reached him. As do you, she replied, barely able to catch her breath. Can you believe we have made it here, finally? he asked. Indeed, I cannot, she laughed softly. Arabella reached Lord Ranton then, and the wedding began. One by one, the minister asked them to say their vows and then gave them a chance to make their promise. Do you take this man? asked the minister when he reached Lydia. I do, she replied. The vows continued, and they made their promise to spend their lives together. At the end of the ceremony, guests threw flower petals into the air, and Lydia felt Henry's hand grasp hers. I love you, wife he said. And I adore you, husband, she replied. Did you ever think we would come to this place a year ago when we stumbled upon one another during a walk? he asked. When I was a simple governess and you a fancy nobleman? No, I did not. I thought my life was forever locked away by my stepmother. But you changed all of that. You rescued me. You brought me out of it all, she said. And I would do it again in a heartbeat he replied. Then I believe I have made the right choice after all, she said. The right choice? In making you my husband, she whispered, leaning close to him. And I would choose you every day, my wife. His wife. That was who she was now. 
Henry looked at Lydia and allowed himself to take in the sight of her in the pale blue dress. Their wedding was over. They were climbing into the carriage. And he meant it. She was his wife. Forever. Lydia appeared giddy and joyful against the spring sky. But for Henry, the joy was still coming to the surface. It was only now allowing him to believe that all of this had really just happened. Yes, they were married. Yes, he was her husband. Yes, she was his wife. And as long as they both should live, they would have that delight. Lydia smelled of wildflowers and he wondered how she managed that. The tiara on her head was truly a sign of her royalty in his eyes. She was worth so much and she would be the queen of his household. He wondered what she would be like as a mother. Certainly amazing if Walter was anything to go by. Her love for him had shown just what stretches her heart could do, and Lydia knew exactly how to behave with children. So he had no doubts, no fears, no concerns. Of course, everyone told him that this would change with time. They would face conflicts and trials and difficulties. But they would choose love. They would choose respect. They would choose to be devoted to one another through anything. And whatever came at them, they would come back at it with their commitment to be together. Are you looking forward to going to Brighton? he asked. I am. I have never really gone anywhere. I mean, a few times to London when I was young before my father passed away. But otherwise I have travelled very little. Brighton sounds lovely. I am so happy for this opportunity, she replied. I promise to make it the very best it can be, he said. You are such a tremendous husband already, she complimented. I need only to keep up with my wife. You see, she is the greatest woman I have ever known, and I should like to spoil her if I am able, he said. Lydia laughed. I think she would like that, she replied. Lydia leaned her head into the crook of his neck, and he wondered what he smelled like. He ought to have done a better job of ensuring he was as pleasant as she was. A little part of him was nervous that he would fail as a husband. But he would do all he could to make her proud. And if the ceremony they had just experienced was any indication, they were going to do quite well. Lady Arabella and Arthur would as well. He was confident the two of them were an ideal match. But nothing mattered to him so much as providing for his new wife and the future of their family. He was the Marquis of Whitecroft now. But one day, he would be the Duke of Yaton. And that was going to be a very important day. Because on that day, he could make her his Duchess. Epilogue The cold was bitter, but the day had been full. Henry could not believe his fortune at being home with his mother and father for the first time since his marriage, a fact they did not let him forget. He smelled the pine trees from outside, something parents often bragged about. The odour was strong but glorious, and within the home his parents had placed little presents all around for the children to find and open. Apparently they had not considered the ages of the little ones in planning that, but it had been a great deal of fun for Walter. Over the previous three years, he and his wife had lived a very full life. Lady Lydia Radcliffe played with their two-year-old twins on the couch. Her brother, the Earl of Canwick, had just turned eleven and was making sure that Augustine did not fall from his mother's lap, just as Elizabeth tried to climb up her shoulder. Lydia, Walter complained, a foot kicking him hard in the side. She laughed. What am I to do? They outnumber me. Henry laughed and swooped Augustine up in his arms, delighted by his children. He had loved being a father, and this was the greatest part of it, having a family and being with family. Oh, they are the sweetest, his father, the Duke of Yaton, said. He leaned back with his brandy, the very image of Henry in thirty years, when he might grow bald and fat. He intended not to do so. Still, it had been a lovely holiday. It was clear that no matter how Henry's parents disliked one another, they loved Lydia, and they adored being grandparents to such precious children. Please let me hold Elizabeth again, begged his mother to Lydia. Her arms were outstretched and she seemed desperate. 
Lydia stood with the little one in her arms, but was stopped by the Duke, who held up a hand and turned to his wife. Why are you always trying to hold their children? Let them do it. They are happy to take care of their own, his father retorted. Oh, you don't understand what it is to be a woman. We love children. Holding another's is just as grand, she snapped. Henry took in a deep breath. He still was not quite used to being around them again after so long away and with his own family. In all these years, a few things had changed for his parents. Their arguments had continued, but the pettiness had only grown significantly worse. It was unbearable, and he felt sad that Lydia should see this side of his family. But they were married now, and this was a part of it. She saw all of him, the good and the bad the parts he wanted to flaunt and the parts he wanted to hide. They were all present. He didn't have to be ashamed of them anymore. Lydia loved them all, and he had seen all of her good and bad. Although he could not deny that he saw a great deal more good both inside and out. It had been refreshing how open and honest she had always been with him. Christmas was Lydia's favourite time of the year at their home, always a season of warm fires and good books. She had cider and pies made ready by the staff in the kitchen so they could always indulge at the end of the day. Tabitha knew her favourites and consistently had them ready. Lydia greatly appreciated it and always made a point to say so. For Henry, seeing this side of his wife, this part of her that was so delighted and joyous during the holiday season, was lovely. And here, spending time with his mother and father, was a completely new thing for them. It was unlikely to become a tradition, but it was still a good opportunity for them to get to know their grandchildren and their daughter-in-law. Oh, I think they are here, Lydia said, reacting to a noise from outside. She stood and made her way to the window. Is it them? Henry asked, his son resting in his arms. It is, she said. Before long they all gathered to greet Arthur and Lady Arabella, along with their daughter Eleanor, who was just a few months younger than the twins. Mother, father, please meet Lord Ranton and Lady Arabella, my dear friend and the Earl's sister, he said, introducing them. He worried about introducing Arabella as Lydia's stepsister. Although his parents knew the connection between the two of them, he feared where their questions might lead and as the Countess had been sent away to a madhouse from the prison only a few months prior, he did not wish to discuss it. It would make Arabella terribly upset, he imagined. The doctor had found himself stuck in prison. It was where the two of them belonged, to be sure. More and more, society was learning to forget that there had ever been any relation between the Countess and the three children who had lived under her tyranny. They had come to know that woman as a usurper, and recognised that it was no one else's fault she had been quite so horrid as all that. And whatever had become of her where she was, there was silence. Nothing was heard from her any more. A great blessing, Henry thought. Slowly but surely, Lydia, Walter and Arabella had been able to live amongst the London elite once more and were invited to events again. With the ties they had made through their marriages, it was clear the young women were not so blighted as everyone might have imagined. In addition to that, Lord and Lady Lambton had made every effort to bring them back into polite society. They spoke highly of them and allowed them to come to all their events. They encouraged Henry and Lydia to host a ball, which they did. Many people came and enjoyed the event without any scandal or gossip. Everything had begun to fall back into place in their lives, and Henry was overwhelmed to see that his wife was being treated well for the first time in all her years since the death of her father. With the introductions completed, they all made their way back into the parlour and sat down to enjoy their company. Do you know anything of the Christophs? the Duke asked, out of the blue. He seemed deeply enthralled by them as he gazed at Henry and Lydia's children. No, I think I have not heard the name, Lydia replied. Hmm, I think you would like them. They have a daughter the same age as your twins. She might make a good match for Augustine some day, he suggested. You must get in touch with them before another parent gets to them sooner. I imagine many would want to make such an advantageous match for their little ones. Lydia and Henry looked at one another with horror. Father, we are not matching our toddlers now. 
They shall make decisions when they are old enough to decide who to marry, he said. But what if they choose someone below their station, he asked. Again, Henry looked to his wife. They both tried not to laugh. Henry's mother and father did not know the whole story of how the two of them had come to be together. And he was not aware that once upon a time, Henry thought he had fallen in love with a governess. And although Lydia turned out to be of a far higher station, it still amused him that his father would even come to think of something so silly as his grandchildren being matched when they were barely two years of age. If only he had known how close he had come to scandal through his son. See? I told you it was a foolish idea, his mother bickered. It is not foolish. I just want them to be prepared, his father said. But they cannot marry off children. You know that. It would be terrible of them. They would be horrid parents to do something like that, she insisted. They would be horrid parents if they ever ended up like us, the Duke chuckled in reply. What do you mean by that? she asked in a rage. Man Henry tightened his lips together so he wouldn't laugh at the spectacle. It seemed as though the others were doing the same. Yes, there had been a day once, not all that long ago, when he detested the idea of marriage. He had seen only the anger that existed between his own mother and father. He had seen how ridiculous their arguments were. And he had wanted to live free of that. But his marriage was entirely different. Something of his own choosing. Something he and Lydia had made even through the challenging times. Their children would see that as they got older. At least, that was his hope. He never wanted them to live in such a way that they saw the anger and rage between a mother and father. No, he needed them to see love and respect and affection. That was all that should be present in a marriage. Anything more, and he feared that bitterness and troubles would creep in as they had done with his own mother and father. It was a pity their children did not have Lydia's mother and father as grandparents as well. The Stanleys had been very well to do in society and a prime example of love and affection. Lydia had often told him that she feared her father's continued love for her mother had only fueled the Countess's hatred for the family. And no matter how mad the Countess might have been, he could hardly blame her for such jealousy. Have you seen? It is snowing outside, Arabella exclaimed. The first snowfall of the year in these parts, Henry's mother noted. Everyone gathered by the window and looked outside, wanting to indulge in the beauty of the snowflakes. Morgan, called his mother. A young woman came rushing into the room. Look after the children, will you? We want to go outside and have a look, she said. The young maid nodded and smiled at the three little ones. Eagerly she took Augustine from Henry and rushed to the floor to play with the other two. Walter wrapped up extra warm as he often got ill ever since the poisoning. While he was as recovered as he ever would be, there had been a few lasting effects. This had been one of them. He was always catching colds and spending a few days in bed to recover from them. But once they were gone, he would be back to normal and enjoying his life. Most days, he was still able to ride Roderick. He often rode with Henry, and it was something they did together. Lydia joined when she could, but preferred to look after the twins now, even if she did miss riding. Now and then, she would ask Tabitha to watch them so she could go out with Walter and Henry and enjoy the hobby she had once loved so dearly. As the Duke and Duchess led the way outside, Arabella and Arthur followed, with Walter at their side. Henry and Lydia were the final two trailing behind. They gave a little bit of space between themselves and the others so they could take it all in and really enjoy the magic of the snow without the others. Do you remember that day with the butterflies? Henry asked. I thought it was magical, she answered. I remember thinking you were the most beautiful creature amongst them. And then when I saw you at the masquerade with the winged mask you wore, I thought you must be an illusion. Such an exquisite creature could not possibly exist, he said. Lydia laughed and leaned into him. You thought that? she asked. Most certainly, he said. Why? Because you were everything I had ever wanted and believed could not be in a woman, all of it and more. 
beyond anything any man had ever expressed to me, he said. Well, she began in a low voice, I do now understand why you had reservations about marriage. The two chuckled, staring at Henry's parents as they traded minor insults to one another. Around them the snow was coming down stronger and sticking to the earth in a freeze. It was shameful that they should be this way even in front of guests, but that was who they were. They had never been very good at hiding it, and he was glad for that now. It had shown him how fortunate he was. He knew exactly what to avoid and exactly what he did not wish for in a marriage. He saw how not to treat a wife and how he should not have to accept being treated. He learned from his parents that if he worked hard and did the opposite of them, he would live a happy life with his wife. It's cold, Lydia noted. The snow often is, he teased. She looked up at him and smiled, glad they could still joke and flirt as they did when they first fell in love. Only now they were able to do it even more. Now it was appropriate. Before they had to hide those little things in public. But now... If he wanted to take her hand among family, he could do so. And with that in mind, he slipped his hand around her cold, thin fingers. My goodness, you are chilled to the bone, aren't you? he asked. I told you, she said. Well then, perhaps we should go back inside, he suggested. Just another moment. It is too beautiful out here to miss it. I cannot think how sad I would be if we went inside before really enjoying the beauty of the snow, she said. They stood in the silence aside from the crunching of snow from the others who were walking further out into it, but they stood in place. Flakes landed on Lydia's lashes and he wanted to kiss them away. Henry saw how they melted upon her cheek and wetted her hair. Yes, it was cold, but he felt incredibly warm when he looked at his wife. All right, she conceded. I think I have reached my limit. I know, he said with a gentle nod. Henry led his wife back indoors, and they returned to the parlour. From just outside the door they heard a squeal within the room and hurried to rush inside. Immediately Henry burst into laughter. Morgan was on the floor, her left hand and foot tied together with a ribbon, Augustine was sitting on her chest, and Elizabeth had pulled out all of the sewing equipment. Their cousin appeared to be the real culprit, however, managing to tangle things in such a way that they knotted without her tiny hands, knowing how to do such a thing. Morgan! Lydia screamed in horror. She rushed over and untied the poor maid. She kept saying, Bracewet, bracewet, as if she wanted to give me a bracelet made from the ribbons. I looked away and did not realise that she had got my shoe caught up in it and then tangled it so much that I became stuck, Morgan said, humiliated. Do not worry. I have had such things happen with only two of them. You were forced to handle three, Lydia replied, getting the ribbon off. The rest of the evening was spent enjoying one another's company and a hearty dinner. But by the time the children went to sleep, Henry noted how tired his wife looked as well. We should be off to bed he said. Oh, that sounds lovely. I am incredibly tired, she said. Very well, he replied, leading her up to their room. Once they were inside, Henry and Lydia made themselves ready for bed and sat together for just a few more moments by the window, looking outside again. It really is stunning, she said. The moon reflected on the white of the snow that was now covering the earth before them. Everything was light. Lydia was even illuminated by it when he looked at her. Yes, it is, but not half so stunning as you, he told her. Lydia giggled like a young woman falling in love for the first time. Oh, you do flatter me too much, she said. I flatter you exactly enough. But I think, even so, I ought to do more, he said. Then you have my permission, she said. All right, then. You, Lydia Radcliffe, are exquisite. You are more unique than a butterfly, brighter than a snowflake, and more colourful than any flower. How is that? he asked. I believe you can do better, she replied. Hmm. You are more regal than a queen, more valuable than a castle, 
and more precious than all the jewels in England, he said. That is better. But you know the thing that is most lovely about me? she asked. What is that? he asked in reply. The fact that I am rare enough, special enough and wonderful enough to be chosen by a man like you, she told him. Henry's heart warmed all over again. He leaned in to meet his wife's forehead with his own, and they stared into each other's eyes at the terribly awkward angle that somehow managed to bring so much comfort and closeness. He leaned forward with his lips and they met Lydia's in the tenderest, sweetest of kisses. It was the sort of kiss they always shared, one that held a million promises, a thousand hopes, a hundred secrets, and just one forever love. The End Scan the QR code or click the link in the description and read the story of Catherine and Benjamin in The Mystery of the Iron Duke, the second book of the series. Click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. We included a bonus scene of this book. Link in the description or the first comment. What did you like the most? Comment below or mention if you are interested in being part of our VIP readers. Watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.